Was it too late for them to beg for mercy? Sure, they were still unwilling to yield. But the enemy made their bodies tremble, all right? Landon withdrew his pressure to allow them to fight. After all, the ass whopping wouldn't feel great if the enemy didn't fight back. With that, he began his tyranny, starting with Marcus' men. The men unsheathed their swords vigilantly. But how could they be a match for him? Bam bam. Pa. Plop. Landon grabbed two heads and knocked them together like coconuts, making his victims see invisible stars around them. Then, he stopped a sword attack with his index finger and thumb, shocking the sword wielder silly. What the hell did he just see? The enemy was so stunned that he thought he was having hallucinations. He tried pulling his sword back, but Landon just pulled the sword and ended up punching the guy hard, sending him flying towards another group of men. The flying man hit them like bowling pins, making Landon say strike. Meanwhile, the guards were very much itching to get revenge against these people that insulted them earlier, so they kept looking at Landon pitifully. Landon sighed and tapped their hands as if he were in a wrestling match. Partner switch. The guards excitedly got in on the payback party. Even though there were more enemies than guards, Landon wasn't worried about the enemy leaving the hall because there were guards outside. So the only way the enemy could escrow is if they had a hostage. And unfortunately for them, Landon's secretaries also knew combat because as his secretaries for the monarch, combat prowess was a given. This job was dangerous because they could even be kidnapped or held hostage since they knew some deep empire secrets. So for their own good, they had been training for years. Even the prison warden's secretary was a beast on the field. It was for their own good to always be ready for terrorist situations and so on. One should know that just several months ago when they began taking over the new territories, one of his secretaries took care of some nobles that dared to use her as a hostage. It was a big mistake to think that she was a poor defenseless lady. Misty took off her glasses, carefully put them away and began stretching, while Brian on the other hand, slowly uncuffed his expensive shirt. Why did I choose to wear my new Kilu limited edition work heels today? Ugh. I blame these idiots. Why can't they just learn? Sigh. Beats me. Let's just get this over with. We have to get His Majesty ready for the upcoming meeting with the Karenian, Terraquin, and Arcadinian ambassadors. Right. And so, this had been the preview to the daily lives of the monarch secretaries. Bam. They engaged the poor fools that dared to approach them mercilessly. Bam. Ah. Eh. You be asterisk asterisk sage. Bam. You dare touch me? Bam. Boy. Do you know what position I hold? Wait. What are you doing? No. You stop. Stop right now. Bam bam. Pa. Plop. Bam. While everyone was going at it, Landon focused his attention on Marcus, who was currently surrounded by ten of his most trusted men. Well, this will be fun. The moment Landon charged towards the group, five came after him while the rest stayed by their master in order to protect him. Landon didn't waste any time and flung them like any to the far walls of the massive hall. Bam. They hit the walls and fell to the ground hard. What? Just how powerful was this runt? Marcus felt his hairs standing up in alarm. He was that fearful because Landon had told him from the start that he wouldn't dare to kill him. But now, he couldn't help but wonder if the beat had been lying to him all along. No matter, he still wasn't all that terrified because he knew how important he was to the Morgany continent. Seeing how powerful he was, three more men charged at Landon. But this time, they try to be extra careful and avoid close contact with him, lest he grab them and threw them as well. Sadly, no matter how careful they were, Landon still did the same thing. Bam! They two smashed into the wall and fell flat on the ground. The remaining two who were protecting Marcus dared not advance. Instead, they waited for Landon to approach while coming up with ways to deal with him. But of course, like their colleagues before them, the wall became their closest friend. Bam! Landon treated them like flies. How annoying. Mr. Marcus, what were those words of yours earlier on? Ah yes. You said. When a chicken decides to play in the den of a hangle, its only fate is to be eaten alive. But unfortunately for you, that isn't always the case. Mr. Marcus, have you ever heard the story of the tortoise and the hare? No? Well, too bad. Because if you did, then you'll know why you ended up in such a predicament. Of course, as a man of my word, I won't kill you. In fact, 
I'll even let you go. But not until I've beaten the crap out of you. Now, take your beating like a good boy, all right? Bam. Without any warning, Landon stretched his hands forth and grabbed Marcus with one hand while using the other to stop his sword attack. He then raised his knee and elbowed Marcus' belly several times. Pub poo poo. Soon, the men who he had thrown to the wall surrounded himself and Marcus. Landon smiled broadly at Marcus, who was struggling to free himself from his grasp. Marcus' whole body was itching to kill the little bastard. You let go of me now. Mr. Marcus, please, your manners. We are about to do the tango. Tango? What the hell is that? It's a dance. Instantly, Landon began attacking those surrounding him while dancing with the unwilling Marcus. Every time Marcus tried to kick him, the attacker would end up landing on his men. In short, without knowing it, Marcus had become the female in the dance, kicking his legs up and doing all sorts of moves with Landon being more than happy to guide him. And before Marcus knew it, he had taken some of his men. The knocked out men. Boss, are you sure that you're not a spy? If not, then why do you keep hitting us instead? With everyone down, Landon faced Marcus coldly. Playtime was over. He had to wrap this up soon. He had a meeting to attend. After the men were beaten senseless to the point where they fainted, Landon smiled coldly. Now, it was just himself and Marcus again. With that, he began taking his revenge for their actions earlier on. He punched, slapped, kicked and beat the sh asterisk asterisk out of him mercilessly. Pa pa pa, plop, bam. Marcus flew to one of the pillars and was picked up again by Landon. He was beaten so much that his entire face began to swell. Was he going to die here? Wait, wait, wait. That's enough. I promise never to annoy you again. So can you let me go? The bloody-nosed Marcus begged pitifully with his very swollen face. His men were all knocked out cold, so who would know about his begging? He decided to lower his pride for now and find a way out ASAP. In his mind, he had already sworn to go back to Morgany and report this matter to the Art Society leader. At first, he thought of attacking Baymart, but no matter how angry he was, he didn't know how many cards this bastard had up his sleeves. That's why he decided to go big or go home. If all the nobles and royals who were members of the Arts Society joined forces to attack Baymard, he didn't believe that this bastard would be able to survive. In fact, no continent would be able to survive such a grand-scale attack, talk less of a single empire. Besides, the royals might even be the ones pushing him to attack Landon because of the manufacturing processes. If they had that, then wouldn't Morgany be greater? He had to bring a big storm to this puny monarch who calls himself Landon Barn. After stopping here, his original plan was to head towards Arcadina to visit Alec Barn with a message from Morgany, as well as paint for some of the nobles on his wait list. But now, that had to wait. He decided to make a U-turn and head straight back towards Morgany. This matter had to be reported as soon as possible. Landon looked at his begging face and knew that this guy was planning payback. But so what? To him, it didn't matter. Why? Because even if he wanted to go back to report the matter, reaching Morgany and traveling to his headquarters would undoubtedly take at least 12 months. That's a year. From there, just rallying up all forces in all faraway locations would also take longer. From there, they would sail back here again. In short, it might take two and a half more years for them to attack him. By then, he might have even begun his mission on the continent of Morgany. So he would be meeting them rather than they meeting him. Nonetheless, there was still a possibility that he might not star on them yet because he intended to keep the most troublesome empires for last. Whatever the case, whether they came to him or he went to them, the outcome would be the same. He would win. How could he not when he had the system? They were bound to lose. Moreover, he had ample time in his hands before they could even come back to attack him. So why worry? There was just no way out of it. Communications and transportation were just too bad in this era, which ended up working in his favor. Bottom line, he had time to play. Nonetheless, the only reason why he allowed this guy to leave was that he wanted access into Morgany through the system. That's right. He placed a tracker on Marcus and his men. Now, he would be able to see everything and know the important people who were backing this famous painter. Plus, because of the tracker, he would be able to warp to any location close to Marcus. 
For him, this was his gateway to Morgany. There were only three scenarios that allowed him to warp. The first was if he was given a specific mission by the system, like when the system warped him to save Lucia and her men in a matter of seconds. The last scenario was if he had placed a tracker on his target, allowing him to warp close to the target. And the last scenario is if he marked a place that he had already visited. For example, he could go warp to several buildings and forest regions in Magoon Island because he marked them in the system's map as his territory. Of course, he couldn't mark the entire island. He had to pick specific buildings or trees in the forest as his warping point. That was basically how it worked. So he kept Marcus and his men alive for this very reason. He wanted several entry points to Morgany. As for the matter of their revenge, so what? He was purposefully stimulating them to ensure that they wanted revenge. Marcus and his men were of much use to him outside Baymard than in here. So why not let them go? He was looking forward to watching and witnessing how the man would make his plans in Morgany. Landon stood very close to Marcus and looked at him from above condescendingly. As I said, I'll let you go, but after you finish taking your beatings. What? Aren't we done? No. And so Landon continued his teachings on Marcus until he passed out as well. Send them out of Baymard and throw them on the docks. Yes, your majesty. Wait. Empty their pockets and collect all their valuables. In addition, collect all treasures on their SH.S2. This will be compensation for their actions. Heh. <laughs> Who asked them to come to my home and disrespect my people and I? Landon scoffed and looked at the knocked out men in disdain. Everyone didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Your majesty, has anyone ever told you that you're petty? After beating them cold, you still rob them? Landon. Hey, I never said I was a good guy. Brian and Misty rolled their eyes and rushed Landon out. Your majesty, you will be late for the meeting. We have to go now. Your majesty. We've never failed at our duties. And today will never be the day when we fail. So please move. As instructed, the unconscious morgues were tied up with rope and gagged. They also collected the swords back from them. Earlier on, before Marcus stepped into the place, he had requested swords for his own protection, as well as the safety of his men. He refused to step in if Landon didn't meet his requirements. To Marcus, even though Landon had promised that he wouldn't dare to kill him, one could never be too sure. That was one of the reasons why he refused to go into the fully guarded palace without a weapon. At least out of the palace, he could hold a tourist or civilian hostage if he was really cornered. He could also lose his chasers on the streets, as well as disguise himself to escape again. But once he was in the palace, for all he knew, Landon could keep him in a room and surround it with thousands of guards. Even though the odds were against him in this scenario, a man must never go down without at least killing some of his enemies. That's why he insisted on having a sword. And what did Landon think about it? He didn't care at all and requested for some swords to be given to them. Why? Because he planned to beat the crap out of them behind closed doors, and it wouldn't be fun if they couldn't fight back. How could he fight them outside around the palace gates? Tourists were going in and out, and there were children around as well. He didn't want anyone to hear their conversation or witness such a battle. So he did everything he could to lure his prey into his den. And now that the battle was over, they collected the swords back. The men Marcus and his men were now tied up like worms and gagged. From there, the military took over the assignment from the royal guards and drove the fugitives out of the city. The soldiers checked them out with their temporary slips and noted their names down. They would be banned for life, never coming into Baymart again. As for their swords kept in the port during check-in, those weren't returned to them at all. Landon continued his pettiness in this matter and confiscated them. Oomph. It serves them right. In a flash, the men were dropped onto the hard floors of Docking Space 82. Bam. Marcus woke up in confusion to the salty smell of the sea. Eh. How did he get here? Before he noticed it, he saw his treasure chests getting carried away before his very eyes. He screamed and yelled angrily, but it all came out like a muffling sound. He was so angry and unwilling that he began moving like a worm towards the treasure chest. He was tied up. So what? He wouldn't let a single person take the chest, or his name wasn't Marcus Perquo. He moved his body to Ho's chest and bit its handle while shaking his worm body to smack anyone who approached. Damn you all. 
His actions were determined and hilarious that tourists on the neighboring Zaps along the docking line couldn't help but find it funny. The children were the most excited of all. Mummy, that man is doing the wiggle dance in Barney. Wow, he can do the wiggle? Awesome. Yeah, but why do I think that he's doing the advanced wiggle dance? Really? Quick, let's learn from him and do the wiggle. 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 The children vegan doing their one wiggle dance, and the ADULTS felt very embarrassed. At the same time, the soldiers had told everyone that they were shooting a movie, so no one felt the scene bizarre or strange. Meanwhile, poor Mr. Wiggle was struggling to hold onto his treasure with every fiber in his body. One should know that amongst his SAFS, only five of them had carried treasures. One couldn't equip all SAFS with treasure because some of his men might secretly try to steal his treasures. That's why he only placed them on five SAFS, guarded by his four most trusted aides and himself. Each treasure ship had a lot of wealth on it because when traveling, it was essential to take as much as possible just in case. And he had sailed here with one of the treasure guys because he was used to doing that. Wherever he went, no one dared to move him because of his reputation and identity. Not even the fiercest monarchs would. But how could he have known that a little twerp would dare to do so? Right before his very eyes, 37 chests filled with several precious gems and coins were carried out mercilessly by these loathsome villains. Marcus had invisible tears in his eyes at the sight of his babies leaving him. Some of these chests were just gifted to him by some wealthy nobles as a way to get in his good books. He had collected enough to expand his army AMD influence again, but now it was all gone. Fortunately, he still had more treasure in the other essay. Yes. Marcus felt somewhat better. It was just that unbeknownst to him, Landon had already requested that the Navy and Marine should raid them. It should be done in just a couple of hours. And by the time Marcus arrived there tomorrow morning, he would really shed tears. That was all his hard work of painting and allowing others to give him generous gifts. Landon had requested that when they raided, they left just enough for Marcus and his men to get food and other supplies so that they could adequately reach Morgany. Heh. He wanted them to be stewing in rage all through the journey. One of the soldiers flung Marcus over his shoulder and dumped him on his ship. From there, the already beaten crewmen hurriedly set sail before these Baymardians changed their kinds and decided to kill them instead. They weren't fools. They were now on event land where the enemy had all the advantages. So it was better to live and fight another day. With that, the proud, arrogant morgues left in a very humble way. But they swore that Baymard had not heard the last of them. Revenge was a must. Well, with the overly arrogant morgues out of the way, Landon focused on his meeting with the ambassadors of Corona, Terry Kay, and Arcadina. Of course, there were several government officials in different departments as well. Today, they were gathered here for two purposes. The first was transport. Your Majesty Landon, as planned, port construction and organization within Arcadina is completed. Yes, your workers were also able to complete everything in Terry K2. The Arcadinian and Terraquin ambassadors were delighted with the report that they received a while back. In June, they selected estates within the desired coastal city in their empires, and the Bay Mardian workers came over to work on them. Wooden customer service counters were made, the reception areas were adequately organized, and many other amenities were added to the estate too. Additionally, thousands of horses, wagons, and carriages were bought as well, and taxi drivers were hired. There were also a ton of workers third to clean, take care of the horses, and so on. Additionally, some were hired to work alongside the Bay Mardians to book people on the SH.P.S. Like Corona's situation, Many Coronians worked alongside some Baymardians in filling the booking form and giving the customers tickets. The area was similar to customer service booths and banks. They were very close together so that if a Karenian worker needed help or was lost, he, she could just ask any of the Baymardian workers next to them. One should know that in the future, Corona will have complete control of its port. So this was more like training to make sure that when the time came, they would be able to cope without Baymard's aid. Anyway, in June, they focused on organizing, buying, and arranging everything that they needed. And by August 15th, they were officially done. Now was September, and the transport launch date was in two days. So how could they not be excited? Your Majesty finally, 
we will have fast transport between our empires. I can't believe that the ride will take only four days and three hours from here to Igoro City in the northwestern region of Terike. The journey alone should be taken five months by sea, but now it's been reduced to a matter of days. This is undoubtedly good news for the people. I agree. From here to Palo City in the north of Arcadena will take two days and 14 hours to complete, which is unfathomable when compared to its previous three and a half four month journey. The ambassadors and officials exclaimed joyfully, and everyone else nodded their heads in agreement. It was truly outstanding. It might seem like nothing, but in these times, transport and complication really slowed them down. Merchants suggested the most while waiting for ages just to receive their goods. But now, Baymard had reduced the wide gap. Now all they had to worry about was the long transport time within their empire when moving from city to city. At least half of the journey time was decreased, so they weren't complaining much. It was better than spending four months on sea, and then another one, two, three, four to even five months on the roads just to get home by carriage. Landon looked at their gleeful expressions and smiled. Everything was going according to plan. And the great thing was that they would be able to travel to other empires on ship. That is, they could book tickets from Corona to Terike with no stops. Unlike airplanes with a 21-23 hours fuel time limit, SH.I.P.S could go on for 10-12 days without fueling. From Arcadena to Terike, a ship could take two and a half days or so. And that same ship could leave Terike and head straight back to Baymard in four days and a few hours before refueling. Anyway, the schedule made it so that all SAS would be back in Baymard before they were 80% empty. Many could just go for no stop trips, while others would still have to stop in Baymard. If someone wanted to go from Terike to Corona or vice versa, they had to stop at Baymard. The journey was way too close to that 80% fuel mark, so they had to stop for fueling only. Speaking of having ship transfers, sadly, there will be none. With no phones and other empires, they couldn't know how many people booked the tickets daily. So what they could do was guarantee an empty ship to book the rooms the customers needed without fearing that someone who wanted to transfer would take their rooms. In the case of some SH, it S stopping in Baymard, it wouldn't be considered a transfer since no one left the ship during fueling. As he said, for orderliness, there would be no transfers. And to ensure that everyone was somewhat satisfied, several SH, S would go to all empires at least three times a day, some in the morning, others in the afternoon, and some in the evening. Of course, the cruise ship schedule had already been distributed to the people several months back. So many knew about the launch date within their empires and couldn't wait to enjoy this cruise thing. The merchants were happiest of all. Many had used to cruise th at S to Corona before, and they knew how convenient it was. Moreover, Many could also send mail to their loved ones through these ports. So how could they not be pleased? For months now, they were looking forward to it. And many had already booked the first rides to the different memories within the Pino continent. Two more days before the launch date with the first travelers. As for Landon, he was happy as well. This meant money for Baymart, as well as the other empires. After all, they were in a partnership, and the empires had shares as well. All right. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's focus on the more serious problem at hand. Instantly, everyone's face turned green. There was a bigger hidden problem dooming their precious continent. What should they do? Everyone's expression was grim. What should they do about this unyielding issue? They looked at His Majesty, hoping for an answer to this problem. Landon drummed his fingers while lost in thought. So it has come. It was here in the Pino continent. But who the hell brought it over? When he got the report, he was so shocked that he spat a mouthful of tea in his office. Why now? Well, since it was already here, then they had to act fast before it was too late. And what exactly made him so worked up? Many might think it funny, but it was a sort of grass, or weed if one wanted to be all technical. The culprit of his dilemma was none other than the tumbleweeds. That's right, the bouncy grass cliches in Western movies that tumble along the ground. One might think that they look so harmless but the reality was that they were actually quite dangerous. So how did it start? Just like back on Earth, some travelers or merchants brought rare grain from Venita to Corona sometime last October. But little did they know that some of their products would sprout into the infectious tumbleweed that was now their nightmare. 
The thing with these troublesome weeds was that they could survive in dryland places, and they loved clear open fields like farms. There, they made their territories and announced that they were here to stay, and they wanted everyone to know it, because more than just basic weeds, they were alive and selfish. Each tumbleweed starts as a tiny seed on an open landscape. They sprout in late winter, putting their roots down, forming branches, opening flowers that nestled between their thorny leaves, finally birthing fruits in the beautiful circle of life. And by summer, the plant takes its complete form. But here's the thing. Other plants typically allowed creatures like birds to carry their fruits away and dispose of the seeds anywhere else, allowing them to grow again. However, the tumbleweed liked to take matters into its own hands. So what does the parent plant have to do to ensure that her baby seeds survive? Sacrifice herself, of course. What great motherly love. That's why come fall, she intentionally starves herself to death, allowing herself, the plant, and her fruits to get dried up. However, the seedlings are still in there. She catches the wind, breaks from her roots and tumbles away, bouncing along her journey while dripping her children across the fertile ground. And then they take root, sprout, grow, and continue the whole circle of life that seemed very touching. And at this point, many might think that it was a beautiful ending, but they couldn't be far from the truth. That ending is precisely the nightmare that caused many sleepless nights. Why? Because these plants were invasive vampire species that were unwelcomed by all. Tumbleweeds stuck to each other, with one becoming two, two becoming ten, hundreds, and so on. It was a hellish dream for many. Farmers loved farming in vast open land because they didn't want deadly creatures sneaking up on them from the woods or so. This was good and all, but now they had to worry about the tumbleweeds that seemed to love their open lands. And after these weeds took over massive empty terrain, a single windy storm can drown an entire village with tens of thousands of these troublesome weeds that all have overly sharp thorns that break off in their skins as well as their horse's skin. Many a times, the roads, carriages, and even their times would get covered up with tumbleweed up to two floors high, and clearing them out was both painful and annoying. Tumbleweeds were both bouncy and sticky, so they have to be removed one at a time. Some might try removing them with industrial machines, but the danger is that they are highly flammable. They were dry, airy, and their branches were very dense, making them the perfect fire starters. They lit up in flames like magic and burned hotter as well. And even if one managed to clear the place of all tumbleweed, a single mist grain could start the whole cycle again. But why exactly were they so bad? That was because they were vampire weeds. One should know that sticking on the farms, they stole and hoarded all ground nutrients for themselves before crops get planted. What other times, they choked the poor crops to death instead. In short, they refused to share and were greedy bastards. Again, once they catch flames, the entire farms would flame on as well. Right now, farmers were losing one-tenth of their yields because of these invasive vampire weeds. And what made them scared was how rapid these weeds had spread. But was there any way to stop them? Nope. They could only control them. The moment one tries to clear them from the farms and roads, thousands of seeds fall off from just a single one. So it was easy to see that tumbleweeds were a tough nut to crack. For starters, it was impossible to make tumbleweeds go extinct everywhere in the world. Because provided a single seed found its way in, then that was it. And the most annoying thing was that before a tumbleweed dried out, it just looked like an ordinary bush. Of course, there were many variations of tumbleweeds, with some that showed their true nature before they dried out. But many didn't. So people couldn't tell that these seamlessly ordinary bushes were vampires in wait. All they could do was control the matter. Your Majesty, so they're called tumbleweeds? Yes. Our best course of action is to educate the farmers on what to do to save their farms. Because if we don't control it, the results will be disastrous. I agree. 1 slash 10 th yield loss is already a big enough damage. Everyone nodded in agreement. Food was everything. So how could they be willing to lose so much? Well, I can tell you all that the matter will undoubtedly spread to the other empires with time. But, some places won't be affected. Eh, your majesty, what do you mean? Landon looked at them and smiled. Because of the terrain and weather in some places, the weed wouldn't dare to go there. Terry K should be completely fine. 
but apart from the northern territories in Arcadina, the rest should be troubled by it soon. What? The Arcadinian and Terraquin ambassadors were happy, while the Carinian ambassador and Baymardian officials looked at them with envy. Lucky you. The meeting went on for a bit, with everyone coming up with countermeasures against these tumbleweeds. And after 45 more minutes, they were done. Meeting adjourned. Landon left straight for the barracks for his next meeting. He used the next few days to prepare for the mission alongside the soldiers. Time went by in a flash and soon, it was time for him to leave Baymard once more. Time to put Henry on the throne. Finally, it was time for Landon to leave. But before leaving, he had already prepared for Lucy, Mother Kim, Lucia, her brothers, and some of her people to head towards Corona in a week. That's right. They had to go to Santa's wedding and they had to arrive there several days before the big event to give Penelope her very own bachelorette party in the palace. Well, it would be like a sleepover where they would exchange gifts and share embarrassing stories. Gary's wife Ruby, as well as Mark's wife Ava, will also be joining them as well since they weren't on any missions right now. As for Trey's wife, Yara, sadly, she was currently battling the temple in Yoden, so she would have to skip the wedding. These three ladies were the famous heavenly trio in the barracks whose reputations were extremely high. They were one of the first batches of soldiers in Baymard and have been here for a very long time. So the first time Penelope came to Baymard years back, she underwent training in the Carinian barracks in Baymard. So the trio bonded with her and showed her the ropes of things. And ever since, they had been exchanging letters and keeping in contact with each other. Additionally, Josh's wife, Grace, was also very close to Penelope too. The gang of women enjoyed their time while in Baymard and have been talking to one another ever since. Now, they were bringing Lucia into the group, so she was going to the wedding. Plus, she was very much curious about how the other memories looked like. Likewise, her brother and a selected few of her men would go out as well. Ger brothers had completed their surgeries and had been in bed for two and a half weeks now. The doctor said that they could go for this trip, but they weren't to do anything physically demanding, just walking around, eating and so on. In short, it was best to assume that they were the elderly. Of course, the other Zalipnians that were selected to go out were those that only had minor surgeries. Anyway, Landon arranged for their transportation and whatnot. The funny thing was that Lucy wanted Lucia and her team wanted to side on the cruise SHS to Corona, but there were too many soldiers going on this mission of escorting them, and they needed Baymardian vehicles to get to the capital city fast. So Landon decided to let Lucy, Mother Kim, the rest of the ladies, and the Zalipnians take the cruise essay fast. In contrast, the Navy ship will stealthily follow behind them at a pace that doesn't make the travelers on the cruises uncomfortable. Of course, he would send them on the cruise ship with several guards as well. And the crews carrying them will be informed of the Navy tailing them too. There were a lot of things that he organized before leaving. As for Lucius and his brothers whose wives were leaving, of course, they had to stay behind and protect the empire. Gary the Navy head, Trey the Coast Guard head, Mark the police deputy chief, and Josh who will still focus on the barracks, will stay behind. Again, with himself and Mother Kim gone, Lucius was now the decision maker in the empire. So if anyone dared to cause trouble, Lucius had to take care of it. Another thing that Landon did was finalize a few things with the various industries in the lower region. Ha ha ha. After coming back from the wedding, it would already be October. That was the period when all the products will be sent off to the markets. Presently, the aquarium was completed, but they were just filling it out with water, sea creatures, coral and so on. For the aquarium's position, it was just a little bit further from the zoo. And it had a hotel attached to it as well. In some rooms, one could see the fish through the fish from a tall glass wall. People could now sleep with the fishes. Landon loved the aquarium hotels in many countries back on Earth that gave people many fun experiences while viewing sea creatures. People could cuddle with sea lions, onkeys, similar to dolphins, and other friendly creatures in this world. They could also do an underwater safari trek across the large well-decorated fake ruins created for exploration. People could dive in, do treasure hints and whatnot while many harmless fish swam around them. Again, since this was a hotel, there was also an enormous pool outside. And there was also a surf wave machine there too. When it came to food, they could have dinner or lunch with the fish in the underground restaurant or just eat in their rooms. 
Those who paid for the hotels could enjoy some of these activities for free, while those who came for a few hours had to pay. Of course, as a hotel, there will also be a spa there too. The good thing about building the zoo and the aquarium hotel close by was that it brought money to the zoo. People would undoubtedly go to the zoo after exploring the aquarium hotel, and vice versa. Likewise, Tim and the guys have really outdone themselves with the arcade games currently being mass produced. There were many pinball games and claw grabbing games that would make people scream with joy. And then there was the darling of all of them, the one he was waiting for, Pac Man. Additionally, the vending machines, money changing machines, and parking meters will be ready as well. Now, the police will be able to properly charge people tickets for parking. AMD people who just want something as simple as a drink for two base or so can just get it in the vending machines rather than lining up for several minutes just for a single item. Doing so would lessen the traffic in stores and save those who didn't wake up early enough for classes or work. The money-changing machines will also be placed in many establishments too. Everything was going according to plans. As for Landon, he was going to settle this Henry mission as fast as he could before rushing to Corona. The wedding was in the last week of October on the 27th. So according to his plans, he should be there on the 26th, barely making it. Sigh. He could only blame the system for his current predicaments. With that, Landon and his team were off. But while they were heading out to fight their own battle, unbeknownst to them, trouble seemed to be heading their way yet Aegon. Sigh. Why couldn't these people just let them be? On the open seas. The calm waters rushed against the corners of the ships that were currently docking below. On the seas, all 21 ships had docked in formation. And turn by turn, many jumped into the water for no more than three minutes before getting yanked back up. On a ship, fresh water in barrels was used for cooking and drinking. And as required, at least once in two weeks, the men had to take their baths by diving into the seas. Of course, they didn't stay too long in the waters because firstly, salt was very drying to the skin, and accidentally taking it in could make a man sick, especially on the seas. Second, there might be dangerous and deadly sea creatures around. That said, because there were many people on board, only a few could take their bath now, and next week, another batch would take their bath. Just like that, the selected batch of people jumped in for a quick rinse, and that was that. And as the crew continued their bi-weekly rinse, their primate in charge of all 21 captains that led the ships was currently having a meeting with his captains. And who were these people? Well, they were the group that the Temple of Dragmas appointed to claim Baymard in the name of the temple. The various elders won the auction of several properties months back, and their team had been dispatched to conquer Baymard. With the number of ships and people present, they were very confident about their victory. And who was their commander? They had brought 150,000 people for the battle against a puny empire. It sounded more like overkill to them, because they even doubted if that little empire that overly relied on Corona. But they weren't complaining. They had to come out victorious. As for their primate, he was the one in charge of this operation. One could say primate was more like a rank or title that was bestowed on some people by the temple. It was very similar to a bishop rank or title. And Primate Jamosin III had all power and authority to bring glory and honor to the temple. Funny enough, when they left the shore sometime in August, the Baymardian soldiers arrived a few days after them. They were heading to Baymard to wreak havoc, but little did they know that their bases would be no more by the time they even reached Baymard. Primate Jamosin, we are advancing just as planned. Good. In this way, we will be able to reach Cello Village in the west of Corona. There we will wait for the primate Linver and his men from Deiferous. I heard that he should be bringing 27 more ships, so in total, we might be hitting Baymard hard with over 300,000 men. They won't stand a chance. Everyone nodded in agreement. That tiny place wouldn't be able to survive after this. As for why they couldn't just head on to Baymard first, that was because the leaders from each camp and each empire wanted things to be fair. Who knew if those who went first would rob them? Even though they all worshipped the same temple leader, each base wanted more benefits and would hate to get cheats out. So after the bidding war, they all decided to send their captains to ensure they got what they deserved. And for all bases, their Coronians were placed under primates, who were neutral and weren't under any bases since they worked directly with the leader. The ships and captains leaving Yoden were under one primate. 
while those leaving Deiphorus were under another. They agreed to meet up and arrive at Baymard at the same time to ensure no cheating or stealing of goods took place. More still, primates were here to ensure that the bases didn't get their hands on whatever was locked up in the lower regions. Their leader would have to be informed of the findings first before anything there could be touched. They had planned and divided the Baymard to its last bits, which undoubtedly proved how overly confident they were about their victory. As for the village that they would stay in, it was very far away from the coastal city that had the trans bakeronian ports. Bringing this many people would hint others about their movements, and they didn't want the enemy to prepare against them. So they chose to take over a tiny village west of Corona and wait for the other ships to join them. One of the men couldn't help but voice his opinion on this matter. Primate, I still think that we should have stayed in another place rather than that village. Because of its location, it's famous for having pirates over there. It's the perfect stopping point for those loathsome fellows. So I'm afraid that if we stay there, we might end up wasting our time and effort fighting those bastards. Jamosin looked at the captain and rubbed his chin playfully. Hmm, you do have a point. After all, we already have a terrible history with those lowlifes who call themselves pirates. But it's too late to change our plans now since the other primate will be heading towards the village. That said, I see your worries. We might spend several weeks waiting for the other ships to reunite with us. So during this time, we might be battling there non-stop. But why should we be afraid? We have the temple's blessings with us. So nothing will happen. Everyone's eyes widened as they looked at the fat blue ruby ring on their primate's finger. Yes, this was given by the leader as a guarantee of our victory through his blessings. With this, no one will be able to stand in our way. Everyone was very excited and filled with awe. As expected of the leader, he is kind through and through. I can't believe he gave us the famous ring of victory that was said to have been a spiritual artifact that led to our victory since our temple's creation. That's right. This ring is the reason why we've never lost any major battles. So with it here, we will definitely conquer Baymard. Our leader is great. Our leader is great. Just like that, the warriors from the temple had already set out to conquer Baymard. One would think that the temple was the only enemy heading to Baymard. But that conclusion was undoubtedly far from the truth. Prissel Village, western region of Arcadina. In the tiny village, several luxurious carriages and horses could be seen all around the place. The contrast of it would make anyone who saw the scene baffled. It was like seeing the latest vehicles in the slums. But who did these carriages, wagons, and horses belong to? Well, no one in the village knew. They only knew that if they didn't do what these intruders wanted, they'd be sent to the afterlife quicker than they expected. The air was tense, and the whole place was moody. It was as if the spirit of a grim reaper had passed over the village. The place was deadly silent, with no children playing outdoors. Everyone was working in absolute silence for fear of annoying the owners of the vehicles and horses. The villages shivered with fright as they obeyed unquestionably. It's been two days since these intruders came in, and the villages had been turned into servants who weren't allowed to sleep within their own homes. That's right. These intruders made them sleep outside with no mattresses or beddings on the bare ground facing the night sky. It was at this moment that many missed their soft Baymardian pillows, blanket, and so on. These invaders had taken over the entire village. Everyone in the village had grievances within their hearts. After all, they had already lost a few villagers who tried to stand up to these unwelcomed guests. And many didn't want their children, husbands, wives, or other blood relatives to die. They were hoping that these pesky intruders would leave sooner or later because they couldn't possibly want to stay here forever. Right? You there. Where is my beef ramen noodles? I'm sorry, mistress. I'm sorry, mistress. I'll get it right away, said a middle-aged woman who trembled and stuttered with fear. The lady before her was just too scary. She was a beauty, but why did she have evil-looking eyebrows? It made her face look like a villain, and her arrogant personality wasn't helping matters. On the un, the villages all slept outside. Ex-Queen Eliza clicked her brunette hair and smiled pleasantly at the sight of the frightened lady who was running for her dear life. Look at it. Even though she wants a queen anymore, she could still manipulate and control her way to the two if she wanted to. She felt mighty proud. 
and this whole scene made her even more determined to re-enter the palace in future as Queen Mother. She wanted everything under her grasp. The feeling of commanding these lowlifes gave her a very satisfying feeling. Was she a sadist? She didn't know. All she knew was that it made her feel powerful to see others whimper beneath her. She smiled and lowered her eyes to the village ladies who were busy massaging her feet. Heh. Power felt good. With it, she could have everything that she wanted. Eliza puffed her chest in satisfaction. Soon, a burly man entered the room. Mistress, the few injured horses have been adequately taken care of. Now, we can proceed with our journey. Good. The earlier we get there, the earlier we can save my son. Scylla, I hope that the venomous butterfly assassin guild that you hired is good enough for the job. Scylla patted his own chest reassuringly. Mistress, without a doubt, they'll be able to handle it. That, I can bet with my life. Mistress, even though they are three hundred of them, it would be a piece of cake. Mistress, we can only send in three hundred because we don't want to look too suspicious. And these three hundred will blend in the crowd and won't go in at once. Apart from the assassins, we are also going in with three thousand men for backup. So we don't have anything to worry about. These assassins are highly ranked within the Empire with many accomplishments under their belt. One of them had even sneaked into Deiferous Palace and stolen some dock. You dot mints for the former King Alec Barn before. They could go into a place with thousands of guards and come out unscathed. So you can imagine how powerful just a single assassin was. Then what more of 300? Their skill wasn't to fight thousands of enemies single-handedly, but to sneak in understated and do a specific job. So I'm sure that they'll be able to sneak into the place and sneak back out with His Highness Connor. Eliza felt even more confident while listening to the numerous feats of these so-called top assassins. That's right. She just needed them to sneak Connor out and from there, they would flee back to their secret base in the central part of Arcadina. There was no way that she would allow that uncultured William to keep the throne. How was he more qualified than her baby who grew up in the palace walls? She didn't believe that someone who didn't receive education from the highest men in society could lose to a mere local champion. Victory was within her grasp. At the same time, she was still worried about her baby. She had tortured people before and had made them wish that they were dead instead. And now, she kept having sleepless nights due to all her worries. Yes, she was scared that they would do the same thing to her baby. What if they gorged his eyes out and broke his fingers? What if they sliced his private part off and forced him to eat it raw? What if they made a small cut on his belly, took out his intestines and sprinkled several drops of alcohol on it? What if they sliced off all his limbs? The countless scenarios that passed through her mind almost made her lose her sanity. Her body vibrated with fear as she clutched her heart. Baby, wait for me. Mummy will rescue you. Eliza burned with determination and turned to her most trusted aid. Solar. How long before we get there? Mistress, in two and a half more weeks, we should be there. Good. While everyone was swarming towards Baymard, Landon and his team on the other hand, had just docked on the shores. The military vehicles and tanks popped out of the ship swiftly, leaving all those within the tiny coastal town utterly confused and excited. What the hell did they just see? Everyone ran towards the dock as if they were waiting for the president or something. Look, look. It's a train. Aw, oh, I can't believe it came to our tiny coastal town. Vawa, so this is actually a train? No idiot. You all are wrong. This is obviously what they call an escalator. Really? Old Man Kong, you really know so much? Of course I do. I saw it in the newspaper. But I'll tell you all a secret. I know they're King Landon. Impossible. How can you know him? Humph. You doubting midgets don't know how great I am. As children, don't you know that it's rude to doubt your elders? Heh. Do you know that I personally gave him advice some years back? As the mighty scholar that I am? I taught him the timetable and even gave him the idea to make books. What? You don't believe me? Old Man Kong, we don't believe it. Wait. Are you sure that you're not hallucinating instead? Yeah. Are you sure that something inside your head didn't get loose? Sigh. Old Man Kong has finally gone crazy. Call the healer. Everyone excitedly watched the scene before them. Those who had never gone to Baymard couldn't help but feel very blessed to witness this scene. 
It only made them more determined to go there instead. Sure enough, the newspapers, posters, and pamphlets didn't lie. Baymard was awesome. The vehicles and tanks lined up across the shores until everything needed for the journey was taken out of the ship. With that, the ship headed back into the seas as planned. They were to go and stay on standby until the scheduled day that Landon planned to return. Henry's siblings should already be in the capital by now, waiting for their father to die. He reckoned that they too went early to make preparations for the upcoming battle. Landon smiled and said at the overly excited crowd. He didn't bother whether they could be him or not because no one would be able to report the matter to the enemies this quick. At least, it would take several months for the news to reach the enemy if they had spies around. While he on the other hand, would be in the capital in a matter of days. With this advantage, what was there to fear? Additionally, one should know that several other teams of soldiers and marines were already within Deiphorus, dealing with all bases belonging to the temple. Well, all except for the base closest to the capital. They were to only deal with that one on the same day that Landon would attack the capital. Everything would be cleared up all at once, making things easier for Henry. Plus, he would be able to finish this goddamn mission once and for all. Anyway, Landon and his team had decided to use the main roads for now until they were somewhat close to Henry's hideout near the capital city. Once they were at a distance that was roughly two weeks away by horseback, they would leave the public roads and use the carriage trails within the forests. With that, they were off. Landon and his right-hand men went over their plans again, just to be sure that they weren't neglecting any possible danger. Within the vehicle were all team leaders who would play key roles in the battle to come. The vehicle was as silent as a graveyard, with the occasional sounds of the vehicle. Everyone patiently turned their attention to their monarch calmly. Landon cupped his hands under his chin, with a straight face that was void of any emotions. Gentlemen. Ladies, the time for war has finally come. The art of war in itself is to win with minimum effort. We must create a sense of urgency and desperation for our enemy, while for us on the other hand, it would seem like an ordinary walk in the park. That said, we have two distinctive missions, protect the future King Henry and defeat all enemies on sight. Henry notably has a lot of siblings, but the most ambitious ones are the first Prince Ulrich Tudor, the second Prince Winston Tudor, the third Prince Bonavir Tudor, the fourth Prince Joffrey Tudor, and finally, the second Princess Eldora Tudor. Each of them would most likely come with their army. This means that they would probably keep a portion of their army somewhere around the outskirts of the capital, since it would be too suspicious for their troops to go in. Lieutenant Vlad nodded while listening to Landon. Your Majesty, like you said, there are several scenarios about this matter. Either they are slowly sneaking their men into the city in batches, or they are waiting for the day King Julius Tudor dies before they burst into action. But these groups of people will undoubtedly be their backup. Their main power fraction should have already settled into the city by now. Either way, we can assume that every single enemy has its primary team and its backup team that would surround the capital. Captain Glinder nodded in agreement. Yes, they should have two main teams, one on the inside and one on the outside but a majority of their forces will be on the outside, surrounding the capital city. Glimder spoke while looking at the map again. Your Majesty, looking at the terrain here, I think we should send the air forces to check this part out too. They might have a base around or choose to camp out here instead. You might be right. Earlier on, we had circled seven suspicious locations that they might be hiding in, but these might not be accurate or might be too few. That's why I think we should expand the search perimeters for the air forces. Everyone immediately approved of the suggestion. Earlier on, the reason why they limited the range around the capital was because for starters, the capital city alone was ridiculously high. So they wanted the air force teams to focus on drawing and coming up with an accurate city map with roads. They needed to know what paths to take if they were in a bind or where to go to trap their enemies. Sure. The Air Force teams would be there to aid them if ever they were in a pinch, just as if they were Tom Cruise in a Mission Impossible movie with Benji guiding. Take a left and run to the tavern on your right. Okay. Yes. There's a bridge there. Get to it, cross it, make a left and go three blocks along the fourth road. Wait. Incoming enemies ahead. Turn around and head left. Just like that, the Air Forces were very essential within this enormous city. More importantly, they wanted the layout of the palace. 
That was a must. Everyone agreed to widen the Air Force scope around the outskirts of the capital city. Earlier on, they planned to send most air forces to focus their attention within the city. They did that because unlike the woods, the cities had too many alleyways, roads, and whatnot. It was more complex and interconnected, so it required more eyes to properly take down everything. Of course, unlike the operations on Magoon Island, since this one was more complex, they had chosen to use three nights to make the sketches. And this time, the hot air balloons will go up from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., when most people were bound to be asleep. Again, the sun typically came up around 7.30 a.m., so they were good. Anyway, they'll use these hours for the three days before calling it quits. Following that, they'll use an entire day to put everything together, develop a swift plan for each team to follow, and then take action. With the scope around the outskirts widened, they were sure to pinpoint all locations where the enemy forces were hiding. Without a doubt, some teams will head towards those locations to take out these forces linked to all five siblings of Henry. Who knows, there might actually be more. After all, His Majesty had also said that King Julius' brothers, who had children around Henry's age, were also very ambitious. So they might end up fighting over eight or ten different forces. This battle was unlike any they had faced before. That's why it was best not to allow those in the outskirts to enter the city. They had to separate them from those inside and tackle each group seamlessly. As for Henry's men, they too will play a role in the battle. They will also join the Bay Mardian teams because it was their right to fight for their future king. If the soldiers did all the work and didn't allow them to make contributions, many wouldn't be able to raise their heads in future. That's why apart from joining in on the battle, they would also join the scouts who would head to the city during the daytime. They would be involved, but they had to stick to the plan and focus on their individual missions given to them. Of course, during this entire time, ever since Henry and his men arrived in their secret base, just as Landon had instructed, they began scouting and making taking more of several details within the city and the palace. To know one's enemy is to win the war. Because sometimes, the best information typically came from the slaves and servants who loved gossiping about the everyday life of the royals and nobles who came to the palace. Bottom line, everyone had a part to play in this upcoming war, especially when the enemies were so great in number. All right, just as planned, when it concerned the enemies outside the city, we'll use the table and other highly explosive weapons. We can't waste time on them, so the job needs to be done swiftly. Kill those who resist and capture those who surrender. Even though about 70% of enemy knights will be outside the city, our main priority is on what goes on inside the city. Again, everyone needs to be extra careful while inside. The streets are constantly packed with people, carriages, horses, and vehicles. So I don't want any civilians getting accidentally hurt. Understood? Of course, your majesty. No need to even say it. Everyone nodded in agreement. They would never take action recklessly. Landon knew that they would never take such risks at the expense of an innocent person's life, but as protocol, he had to remind them about it every time they went on missions. That way, if any rouge person did otherwise and got caught, then there was no room for forgiveness. Everyone instantly shriveled at the cold energy leaking from Landon's body. Their gut feeling told them that if any of the soldiers or marines dared, he'd she would find their ashes buried within enemy soil. They couldn't help but say silent prayers for those who dared to go rogue. Landon scoffed and withdrew his aura before smiling again. His charming smile seemed demonic to the rest instead. Your majesty, we wouldn't dare, okay? So why are you smiling creepily? Your majesty, why do I get the feeling that you're imagining how you'll kill someone soon? Everyone took large gulps of saliva down as their spines tingled uncontrollably. Sigh. His Majesty was truly scary when he wanted to be. Their meeting went on with Landon and the team leaders adding more people to the Air Force teams, as well as scrutinizing every possible scenario that could happen. Well, every logical scenario. Things like lightning striking the enemy or aliens invading were undoubtedly out of the question. Although, Landon wouldn't inwardly rule those out because the system seemed to be addicted to making his life far worse than it was. Everyone revised their plans for the next few days while on the road, and before they knew it, they were close to the hideout. The vehicles entered the forest through a secret trail that Henry had told Landon about. By carriage and horseback, 
it would take at least nine hours to get to the hideout. But for them, it was a piece of care. They were before they even knew it. Of course, the scouts who saw the vehicles deep within the forest instantly knew who they were. After all, Landon regularly visited Henry multiple times. So many knew of Landon's visit with his men. They knew that the Baymardians would help Henry sit on the throne. The moment they saw the vehicles, they were utterly filled with joy and quickly headed to report the news to Henry. But with how fast the vehicles were going, they couldn't outrun the vehicles. So Landon and the rest ended up waiting a bit outside the hideout. As per their rules, even if they knew who Landon was, their leader still had to give the go-ahead before they could enter. The soldiers didn't see anything wrong with it and decided to wait in the vehicles. It wasn't like they were out there in the sun, so why should he feel bad in the vehicles? Landon and his men chilled while snacking and drinking some beverages. They arrived during lunchtime. So many were indeed hungry. They chose not to eat because they knew that Henry might insist on preparing some small feast. So wouldn't it be rude to refuse? The men waited patiently as if they had all the time in the world. And soon, Henry burst out on horseback excitedly. Brother! Landon looked out of his window and smiled. Brother! Landon stepped out of his vehicle and hugged the lean man before him. Henry, himself, and Asta had similar body sizes and were all somewhat slim when compared to many. William and Sirius were a little bit muscular than they were, but not overly exaggerated. Henry smiled broadly while hugging his lifesaver. This was the man that saved his life when he got captured earlier, and this same man still came to his aid to put him on the throne. Of course, Henry wasn't dumb. There was no free meal in this world. Even though he already had a positive feeling towards Landon based on all he heard about Baymard, he still held back a bit when he first met Landon. Why? Because he didn't know why this famous man would favor someone like him so he felt like he wouldn't live up to whatever Landon's expectations were. In fact, one could see where Henry's inferiority complex came from. Because in his case, he was truly alone with almost no support in this cold world. For William of Arcadina, he had his parents alive, who also pushed him through in a way. For Penelope and Corona, her parents did the same. Sirius from Yodin was also similar because I'm his father had hidden the fact that he was the successor of the throne from everyone so no one even mentioned him, making him gather more forces in the dark. His father had cleared the way and done several things in secret for him as well. Not to talk of Asta from Terry K, who had the backing of his family as well. All these people had support one way or another. But Henry's case was different. His mother died when he was still a child, and his stepmothers in the palace prevented him from learning all he could. They only allowed him to know how to read, write, sword fight, and do addition and subtraction. Things like learning military tactics or other military skills weren't taught to him in the palace. Of course, they did all this to him behind his father's back. So every time his father questioned his sons to see their progress, Henry always remained at the bottom. In Julius' eyes, he was a worthless son. That said, Henry's maternal grandfather usually found ways to invite the boy over to teach him some things that weren't taught in the palace. So Henry wasn't precisely losing out much. But how could good things last for long? Fate played a cruel trick on Henry, as just that a while later, his mother's family seemed to have committed some sort of crime, pulling their status from high-ranking nobles to lower-class nobles. At that moment, their contacts became limited as many didn't want to have anything to do with them, and their money began to shrink. Of course, everything should have been fine since they had a ton of treasures that could last them decades in their treasury. But how could things be that easy? A while later, one of his royal mothers claimed that the family wanted to assassinate her, and all evidence and witnesses testified it to be true. So his grandfather who was said to be the culprit was executed, and as compensation, 80% of what was in their treasury was sent to the palace. Henry felt desolate during that time, as everything he ever lived was taken away by the royals. They killed his mother, and then they followed to kill his grandfather too. Everything made his blood boil AMD. He wanted nothing more than to get revenge. But how could he when he had no support? The moment he turned 14, legal adult age in Deiferous, he was given his knights to manage, which were made of the weakest knights around. Of course, he was also given a very remote and dangerous place to govern as well. The city was filled with criminals, gang members, and whatnot. Fortunately, 
A few people who were his grandfather's shadow guards came to him and swore their allegiance to him. Why? Because of their promise to his grandfather. In this cruel world, Henry's grandfather was really a good and simple man. In his younger days, he broke away from the clan because he couldn't do the things they asked of him. And then, he bought an estate and started his own family. He was a war god who only fought justly and had won countless battles for the empire, so his feats were mighty. He did his best to raise Henry without trying to make it too obvious. But sadly, the enemy his time was up. The famous war god of Deiphorus died because of a framed assassination attempt. Even his father was happy about it because his father had always been wary of the war god. Henry was all alone at that point, and his grandfather's people dared to contact him yet because they would be putting him at risk again. Nonetheless, the royals captured many of his grandfather's people and killed them off. Of course, many stayed in hiding and assumed noble lives as farmers and peasants. Nonetheless, they were very loyal to his grandfather, and they more than anyone else knew that if they ripened their mouth to reveal any secrets, then they too would die. So many of the war god's secrets ended up dying with him. The royals who wanted to know everything ended up learning of just one of his hideout bases. The rest were still a mystery to this day. It was as if the heavens were constantly preventing them from knowing anything else because they couldn't pry open the mouths of these people. And so Henry used his grandfather's bases and began his journey of survival. At the time, Henry never thought of taking the throne, just getting revenge. But after speaking with Landon, he changed his mind. Why? Because Landon had the same vision as his grandfather. And after seeing the contract, he was even more convinced of Landon's character. The man had a goal to help the people and wanted to put good people on the throne. Apparently, this was the reason why this great man chose to put him on the throne. It was all for the people's benefit. Henry saw his grandfather in Landon and felt more motivated than ever. He was right. The empire was rotten and the people were suffering. Someone had to do something about it. So why not him? It was time for Deiphorus to change. Henry looked at the vehicles in amazement and awe. It wasn't just him, as everyone else felt itchy and wanted to rush in and take a look. Because of Henry's unique situation, they've never left Deiphorus for years now. So they only saw images of these several cars, trains, bicycles and buses on newspapers and whatnot. That's why seeing the real thing up close almost gave them a heart attack. Henry's lips quivered, and his hands shook as he anxiously started at Landon. Brother, can I take a look? Sure, but why don't we go in first? I'm sure some of your men also want to take a look as well. So we can do all that while we're inside. Henry's men looked at Landon gratefully before looking at their master in an aggrieved manner. Master, how can you think of seeing it alone? What about us? Didn't you say that we were family? Master, is this how fast you've forgotten is? Henry smiled awkwardly before getting back on his horse. With that, they led Landon and his crew into a vast cave. At the entrance, the cave could only allow one carriage or vehicle to go in at a time. But as they advanced, the cave began expanding. It was huge and had several tunnels as well. Henry and his men escorted their visitors in for a full 34 minutes before they exited the complex cave. Landon looked at the scene before him as nodded with satisfaction. He had to say that this particular base was well hidden compared to the one he last saw when he saved William from Connor and James. As expected of the late god of war's secret base, the hidden impenetrable fortress was properly camouflaged and blended in very well with the surroundings just right. Even Landon had a hard time spotting if what he saw were buildings or not. Henry truly had a great grandfather. The gang drove in for another 30 minutes while matching the pace of the horses. And finally, they arrived at their destination. As expected, there were over 17 different buildings within the place and a total of four walls, diving the base into sectors. VRMM. The knights who were training stopped and stared at the vehicles with their mouths wide open. Instantly, their bodies responded to their excitement, making them stare without looking away. In the face of shocking and jaw-dropping technology, their concentration during training had flown out the window. What a joke. How often do they get to see such things? Everyone stared like mindless happy zombies. Landon looked out the window and smiled before facing Henry, who was walking alongside his window on horseback. Your base is good. 
Thanks. It was my grandfather's. I know, Landon thought. All right, let's focus on something more important. Henry's heart rate increased rapidly, and his face turned serious. Yes, we do have important matters to discuss. Exactly. Nothing is more important than this matter. It's a do-or-die affair that must be solved as soon as possible. Brothers, I know. It's about this war, right? War? Who the hell was talking about that? Henry scrunched his face in confusion. Brother, aren't we talking about the upcoming battle? Eh, why would I talk about that here? What I'm talking about is way more important than that. Henry's mind was piqued, and he couldn't help coming up with many unexpected theories and conclusions. What could Brother Landon mean? What could be more important than this war? Wait, is there something else that, or didn't know? Instantly, he became anxious. Brother Landon, what could be more important? Eh, you really don't know? Not a clue, brother. So what is it? Well, it's food. Henry felt like his ears were blocked. He didn't hear what he thought he heard, right? Brother, did you just say food? Yup, that is the most important thing. Forget it. Henry looked at Landon helplessly. How could he forget that his brother of his liked to tease him? Was it because he was younger than him by a measly year? Henry felt like he was being bullied. Landon chuckled playfully. Little brother Henry, why do you always look at me like this? I'm being serious. My men and I haven't eaten lunch yet because we were rushing to get to you. So to us, food is the most important thing right now. Or do you want us to starve to death? I thought you would be happy to see us and would prepare a large feast for us. But sadly, it looks like I was mistaken. Sigh. It looks like you never thought of feeding us at all. Just look at how pitiful we are. Henry glared at Landon. When did I say that I won't? Before going out to meet you, I already asked the kitchen to prepare a hearty meal. We've spent an hour just entering the base. So by now, the food should be ready. He he he. As expected, you did prepare a meal for us. Ugh. When did I ever say that I didn't? Henry shook his head wryly. He could never beat this brother of his in a mouth battle. Earlier on, he left the fortress speedily, using around 35 minutes to get to Landon. But since they are walking back, they spent a little over an hour before getting here. So it's been close to two hours now, and the kitchen should have something already made. And even if it wasn't ready, it shouldn't be long before they could eat. Brother, are you sure you won't sleep in the fortress buildings? No, we have comfortable beds here. So we'll sleep here. Don't worry. After I show you the inside of the vehicle, you'll understand. Henry nodded in understanding. The gang advanced further until they bypassed the fourth gate within the estate. They parked their vehicles in formation and only allowed people to tour the vehicles used for sleeping and eating. Of course, everyone went crazy. They touched the vehicles and almost kissed them. What sort of material did they use to make the interiors? More still, what was used to make the thing called tires? They also stared at the clear glass windows and the cool designs used in the vehicle's interior and exterior. At this point, they felt like rushing Henry to take the damn throne so that they could go to Baymard on vacation. Again, before coming here, Henry had ordered many solar TVs and cassettes. But the goods will only be given to him after all the enemies were taken care of, lest his men get distracted. Anyway, they had their meal very soon. And following that, Landon, Henry, and a few others made their way to Henry's office. It was time to get down to business. Landon, Henry, and a few others sat in Henry's office to finalize some major issues. One should know that months ago after Henry signed the contract, he and Landon discussed how to put an end to many practices in Deiferous. Of course, Landon also gave Henry time to discuss these issues amongst his aides as well. After all, it was their empire, and Landon didn't want to make all the changes himself. Nonetheless, he educated them on the consequences of many practices, which left them stunned and fearful. And today, he wanted to discuss the last few things on his agenda. Henry's aides, Trenton and Mike, were with them, as well as Lieutenant Vlad, Captain Glinder, Captain Amelia, and Warrant Officer Corwin. This was a formal meeting, and in matters like this, they needed someone to take down the meeting minutes. So Corwin was chosen for the job. Over time, with Landon's regular visits to Henry, he and his men had gotten very much used to taking meeting etiquette. And they had to say, it made everything a whole lot better and smoother. 
Earlier on, whenever Landon warped over, Henry's men had to learn about creating agendas, taking minutes, and whatnot. And now, several months later, they got a handle on it. So when Landon's team passed the documents around, they first wrote their names and signed to confirm their attendance. From there, they picked up the well-typed documents before them calmly. Of course, water bottles were also shared around the table too. With that, Henry officially began the meeting. After all, it was his empire and his region, so he had to take center stage, while Landon would be second behind him. Lady and gentlemen, for as long as we Dayfers can remember, we have indulged in some traditional practices created by our forefathers with the intention of war only. These practices have long since made our people uncomfortable, and some are also unhealthy as well. That said, we must eradicate the bad practices from our glorious empire permanently. With that, I'll hand over the floor to His Majesty Landon, who will further explain the issues at hand. Thank you, Prince Henry, Landon said while nodding before finally focusing his attention on everyone else. Everyone. Like the prince has said, we will work hard to reevaluate and stop some of the practices that seem to hinder the growth and rose of the empire. So without wasting any more time, everyone should please turn a page too. We'll start from there. Flip flip. The sounds of pages turning echoed across the tranquil room. Landon looked at them and smiled. Lady and gentlemen, our first problem arises with birth. Everyone's ears were perked up as they listened attentively. Why childbirth? For Landon, the problem was the birth process itself, but traditions that followed. Where to begin? Unlike the other empires, Deiphorus had a bizarre and terrifying way of raising children. Right from birth, the children's fates were decided by the sacramentos. They were found in every town and city, and those in villages also had to report to the closets, towns, and cities to meet them. The Sacramentos were a group of people that decided if a child would live or die. So every pregnant lady had to inform any Sacramento around. It was illegal to give birth without the presence of a Sacramento. Even royalty wasn't exempt. For difference, from the day they were born to the day they died, their lives were under constant examination. They were seen as high-level products that would boost the empire to the next level. It was believed that the only reason they were alive was to make their empire great. Now, starting from the root of the problem here, from the moment the child popped out of the woman's belly, the Sacramento would do one of two things. If the child were a girl, the child would be given to his mother to raise as normal. But, the mother had to take the female child to the Council of Fertility to examine whether this child would be able to bear children in future. They believed that the fatter the child's thighs, the more children the child would have in future, as it already showed signs of having excellent childbearing hips. As they said, everyone was born to make the empire great. So even women had their own expectations. Now, if the child was a boy, then things got a lot more complicated. At that point, they would be taken by a sacramento to the nearest in Jang, which was a council with several leading elders that were very skilled in war or other positions. From there, the child would be inspected like goods in a store. If the child was disabled, mentally ill, by not crying, then he was no use to the empire. A real man came out of his mother's womb strong. So why would they want such weaklings? And so when a newborn was deemed as useless, what do they do to it? They would be abandoned in the wilderness to survive and prove themselves, even though they were just a few hours old. So many a times, over 70% of these babies got eaten by wild beasts while the rest were sometimes picked up by peasants that would take them, intending to use them as cleaners to clean their houses and do their work for them. Everyone knew that babies in the wilderness were wastes. So why not pick it up and get free labor? Of course, some somehow managed to survive but were taken in by wolves or other animals, which was strange but true. At times, slave traders will also collect these babies after they were thrown in the wilderness. For them, they got these slaves free of charge without paying for anything. So why not? This was a good investment. Again, the female children who were rejected by the Council of Fertility also got thrown into the wilderness. All in all, the councils decided the fates of the children. And for this matter, Landon was utterly speechless. If they didn't want the babies, why not send them to Baymart? Do these people know how dangerous the wilderness is? Just the crazy creatures in this world were enough to deal with a handful of adults. 
So why send a poor, innocent, defenseless child there? Wasn't this too cruel? This Deiphorus was really something else. Henry smiled bitterly when he saw the reaction from a few people from Baymart. He, more than anyone else, knew how barbaric his empire's rulers were. Just because they have been doing it for so long doesn't mean that the citizens approve of it. Some mothers woke up after labor to hear that their child was sent to be thrown into the wilderness. No matter how evil or good one was, their child had a bond with them. And they weren't even allowed to see that child from the moment they birthed it. Some didn't even know what their children looked like. Of course, even though there were councils around, some people still managed to cheat the law. Some royals or nobles had successfully fought over some people in the council, which guaranteed their children's lives. But peasants and poor people were different. They had no connections or power, so the verdict sometimes made them annoyed and unwilling. Who would like to have their baby thrown away? In Henry's case, he was almost thrown away since his stepmothers wanted him dead. Fortunately, his grandfather threatened the council, and that's why he came to be alive to this day. Back on the matter of the babies, those deemed healthy and beneficial to the empire were sent back to their families immediately. The girls were brought up ordinarily, but the boys were groomed for toughness. So they were never bathed with water, but strong rum instead. This in itself was a bitter test that these babies had to go through. And any baby that had convulsions and died would be taken as those who tried to pull a fast one on the council. They managed to slip past the first test, but now with this test, weren't they caught? Humph. So young, yet so deceitful. Again, the babies that passed this step were preconditioned to stay in extremely dark rooms, even in the daytime. Why? Because they wanted them to get used to darkness and loneliness. If they were to cry or complain, those taking care of them ignored them until they learned to bottle things up. As a man, how can they be whiny? They had to suck it up. Of course, all this lasted till they were seven years old, which was when they would go to the fourth test. Of course, before this time, many had already begun working and earning a living, as children within this era worked the moment they could walk and speak correctly. But their first seven years belonged to them, and now, their lives were owned by the empire. Anyway, at seven years old, they began their fourth test by going to the council once more. They would head on to the Paragon and register themselves there. And that's where they start as pages, the lowest knight rank. Here, they would undergo an intensive 12-year-long test that shaped them into fearless warriors and schooled them in survival tactics. Of course, females had their own place where they would be taught how to strengthen their thighs in order to give birth to strong future warriors for the empire. They also learned how to properly ride a horse, run, and do simple exercises as well. Everything was beneficial for strengthening their highs. And back in the matter of boys, during their 12 years of training, those who are good enough will be dropped out and can resume duties as farmers and whatnot. And after that, those who remained would be stuck as knights. They either died during training or survived. Previously, they could be sent back to their families after failing the rank up within the training fields. Rather than their opponent killing them during training, they were expelled. They were also forced to walk barefoot, even on the snow, because doing so would harden their feet, creating calluses so that they would be able to match for miles. Even the early humans walked barefoot and survived, so why can't they? And so they began their hellish training. But after four years, there was no such thing as expelling them or keeping their lives. The opponent that took them on during training had the right to kill them. So now, everyone fought more seriously to survive. What they learned earlier on were things that the army wouldn't mind non-specialists knowing. But now that there was no turning back, they were taught the serious stuff. From here on out, the weak were mercilessly brutalized and beaten randomly to keep them on their toes. Teachers created tension by creating friction between them to stimulate their potential and find the strongest among them. In short, the weak were treated with disdain. And as for their body form, each child was given a very bright yellowish garment to wear all year round. They were to wear nothing else when outside their homes. They would wrap the cloth just like the Greeks did, which exposed their legs and one side of their upper back. And why were they told to wear this garment? Well, it was just to control their body weight and fat. So if they were fat and didn't know how to fit into what they were given, then they had no choice but to exercise. The garments given to each batch were the same length and width range that the army wanted, bringing about tremendous results. The sizes were cut depending on the age range. 
At the same time, after joining the Paragon, the boys would be underfed to encourage them to sneak out at night and hunt food for themselves or steal food. And if they were caught, they were severely punished by being caught. That's right. They weren't punished for stealing but for getting caught. So they would be whipped and beaten because they were sloppy enough to get caught. Again, reducing the rations for food made the boys used to hunger. All in all, throughout their training, over 40% of people died. And over 70% of babies died after birth. One might think that the people were happy and should be used to it. But that assumption was wrong. Mothers silently prayed for their children to survive as almost every day, fed bodies were sent back to their homes. Many prayed that their children would be amongst those who had dropped out earlier on during training. But their children wouldn't make such apparent moves because those who don't fight with everything they had will be killed as well. One should know that these trainees could only be allowed to live outside the Paragon barracks after the age of 27. So they never got to see their family or even write to them until they got permission. And even though some got married, they could only see their families once every four years. They used that holiday period to procreate with their wives and ensure that they had an heir. Of course, this was for the future knights. Those who got expelled became regular farmers, servants, workers, and whatnot. They were no longer the concern as the entire and were free to do as they liked. In other words, they were wastes in the empire's eyes. And nobles who owned property were even freer than everyone else. Undoubtedly, throughout history, the people had tried to stand up against these practices. But the results remained unchanged, so they gave up. One might think that this was just one of the things that Deiphorus enforced. But once again, assuming that would be far from the truth. They also believed that if a woman couldn't give birth after marriage, she was guilty of fooling the council when she was born and should be put to death. For this, Landon just felt like they had to stop such rules and traditions. That's right. They had to dissolve the councils. Everyone was fully engaged in the discussion as they candidly expressed their opinions. Your Majesty Landon, I agree with removing the council. Mike, who was one of Henry's aides, said. And another aide massaged his chin and nodded in agreement as well. Yes, I second that. Not only should they be removed, but the practices should be changed as well. These laws were made way back when Deiphorus had numerous empires within it. At that time, Deiphorus size was similar to a handful of a few cities, towns, and villages. Its size was relatively small back then. But because of that, the early leaders made these rules to ensure that only the strongest warriors would be birthed and survive in order to conquer the other territories, hence expanding Deiphorus size to what it is today. These rules only want the string to survive in Deiphorus and had no place for the weak, which shouldn't be the case. Your Highness Henry, Your Majesty Landon, Lady and Gentlemen, I speak in agreement because I came from a poor pleasant family and understand the pains of those below power. The rich can always bribe the council leaders to share their child's life, but many peasants have suffered tremendously because of these laws. Everyone listened with pain at all the injustice within the empire. For Mike and Trenton, they earnestly prayed that this meeting wasn't a dream. Why? Because many have fought for change but failed and were smacked in the face with refusal from those with higher authorities. No one thought that this day would come. Women were killed or sold into slavery after 27, menopause period in this era, if they couldn't birth a child. Again, it was a rule for slaves to be used as lab rats for the training soldiers. They would send slaves to fight these trainees. The slaves weren't allowed to kill the trainees, but the trainees could kill them if they wanted to. Slaves were nothing but dirt. So if they died, what did it have to do with the empire? In short, there were more than 100 rules available that kept the people living in fear, be it men or women. They lived in constant fear that one day, someone would end their lives for these reasons. And so those without money lived miserably. Everyone carefully went through these laws in Deiphorus and decided which one stayed and which one could go. These rules were made way back then. So now that the empire was this big and stable, then obviously, a change was needed. The meeting went on until they reached the final thing on their agenda. All right, the last thing for today is more so about the dangers of some jobs in your empire. And the most troubling job is that of the chimney cleaners. Eh, everyone, including the Bay Mardians, looked at him in confusion. Chimney cleaners? What's so dangerous about that? 
Landon looked at them sternly. This matter was indeed a serious one which was no joking matter. Everyone, please turn to page 32, and we'll begin from there. Flip, flip. With that, many turned their pages and were immediately met with a gruesome visual that almost made them puke. The picture was so disgusting that it caused a gut-wrenching effect on their insides. What was this? Landon observed and was pleased with their reactions. Why exactly were chimney cleaners at risk? Well, that was all because of what they took in while cleaning the chimneys. The story starts with deiferous unique buildings. Because unlike the other memories that built their chimneys in a strategic way that didn't rely on chimney cleaners, deiferous famous buildings did. Without a doubt, the master architect for the buildings in deiferous was a very artistic person that loved to think outside the box. Of course, the person launched a vision of what he wanted Deiferous to look like thousands of years ago. And since then, the nobles also chose the building styles as well since it made them feel closer to the royals, who by the way had the same building designs too. Unlike other buildings and other empires, Deiferous buildings had smaller and narrower chimneys. And in massive buildings for the rich that had over 15 or so fireplaces, rather than separating the chimney flues, passages slash ducts, Deiferous made it complicated instead. One can imagine their setup as a maze that connected, separated, and reconnected over and over again before finally exiting through a massive while at the very top of the building. There were both horizontal and vertical flues, chimney spaces, with some bending at right angles and whatnot. The entire thing was like a puzzle that utterly confused the people that had to clean it up. Oh yes. Most people would happily think of Disney's Mary Poppins when they imagine chimney cleaners. But the truth was, these poor cleaners lived very brutal and short lives. In fact, one could arguably say that they had the shortest life spans due to the cruel nature of their jobs. With the very narrow and maze-like chimneys in Deiferous, the design constantly needed people's help to clean it up, unlike the other chimneys in other empires. And for how narrow the chimney was, only small children could fit into them. So, these children would start right from the base of the buildings, using one fireplace. So they would begin climbing up the chimney with some firm bushes slash plants which were tied together to form a brush. They would climb up with the brush over their heads. As they climbed, they did what any ordinary cleaner would do. Brush down the soot, which would fall straight to the bottom. Again, with how narrow the flues were. They typically crushed like lizards completely nude while climbing up and trying to find on to their dear lives. Because if they fell, then the results would be disastrous. Buildings in this era were typically tall, massive, and were primarily high ceiling ones. Just the ground floor was as tall as two and a half modern day building floors combined. They loved the very castle like tall designs that showcased their paint on the walls and ceilings, which in turn showed off their wealth. You could enter a hall on the second floor and feel like an ant within the massive tall room with enormous pillars. The higher the floor height, the wealthier one seemed. So if a building had three or four stories, then that was extremely high. But since the chimneys needed cleaning, the boys had to climb up and do their jobs. From there, everything was a maze that troubled the very young boys. One should know that after climbing up vertically for a bit, they would be met with several horizontal and vertical paths leading to other directions. The whole thing was a dangerous web that Landon felt the need to educate these people before it was too late, because no spoonful of sugar would make this medicine go down. And that was a fact. You hear that, Mary Poppins? Mary Poppins. Erm, um, could you please leave me out of this? Just a spoon. Landon. Shut up. She's an accomplice. Take her away. Mary Poppins. Wait, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. It was Walt's idea. Walt Disney. Excuse me, ma'am, but who are you? Landon. Take her away, boys. A spoonful of sugar, my ass. Everyone listened incredulously. They never knew that such a seemingly ordinary job could be so dangerous. The key was in the soot. Chimney cleaners typically had to work as apprentices under their masters for at least eight years before they could be released. Every day, they would go to work cleaning one chimney or another because with how complex these chimneys were, they needed to be cleaned at least four times a week. So if a single massive building had over 15 chimneys, there would undoubtedly be more than 40 flues connecting like a maze. And that was just in a single building, not to talk of the other buildings within the estates or manors. 
One should know that by the time the cleaners had managed to emerge at the top of the building fully nude, their entire bodies would be covered in soot. So, since they worked every day, coming in contact and ingesting such large amounts of soot, of course nine out of ten times, they wouldn't last long. Many developed asthma and other breathing ailments with time. They also had sores and other inflammation on their eyelids too. Moreover, the jobs stunted their growth since they remained crouched in unnatural positions while inside the right chimneys, which damaged their growing joints and bones, with their knees and elbows getting swelled up and remaining heavily affected. Mind you, these children began work at the age of four, so they were still growing. Of course, these cleaners were typically the discarded citizens thrown away in the wilderness at birth and rescued by their masters to be chimney cleaners. Moving on, when it came to their work environment, it was one that would make many across the work terrified since the insides of the flues were pitch black. Of course, for the dayfers, it wasn't the darkness that scared them, but the fact that they didn't know where they were going or what was in front of them. They just entered the dark tunnels and hoped to come out of the maze. The chimneys were very claustrophobic and brutal to navigate. So even if the cleaner managed to fit through the narrow portals, there was no guarantee that they would get out. That said, with the complex design, even if they managed to reach the top, they would still have to go back down again. If they kept on taking the wrong way, then too bad, they would be stuck in a pitch black maze while nude. And the thing was that even when they were working, the fires were on. So soot and heat constantly clouded the portals. The lost ones eventually suffocated and choked to death, while others died of extreme dehydration. That's right. 90% of chimney cleaners didn't last for more than a few months on the job. That's why most masters got slaves rather than citizens to do the job. But when someone was stuck there, what would their master do? Well, he either let the child die there or sent another sweeper into the pitch dark maze. But many a times, even the rescuer would get lost, leaving the master to lose two money makers. Hence, the masters usually didn't send any rescue team and just left the unfortunate child to die within the maze-like portals. But to further show how cruel these masters were, at times, they would increase the flames at the starting point below to encourage the boys to work faster. Once again, the most prominent danger was cancer. Yup, they were indirectly smoking an unhealthy amount of cigarettes daily. So typically, by the time they reached 10, they were already sick as hell since they started work at age 4. That's why their lives were the shortest. Again, that wasn't the only form of cancer they got, as they also developed cancer of the scrotum, aka sootwort. As they are fully nude while doing the job, well, some things were bound to happen. The disease makes its first appearance at the bottom of the scrotum, where it produces a painful, ill-looking sore that makes that particular area as red as a tomato. The pain they felt was sometimes equivalent, if not worse, to the feeling of one having their lower region kicked. So try living with that every second, minute, hour, and day. Of course, the pain level varied throughout the day, so one never knew when the pain level would rise to max level. Again, scrotum cancer only began to show after boys who managed to survive successfully hit puberty. That's right. Even if they somehow struggled to survive, newsflash, they would still be hit with some deadly disease and die. It all happened like a bad dream. And after puberty, in no great length of time, it penetrated the skin and took hold of the testicles before making its way to the abdomen like a plague. From there, one could imagine what other damages it would cause. In fact, it would be a miracle if these chimney boys who got the disease after puberty lived past the age of 20. Sigh. The life of a chimney cleaner was awful. As expected, Mary Poppins and Bert had fooled everyone. Maybe this was the supercalifragilistic expialidocious that they were talking about? Landon properly explained all the dangers involved with the matter, all the while showing them several gruesome images that he created as well. Instantly, Henry was now more worried than ever. Now that he knew the dangers, he would never allow them to do this. It strictly went against his morals. But like Landon had said, because of the complex chimney design, Deiferous needed a way to clean the chimneys. So what can they do about the matter? Landon smiled broadly at the men who were currently trying to crack their brains on this matter. Even back on Earth in modern times, there were narrow chimneys and professionals that also cleaned them while wearing safety equipment. So even though it was impossible to send a child in, that didn't mean that they couldn't do anything about it. Everyone. 
Solving this issue won't be a problem. To make it easier, I've detailed the solution on the documents as well. That said, if you have any suggestions, then we can also talk about it as well. He already had a solution for this complex issue? Henry's eyes opened wide in astonishment as he carefully turned to the page that Landon mentioned. His eyes beamed with joy and turned to Landon gratefully. Thank you. Landon tapped his shoulders and chuckled. What's this? Why are you getting all emotional on me? Like I said, our empires are all united now. And since you've officially joined in as the fifth ruler to enter the U.N. United Nations, then you should understand that it's everyone's responsibility to better the people's lives. The better the lives of the citizens, the stronger our empires. So it's nothing. Everyone looked at Landon with awe. His goal of world unity was truly heartwarming. Henry firmed his heart and swore to be a great monarch as well. He would follow his brother's footsteps and lead his people to longer, safer, and more financially stable lives. All right. If you remember, on the contract, there was an act with rules and regulations for chimney workers. First, they must be of ADULT age to begin work. Of course, there are many rules that ensure their safety there, which you can look up later on. Again, while cleaning is going on, no one is allowed to use the fireplaces. Anyway, for how you'll go about cleaning the chimney, I propose you create what my Bay Mardian people call a laundry chute or vent hole. Except, Yours will have a hard door that needs to be locked at all times unless someone comes over to clean the chimneys. Essentially, you have to create several of these rectangular holes on different point intervals along the very long flues. That way, people won't have to necessarily go in. Again, you can also buy extendable brushes and brooms that stretch for long distances. So you can just open the chute slash vent doors on the walls and clean from there. Additionally, when faced with horizontal flues, we also have solar fans to hold against the vents to blow the cleaned up soot towards the vertical vents, making it fall right down below. Of course, you will also need to buy face masks and other things from us for safety as well. Your Majesty Landon, why does it seem like you're marketing your products instead? Henry shook his head wryly. Just when he was about to praise Landon, this once again showed his shamelessness. Well, at least what he said does make sense. Just like that, the meeting finally concluded with Henry treating the docu.mints as gold. He kept them away because they detailed many key points of what he should do once he became king. And what made him happier was that later on, he would receive yet another docu.mint on the meeting minutes, which would also cover some suggestions that had been brought up, just in case he forgot. So, with all that out of the way, it was time for battle. With the meeting finally coming to an end, Henry's men decided onto different groups and given individual missions to do during these next few days. Of course, they will work alongside the Baymardians diligently. Henry was even more grateful to Landon. Why? Because he didn't even know that his father was this ill? So if he weren't directed by Landon months ago, he would still be in another base far away, very clueless about the current facts. Like he said, he never thought of being king. It was only after meeting Landon that he changed his mind. He was also very shocked that his second brother had chronically poisoned their father. It looked like his second brother would have his men stationed and react to fight his first brother for the throne. But these two weren't the only ones. His third and fourth brothers were at it too, alongside his second sister, Eldora. It looks like everyone had been preparing and planning for a long time. And only he was left in the dark. For sure. He had more siblings, as his father Julius bore 21 children with many wives. So gave him four children, while others gave him two. And what was so funny was that his first brother, the crown prince, was just a day older than his second brother from another mother. And in that same year, his third brother was born too. So all three were the same age. His father just jumped all around his harem, impregnating people here and there. But what was so funny was that these 21 were the ones that survived the council's judgments. The haram was a deadly place with all the women plotting against each other. So his father should have had roughly 33 children, but they were thrown away into the wilderness. And at the same time, many of these children were secretly murdered before they were even thrown away. Who would want an enemy living in hiding and waiting to take the throne? Many of the harem's women paid heavily to have their enemy wife's baby killed secretly. And even if the mother of these babies sent their guards to protect their child, one could never be too sure since the enemy could hire assassins or stalk that baby for life. 
Bottom line, his father had a lot of children, but from what Brother Landon had told Henry, only his first four brothers, as well as his second sister, were ambitious. Again, he had to watch out for two of his uncles from his father's side, who also wanted to take the throne alongside their families. Heavens, his enemies were many. Luckily, he had Brother Landon with him, or he wouldn't know how to face this storm alone. He wasn't ashamed to seek help because at times, even a ruler needed allies that will come to their aid in emergencies. Henry, Landon, and their men quickly placed everyone in teams and went through their battle preparations, as well as the duties everyone would play on the day of the battle. The day was long, and when nighttime came, they all went to sleep swiftly. Tomorrow was a busy day. They had successfully gone to Dreamworld. Meanwhile, all over the capital city, several people were also making their plans as well. Rocky Peak Courtyard, Royal Palace, Deiferous. A young, strikingly handsome man sat on an exquisite table that was filled with all sorts of delicacies. The minds and servants around him waited on him patiently before leaving the room as fast as they could. As they say, the more handsome the man, the deadlier he was, which was particularly true in the young man's case. The man had a habit of always eating alone, as he didn't like to be disturbed casually. So the maids and servants who knew his preferences hurriedly left. Of course, some blushed and secretly dreamed of having a chance to trap this man and make him theirs. After all, the man was Deiferous Crown Prince, His Highness Ulrich Tudor. He was a man of steel to many and a dangerous one at that who instilled fear even to the old goggles that secretly opposed him. Everyone knew that the current King Julius' life was hanging on a thread. So if these women could latch onto Ulrich, then wouldn't they end up being related to the royals through pregnancy? Of course, many knew that such a thing couldn't happen. But there were always one or two that couldn't stop fantasizing about taking down their Prince Charming. With the room all cleared up, Ulrich slowly bit the food before him in silence. And only after getting his feel did he push the dishes aside. Blue Wolf. Swish. Master. Out of nowhere, a man dressed in all black popped out of the shadows and knelt before Ulrich, who still had a cup of wine in his hands. He served the glass for a bit, while staring blankly at the space before him. Report. Master, that Kobold guy is still heavily guarding your father. So this one failed in approaching them. Kobold was in high alert and didn't give me a chance. Hmm. I expected that. After all, Kobold is a legendary assassin who is heavily valued not just within the Pino continent, but within Vainita and Morgany too. So you will be spared from punishment. Thank you, Master. Oh? Don't thank me yet. Even though you couldn't approach them, did you succeed in getting information from the physician? Master, this humble servant did succeed. This humble servant hid in the dark and listened to the physician's conversation with one of Master's uncles. The physician was having a conversation with Duke Bulkington. Ulrich sneered when he heard of that greedy uncle of his. Just yesterday, his men told him that the bastard tried to force his father to write a verdict making him king but his father refused. And now, the bastard was there again, but this time, he went to see the physician. Master, the royal physician recorded that sometime within this week or next, your father should die. Ulrich dropped a grape into his mouth and smiled. Finally, the old geezer would die, leaving everything to him. As crown prince, he knew that his father would leave it all to him. So how, he just had to keep all pesky bugs away. Luckily, he was fully prepared for these bastards. He didn't know exactly when his father would die, but within this time range that the doctor had mentioned, he needed to be fully prepared at all times. Since they want to fight, then he would give it to them because this empire wasn't big enough for all of them. Only he could stand high up triumphantly. Of course, Ulrich wasn't the only one ready for action. Within another courtyard, the second prince, His Highness Winston Tudor, was also ready to give it everything that he had. Crash. F asterisk CK. Who the hell does he think he is? Did you see the way he treated me today? So what if he's the crown prince? Isn't he just a day old for me? So why can't I be king? Crash. Crash. Everyone silently stood alongside the walls, far away from the overly violent Winston. They were more than glad that after his coming of age at 14, he had left the palace and headed towards his official territory. All these years, 
They thought that he would at least change from his very violent and crude ways. But sadly, they were wrong. He was even more destructive than ever. They all sucked in their breaths and leaned into the wall as if trying to disappear into thin air. Their bodies trembled whenever something broke on the floor or walls. Winston was mad and indeed by anger. He swung his sword at the decorative vases and ornaments all around his massive luxurious room while thinking of today's event. Right before the ministers, his father and many others, Ulrich had led Winston into a trap, making his suggestions seem downright stupid. That nonchalant arrogant look made him very like he was nothing. They were both the same age. So why does father not see his potential and choose him as ruler of Deiphorus? With him, he would even go as clear as to claim that he would be able to swallow Jodan while expanding their empire. After all, Deiphorus had the strongest warriors of all. So why not break the agreement they made to not engage with Jodan decades back? Sure, many daughters and some have married royals from other empires to ensure peace. But so what? It's not like he cares for his aunts and sisters who have married other nobles out of Deiphorus. What does it have to do with him? It's not like they had any written agreement for peace. It was just the exchange of daughters and verbal consent that made people remain at peace with one another. And at times, they would let some princes or princesses go to other memories as prisoners. But did that change anything? On the surface, yes. But behind closed doors, no. In secret, the empires fought to take down a few border territories in hours of slowly expanding their empires. So all he was doing was being more open about his future plans. That said, wasn't he the best candidate to rule Deiphorus? He felt like his father was too old school and liked to follow principles a lot. Why must it be the first prince that becomes ruler? For him, Ulrich's only advantage was that his mother, that SL asterisk asterisk, had managed to give birth a day earlier than Winston's mother. Winston was so lost in his rage that he began attacking the servants. Splew. He stabbed several of them, imagining that it was Ulrich instead. Some were so scared that they wanted to run away. But how could the rage-filled Ulrich let them flee? You dare move? He sent his sword towards the thirteen-year-old girl, slicing her head clean from her body. Slash. Bam. The head rolled, while the headless body dropped to the floor on its knees before falling completely. Sprish. Blood forcefully squirted out of the headless girl's neck, painting part of Winston's face. Everyone instantly froze as panic spread amongst them. Winston smiled coldly while smashing the girl's dead body. Look at it. If only you stood still, then you would have just received a sword injury just like the rest. But knew, you just had to run, making me kill you. Now, don't you find yourself stupid? Just like that stupid first brother of mine. You're also mocking me as well, right? How dare you disrespect me by walking away from me first? Who the hell do you think you think you are? Papa, Winston released his rage on the dead body before kicking the head far away. Damn it. Even an ordinary nobody cared to disrespect him today. Winston, who finished letting out steam, was soon visited by his mother, Queen Abadila. Bam. An arrogant woman rushed in impatiently while looking at her warmly. She heard about what happened today, and she too had just come from letting out steam as well. Now she was here to comfort her poor son, who got bullied by others. She dashed in and jumped the body to hug her very pitiful son. Everyone looked at her as if she were their savior. They even began wishing for the king to hurry it up. Either he does, or he gets better. No matter what situation it would be, this arrogant prince would have to leave once everything was settled. Hopefully, he wouldn't become Deiphorus monarch, or their days would be numbered. Just thinking about it sent shivers down their spines. Seeing the woman before him, Winston felt very warm. Only she understood him completely. Even his sisters, the third and sixth princesses, didn't understand him at all. They too were very greedy women who started thinking of the throne after Penelope of Corona got crowned. That's why he sneakily made them marry far away from the capital and sent them off. He didn't want more competition than there already was. And no matter what decisions he made, only this woman would stand by his side and never betray him. Winston felt warm. Mother, that bastard is too bullying. Abadila rubbed her son's back and coldly glanced at everyone. Get out now. Yes, my queen. As if hearing the sounds of liberation, they fled happily for their dear lives. 
who wanted to continue staying here. No way. It was better to mop the floors or do more tasking jobs than to serve these brutes. Soon, the entire room fell silent with no one at sight. Of course, the guards were outside, strictly guarding the room. Abadila's cold eyes turned warm as she glanced at her son. Hush now. Don't worry about that bastard. Why worry when we will soon have him and his bastard mother kneeling before you soon? So why worry about them? What matters is that we will become victorious. And as such, the victor is the rule maker. Don't worry. After the throne is yours, you will have more time to play with that bastard and his cell asterisk T of a mother. Son, always remember today's humiliation. Very soon, you will have your time to play. Winston calmed down and smiled coldly. Yes, mother. How could he forget? Soon, he would pay them back tenfolds. And so just like that, all forces silently waited for the day King Julius would die. On that day, Deiphorus would usher in a storm. Time flew by very quickly, and Landon, Henry, and his men were ready for action. System, you're sure he'll die tomorrow? Of course, host. What do you take this system for? I feel very insulted when the host keeps doubting my alright self. Host, from the world and fate detection, King Julius shouldn't be able to make it past 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Landon nodded, and before leaving his bed, the major advantage he had on his side was that unlike his enemies, he knew precisely when the king would die. So, to not raise any suspicions, he had planned to take out the backup enemy teams lurking around the shadows tonight. The reason he didn't attack them all this while was because he assumed that they would undoubtedly be communicating with their masters these days. So it was likely that they would send in reports every night to their masters in the capital. That's why Landon chose to wait in order not to alert them. And come tomorrow morning, by the time the king draws his last breath, these enemy forces will be utterly shocked by his little gift when they send for their backup to march into the city. Tonight, they'll strike at midnight. At the same time, when the city gates open at 6 a.m., they'll have enough time to sneak into the city around and position themselves all around the place. More specifically, they had to go to the palace. Landon wore his shirt calmly and stepped out of his room. The other soldiers stayed in the vehicles comfortably while he stayed on the same floor as Henry in one of the buildings. Of course, this was to reciprocate their hospitality since they outdid themselves to arrange his room so much in preparation for his arrival. Pam, standing outside was Captain Glinder, who saluted Landon. Your Majesty, all units are ready. Good. Let's go. With that, they descended the stairs and headed towards one of the courtyards there. Landon nodded in satisfaction when he saw everyone standing in line neatly. Even the Dafers were standing in line as well, although they were not as proper as the Baymardians. These few days here almost seem like hell to them. Typically, these men just trained with their swords two hours, two times a day, or did other random things. But the Baymardians were always on their feet. They had weird exercises like frog jumps and so on, which were extremely painful. What made them cry was that they were forced to do all these weird exercises too. A schedule was also given to everyone, indicating what they should be doing throughout the entire today. There was a slot for free time and slots for training, doing their duties and so on. It indeed kept them on their toes. They used to think that dayfers were strict, but now they know that there was another level. What sort of discipline did these people undergo? Some of the Dafers almost cried when punished for talking and laughing when they spoke during one of the captain's speeches. They were punished to run around the courtyard several times while everyone followed the strict mealtime. It was quite tragic because they missed breakfast and could only eat snacks until lunch. They tried sneaking into the kitchen, but the place was so heavily guarded that one might think some mysterious treasure was inside. The men secretly cried and swore to follow the rules for the time being. Again. What made them more pitiful was that the names of those who would go to Baymard for training after the war had already been selected. Some had already envisioned their hard life there. Honestly, how will they be able to survive? Landon met with Henry, and both climbed the wooden stage ahead, alongside the team leaders and Henry's aides. Everyone went on bended knees to salute them. You may rise, Henry said, with both hands raised. Everyone stood firmly and glanced at scare leaders on the stage. Everyone, today, we will begin what our Baymardian brothers call Operation Midnight Dash. We will attack the enemy, giving them no chance for survival. 
We have powerful allies on our side that have the same vision as ourselves. Tonight, we have gathered here to fight for Deiferous' future. Now, my brother will say a few words as well. Landon stepped forward calmly. Brave warriors and soldiers, today will be a memorable day that will be written down in history and foretold countless times. And we will be the voice that fought for the people who needed someone to be there for them. We will be a beacon of hope to many and fight for the motherless, the childless, and all those who have suffered any forms of injustice throughout the years. You all are carrying a heavy responsibility on your shoulders. That's why we, your brothers, are here to help you lessen that burden. Why? Because we believe in your talent, your heart, and your compassion. More importantly, we want to better the lives of the people. Deiferous needs a change, and only we can stop it from falling into destruction. As Landon spoke, everyone felt their hearts drum loudly with excitement. His speech seemed to deeply penetrate their lines, giving them some sense of enlightenment. Many began thinking of their unfortunate families that fell victim to this cruel society. They clenched their fists in determination and swore to do their very best today because now, they truly felt the weight of the Empire's problems. It was funny. Somehow, after listening to his speech, they really felt more alive than ever. Make no mistake, even though every one of you is brave and fearless, we do not need people who will willingly give up their lives at every turn. If you are in a pickle, withdraw and signal for help. And remember, in our teams, we do not leave any man behind. Is that understood? Yes. Good. Now get to your units as planned and prepare for Operation Midnight. Go, go, go. In a flash, everyone was rushed like crazy. All teams assembled and headed out for battle. Some Air Force baskets could fit five people in it, while others could fit three people. The biggest size that they brought out was that which could fit ten people at once. There were twelve massive steel van-like trucks that transported several hot air balloon baskets and other parts needed for flight. Many of Henry's men looked at the balloons in awe rather than shock. After all, they had somewhat gotten over their shock these past few days since the Air Force teams mapped the territories around the capital using the balloons. Again, this was the thing that His Majesty Landon used to bring their master and a few others back when he rescued them. So they had already heard of it even though they found it somewhat unbelievable. How can man fly? At first, they felt like it was a joke or something, but at that time, they had no choice but to believe because their master's sudden appearance was too magical. A journey meant to be done in a few months was completed in a few hours. So wasn't that magic in itself? They looked at the mysterious contraction and felt even more determined to visit Baymart. Unlike before, those chosen to train there were now overly excited. Good they get to visit the strange empire called Baymart. Looking at the site before them still left them in a daze. No matter how many times they saw this strange floating ball, it was a truly groundbreaking sight. It was simply amazing. 11.45 p.m. Teams Alpha, Beta, Omega, Gamma, Z, Hachi, and Delta. What are your duties? Surround the enemy and give them hell. Yes. All seven teams will surround all seven enemy hideouts belonging to 1st Prince Ulrich Tudor, 2nd Prince Winston Tudor, 3rd Prince Bonavir Tudor, 4th Prince Joffrey Tudor, 2nd Princess Eldora Tudor, Duke Bulkington, and Duke Osseus. Hit them with everything that we've got. Is that understood? Affirmative, sir. Good. Teams, Dasher, Prancer, Comet, Cupid, Donner, and Rudolph? What are your duties? Cover the roads and perimeters around the city and keep a lookout. And if necessary, cause distractions in case of emergencies, sir. Air Force units, do you know your tasks? Keep a lookout below and provide battle assistance just as planned, sir. Excellent. Everyone else is to remain here and either protect the base or get to a brief nap. Because come 4.30 a.m., it will be time to rise, eat, and prepare for victory. The gates open at 6 a.m and we must be there. Now, those on tonight's mission only have five more minutes to get in the vehicles and balloons. It's time to move out. Yes, sir. With that, Operation Midnight officially began. Henry and Landon hopped onto one of the hot air balloons alongside the soldiers. Of course, a few soldiers on today's mission stayed within the base in one of the vehicles that acted as their control station, tower, for tonight's operation. 
Vince and Athino looked out the window in disbelief. How could they be moving this fast? Heavens! Wasn't this faster than His Highness' famous stallion? How could a distance of several hours be done in minutes? Vincent touched the inside of the vehicle in a daze, while convincing himself that he was truly here. His heart leaped with an indescribable amount of joy, and his body began trembling to the little vibrations from the vehicle as it bumped along the uneven roads. He looked out the window and saw several tiny glowing dots floating easy up in the air. If it were before, they would think that it was some moving star or something. But now, he knew that there were amazing men from Baymard who seemed to know everything. Just interacting with them these few days made his blood boil as they broadened his mind to a whole new level. During the training battle, they beat them hands down, which left them holding their heads in shame. Some even took fifteen of them at once and beefed up victoriously with no hassle. For the first time, they truly saw how lacking they were. And the way these Baymardians were more disciplined made them feel like they were on some crucial mission to save humanity. More so, Vincent liked how they gave each other team names and carried out duties as if they could read each other's minds. He felt like he'd like to be in that kind of team. And coupled with what he saw today, he was more than happy to be selected as one of the trainees that would go to Baymart. Tonight, he swore to do his best. In no time, they were already around the perimeters for T2, which was the hideout for Winston's backup. Bam! The vehicle doors opened, and just like that, all units stealthily jumped off. Vincent quickly got down and followed the lead while remaining vigilant. Even though he didn't understand all the hand movements they did, he understood the basic ones taught countless times to him over the past few days. A palm means stop, creaking an O sign with his thumb and index finger means okay, or the coast was clear. He just understood a total of five signals only, which was enough for tonight's mission. And if he really wanted to convey more words, he would have to create the opportunity to do so without giving off his position. His team had a total of seven units, all working on this base. And he was in Unit 6, which was one of the rescue units. Lieutenant Ginny looked at them one more time. Everyone, you know what to do. We have just 45 minutes to get all hostages out undetected before the other units take action. Now, let's go. Vincent nodded and followed along until they were extremely close to the enemy's base. Vincent's eyes flickered with a strange light. It was time. Din. 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 Pew 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 pew. As Vincent's unit slowly advanced, another unit began snipping the event scouts on the trees, bushes, and so on. And after taking care of the scouts, another team swooped in, hid the bodies, wore their outfits over their uniforms, and pretended as if nothing happened. With this, Vincent's unit, which also disguised themselves, calmly passed through as if they belonged to the base. With thousands and thousands of enemies here, it was impossible for these people to know everyone. And the fact that Vincent and the rest can calmly walk in means that the enemy scouts and those on the lookout knew them, further proving that they belonged here. More importantly, almost everyone was fascinated by the strange glowy light phenomenon way up in the sky that distracted them the last few nights. So many theories had come up, estimating that he might be the sign of a birth of a new king or whatnot. At least that was the latest gossip that kept them filled the base. But while they were somewhat lax, Vincent and his unit steadily went in, with the excuse of being hungry and in dire need of food. They also joined those who talked about the phenomenon and even cracked a few jokes here and there. So far, so good. Ha ha ha. I knew it. The fact that these glowy stars are above us means that our leader, his Highness Winston will be the future king. Look, even the stars in the sky now down to His Highness. That's why they're here to watch over us. Wah. His Highness is amazing. If the heavens can recognize him, then that means that we followed the right person. Ha 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 ha. I'm sure those idiots who blindly followed the first prince will be very shocked and frightened when they realize that our master is a star chosen by the heavens. That's right. Our master is the greatest. Everyone gleefully bragged about their master while Vincent's unit scattered around his plant. Oh my god. He was actually in enemy territory. Vincent tried to calm his heart while following a few more men in his unit towards the kitchen. From the report from the nearby villages, as well as what they had observed these past few days, many women and children were taken by force to be cooks or bedmates while these people wanted for the battle to begin. 
They used their privileges and claimed that these women and children were just fulfilling their duty as Dia for women, which was to provide service and make the knights happy. After all, weren't women just meant to raise, take care of and birth strong Dia for warriors? Even the poetry, calligraphy, singing, dancing, and everything else that they learnt was to be used to entertain their husbands whenever asked. So these women should be happy that they were even given a chance to cook and warm the bed of the men who belonged to Deiferous future monarch. Vincent, who was now close to the kitchen, began walking tiredly. He walked as if he was about to drop dead any minute from now. Bam! He fell just beside the bonfire that had several others gathered around, either sleeping, eating, or gossiping. To blend in even more, he quickly seized a cup of rum from one of the already scared girls who were passing around distributing food. Give it to me. Sorry. The poor girl stammered and quickly handed it over. Ha ha ha. Brother, are you trying to get this one too? Pooey. I heard she was as stiff as a log and nothing to enjoy about. Really? Yeah. It's true. She's a dead one. But what are we going to do? We have to manage what we have. So I guess she can do. Ha 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 ha. Everyone laughed and joked about their experiences with the ladies. Vincent laughed and following the 14-year-old girl playfully. Looking at his demeanor, everyone knew that he wanted the little lassie tonight. Stop. The young girl turned around in fear. These past few days had been hell for her. Sometimes, she would satisfy five men at once, and other times, it would be two. She had been tossed, turned, slapped, beaten and badly bruised because these men found pleasure in it. She knew that it was a woman's duty to take care of the knights since the women officially belonged to the empire until they got married. Of course, no man would marry those that pleasure another knight, which left these victimized women in a pickle. Because once they got home, they would be driven to desperation. So much so that many chose to continue the lifestyle since Eve One already saw them as a vixen. Some committed suicide under pressure while others chose to leave their hymns and settle very far away where no one knew them. There, they would start a brand new life. Bottom line, the future for these women was typically very saddening. The poor girl shivered when she saw Vincent playfully approaching her. You, what do you want? I was told that I could have this night to rest since I'm on kitchen duty. Vincent just smiled, came close to her ears and whispered, Don't be afraid. Just play along. We are here to save you. The girl's eyes opened in shock. She didn't believe it at all. Was this some sort of new game that these people were coming up with so that they could raise her hopes, only to crush it in the end? Even at that, what could she do? Her faith was already sealed. Vincent looked at her and knew her thoughts. I know you do not believe me now, but it's true. His Highness Prince Henry and His Majesty, Landon Barn, sent us. Us? The girl followed this gaze and saw someone nodding slightly. Was it true? The moment she heard Landon's name, she felt hope swell within her. Who didn't know that his amnesty Landon Barn was the father of the helpless, needy, and oppressed? You. Are you serious? Yes. I know you have doubts. But right now, you have no choice but to trust me. Do you want to live and die here unwillingly? Or would you rather take this chance and see for yourself? As I said, I'm here to rescue every one of you. But for that, I need your help. Myla called her heart and decided to play along. Over 15 girls have already died due to being pleasured day in and day out with almost no rest. She was already in hell, so why not take a chance? She bit her lip firmly and nodded slightly in agreement. All right, all she had to do was play along. You, I already said that today's my free day. Vincent held her firmly, while she on the other hand, began struggling. Ha ha ha. Many saw this behavior as usual and began laughing while enjoying her struggling like a little rabbit caught by a big bad wolf. With that, the duo strategically left the scene. All right. How many of you were taken? 102, sir. But 15 are already dead. Hmm. Vincent held her hand and pulled her along vigilantly until they came close to five huge tents that were just like those massive canopies that could fit at least 20 people in each. Vincent stepped in playfully and came face to face with a bunch of men grinding and exhausting the women in the tent. Damn it. This was a problem. He casually went to the other tents and realized that the situation was more or less the same. The women had no lives while in the camp. Either they cooked, 
distributed food, cleaned themselves up or started in the canopies. They weren't allowed to do anything else or go anywhere else. Vincent looked at Myla and nodded before yawning exaggeratedly. And right on cue, someone called him while Myla went into one of the tents. Brat, where have you been? I, old Ganda, wants to tell his stupid jokes again. One of the men in his unit placed a hand over his shoulders and dragged him away. Seeing this, Myla knew what to do. She strategically discovered playfully to her fellow sisters, and just like that, the word passed on. When one woman or girl was informed of the plan, she would strategically leave the men and another who already knew the plan would take her place in keeping the enemy knights satisfied. And while the men were in ecstasy, some women already began collecting the men's clothes. Others tied their hair like a man's while riding on the man they were on. Not too long after everyone began preparing, Captain Jenny and three other women in the unit were dragged into the tents by the soldiers in the unit. Anyone who saw this would think that they were just one of the women within the camp. Jenny whispered playfully in one of the ladies' ears and carefully distributed some items around. As of now, some of the men in the unit had also strategically surrounded the place. Some acted tired and laid on the ground, while others just gossiped and praised Prince Winston instead. But no matter what they did, their eyes never left these tents for one second. One of the enemy knights currently being serviced by three women couldn't help but feel like a king. Oh, finally, these ladies had learned to be more submissive. These days, they had to slap them, pinch them, and do so much just to get them to give in. But now, it seems like these women finally know their place as servicers for knights. This was the service that they deserved. After all, when war comes, who else would be willing to fight for these women? It was a win-win situation for all. These three women massaged and kissed him all over, leaving him in bliss. Yes, yes, that's it. He closed his eyes to enjoy the feelings that overwhelmed him. But who could tell him why he felt pain instead? Sure. He opened his eyes in shock to realize that a dagger had been sent right through his throat by the woman on top of him. His eyes dilated as he struggled to move or tell for help. But the other two that also serviced him covered his mouth and held him down. He muffled loudly, but the women screamed in ecstasy to cover up his sounds. Even the manner in which the women surrounded him blocked anyone from seeing what was truly going on. The enemy knight felt his body growing weaker by the second, and his breathing was heavier as well. He tried taking in air through his mouth since his nostrils didn't seem to let in any. With his mouth covered, he felt like he was drowning in a deep sea. Nothing was going to his brain, and his body was failing. F asterisk CK. He was unwilling. How can a man die in the hands of a woman? Generally, he was always a vigilant person. And even though many empires had already been letting women join in battle, many Diaphronites belonging to the high-ranking nobles still believed that it was ridiculous. Women were there to breed strong warriors, continue the family lineage, and entertain their husbands. So how can a 14-year-old girl pit him? One, two, three, four. Five. In a span of five seconds, he was gone. But did these ladies dare to relax? Not a chance. Quickly, we only have three minutes to leave. The women in all tenets wore the male clothes of these men and tired stings distributed earlier around their waists and HIPS to make the clothes fit them more. Following that, they rubbed dirt all over their bodies because, unlike the men, ever since they got here, they had been required to take baths twice a day since they would be servicing people a lot. Additionally, they needed to remain pretty for maximum pleasure during intimacy. After all, no one wanted to sleep with something that smelt like an ogre or was dirty. So from far away, the men could always spot these women because they had long hair and were way cleaner than those in the cant, leaving their skins glowing. Now, the ladies had mellowed down that glow and tied their hair as men did. Jenny and a few others had previously passed along some fake mustaches made from sheep hair, dyed black, and trimmed. Some even had placed them on their chests to show that they had very thick chest hair, while others stuffed their chests, sides, and backs with fake pillows to make them look bigger. Time moved quickly and soon, three minutes was up. Vincent and five others entered one of the tents. Remember, walk like a man, act tough, and let your voice be rough. Only by blending in properly can we successfully escape without any delays. Is everyone ready? The women nodded thoughtfully. 
All right then, let's go. Now is time for the hard part. Vincent and five others had already divided all 19 women amongst themselves. So each person would look after three people, with one person looking after just four. The girls had said that their tent usually had 23 girls sleeping inside. And from the gist, the rest were on kitchen duty. But Vincent wasn't worried because he knew that some of the people in his unit would handle it. For now, his priority was to get them out. When they came in with the excuse of going for a night meal, Vincent had purposely shown his face to the guards there. So now, with him exiting the camp, they would just assume that he was going back to his duty post, along with some of the scouts. But all that was later on. Now, they had to worry about leaving the tents and making it to the exit safely. And they had to do so swiftly because it wouldn't be long before someone comes over to get some fun from these girls. By then, the entire base would go crazy. Everyone strategically stepped out of the tents with a space of one full minute between each. Of course, to make it even more believable, some of the soldiers and Henry's men, who were secretly guarding the place, also went in and out of the tent too. Why? It would look too suspicious if no one were going in after this long. Everyone prepared themselves to leave anxiously. Vincent seemed calm, but in reality, he was very much afraid as this was his first time doing such a job. His fingers started trembling, and he quickly pinched his thighs to dismiss his fear with pain. What if he fails? Ha 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 ha. Bro, today I've taken my fill again. Vincent patted Myla as if she was a man while talking to all three ladies and walking out of the tent. Even though the women were very much afraid, seeing his behavior and knowing that they were soon out, they dared not miss this opportunity for freedom. So Myla and the other two ladies joined in while making their voices as deep as possible. They just repeated the words they've heard these men say after getting intimate with them. Bro, you're not the only one who has taken my fill. But, ah, uh, that girl is really something else. What do you mean? I mean, she's a dead fish. But after showing her who's boss, she dare not deny me again. Heh, <laughs> what choice did she have? All she can do is kneel and beg for my holy liquid. Ha 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 ha. The women spoke and felt even more energetic when they remembered their previous experiences. It was enough to make anyone burn in rage. Their self-worth had been crushed severely that some of them had once thought of suicide. Wasn't it better to die by their own hands rather than these men? Just yesterday, a ten-year-old girl had died after they tossed her over for five hours straight with people going in and out of the tents as they wished. Believe it or not, the daytime was their busiest time because at night, yelling and making too much noise might alert any enemy of the night's whereabouts. During the day, the noise echoed way less than during the quiet nights. And even now, all this time, those who had been talking within the camp at night weren't yelling. They just spoke at a controllably low tune or at times whispered. So if these women started screaming in ecstasy, they'll take many people up or even invite enemies over. Of course, these women still have to please others at night. But the traffic was limited to a certain degree, so that the women would control their voices and themselves. No extreme fetishes or behaviors could occur now. Anyway, the poor ten-year-old girl was held down, whipped fiercely for pleasure, and forced to please people for five long hours without eating or drinking anything. She was very beautiful and was always one of the most desired. So the people that wanted to spend time with her were a lot. Unforbaturally, during the play, someone accidentally bashed her head roughly onto the ground after she kept begging for a rest. And that's how she died. Thinking of all they had been through, Myla and the rest really liked that His Majesty Landon Barn would get justice for them. Vincent tried to say more in the conversation. But listening to these women, he felt them genuinely pitiful. Sigh. He quickly kept his emotions in check and rejoined them while talking about other things that might keep these women from crying now. Doing so would only blow their cover. The gang took big steps and walked along the busy base that seemed to have many people in CLU. Turs. And just when Vincent and the girls were about to reach the exit point, some walked past them and stopped. You there. Halt. Bu boom bu boom bu boom. Everyone's heart was beating like crazy. Did someone discover them? Were they going to be caught? What's going to happen now? Vincent immediately snapped out of his thoughts and whispered to the ladies as well. And like that, they acted as if they were dead tired while tilting their heads and squinting their eyes rather than opening them fully. 
Ginny told them that squinting one's eyes was one of the best ways to cover up surprise expressions. Plus, it would subconsciously remind them to stay in character. With that, they continued squinting while pinching themselves hard. What exactly did these people want? Vincent stepped ahead and waited for the leader of the clique to approach him. The man's face was stern and unreadable. Nonetheless, he looked like someone with high authority. Why are you going out only now? Erm, we took permission from Pigoro at the gate to eat. We were very hungry. The man looked at them and sneered. Heh, do you think that I'll let you go if you took permission? All of you will still get punished. So after your duties tonight, I expect to see all of you kneeling before my tent. And don't even think of escaping because I'll just get your names from the guards at the exit. We wouldn't dare. We wouldn't dare. Good. Now, get out of my sight. Hearing his command, Vincent and the others felt like they had just escaped some terrible fate. They quickly ran away, and before they knew, they were out. The ladies almost cried with joy. They did it. They escaped. Vincent had never felt so many emotions in his life before. One could say that everything went very smoothly, but that was a lie. He had over 15 stumbling blocks that he bypassed without anyone's help throughout the rescue. There were times that his cover was almost blown, and there were times that he did exceptionally well. This mission alone quickly made him realize some of his strengths and weaknesses, and he realized that he didn't know very much about tactics and blending in. If not for the Baymardians that briefed him earlier on, he would never have known such advanced skills. Of course, while trying them out, he made many mistakes which he quickly corrected or get away with. And many a times, the soldiers would step in to save him from his mistakes. Everything was just so new and thrilling to him. With Henry, all he ever did was run away and hide while praying not to get discovered. But now, this was his first mission stepping out. He was very delighted that His Highness had decided to stop running and take a stand. After all, how long could one keep running? Din din din. Vincent and the girls were out. And shortly after that, several others came out strategically too. With all mistakes out, they could finally blow the place up. The moment all rescue units confirmed their mission status as successful, now it was time for phase two of tonight's operation. Instantly, several reports and commands were issued via their walkie-talkies. Team Beta to Control Tower. The puppies are free. Preparing to move in now. Roger that Team Beta. Over. This is ground beta to all beta air forces. The puppies are free. Beginning phase two now. Roger that ground beta. We'll disperse and keep a lookout for any escapees. Over. All right, men. Let's move out. In a flash, the war table and vehicles with heavy machine guns advanced, while a certain group stayed behind in formation at a certain distance all around the camp. This way, those that did manage to flee would still get caught by the soldiers. Now, everyone was prepared for the grand finale. The noise from the moving vehicles disrupted the ever-silent night within the camp. Eh, what the devil was going on? Was there some sort of animal outside causing such a loud ruckus? Many within the camp were very confused by these strange noises. They began wondering if whatever it was threatening or not. Because if it was, then how come not a single person out of the 600 watchmen or scouts had run back to report the matter? And if it were really dangerous, those at the gates would have at least heard the screams or shouts echoing through the night if any of their men were in battle. This was just too bizarre. Or was this phenomenon just like the glowy stars above? The sound seemed to come from all directions around the camp. So was this some sort of sign? The enemy was utterly confused. Enemy Commander Holt jumped out of bed and hurriedly wore his shoes while hopping, and as he hastily dressed up, he attentively listened to his most trusted subordinates before him. Speak. Commander, the sounds are getting louder, and we don't know what to do. Nonetheless, whether this sound is a blessing or not, we have to confirm where it's coming from. Yes, Commander. I personally think that if the sounds are getting louder, that means that something or some creatures are approaching our camp. Maybe they're hungry and are in a very large pack. But, I doubt that they would be able to climb through the towering walls of this abandoned merchant post. Holt wore his gloves and nodded in agreement. Right now, they were in an abandoned merchant point. What exactly was a merchant point? It was typically a place where merchants could trade things amongst themselves or with nobles in secret. Sometimes, 
What they traded was too valuable to be known to the public, and they had too many in quantity. So the client would meet them in a chosen merchant point to take them. Merchant points were usually located in very isolated areas, and most people chose to do it in the woods. Why? Because they could bring as many guards as they liked compared to cities or other places, which might make them stand out even more, calling unwanted attention instead. For them, after leaving the merchant point, they could now disguise themselves as farmers and also create wagons with false bottoms to hide the products and take them into their estates. This way, they wouldn't make heads turn in their various resident areas. After all, their enemies were always watching their estates. So it wasn't wise to have a merchant specifically deliver these goods in the open. And that's where the merchant point comes into play. The merchant point typically had a circular stone wall with just one gate to go in and out. And within it, there were no used buildings. Yup, the buildings were just pillars with a roof. Simple, yet very time efficient to complete. These merchant points commonly have just one or two of these pillar buildings in the whole place. That's why if someone planned to sleep in here, they still needed tents. As fate would have it, the enemy knights were currently in a merchant point that had been abandoned for 300 years now. It used to be the go-to place for those close to the capital, but now, there are several other places instead. Moreover, this place was taken over by Winston's maternal great-grandfather, who passed it on to his grandfather, who then passed it on to him since he was his mother's child and the most achieved grandson. This has been the campsite for some of their operations, but they never turned it into a base because it was too risky. Why? That was because its position in nature would give it off. So it was a waste to build a base here. Be it beast or even ghosts, we have to take action now. So are the men prepared? Yes, Commander. Everyone is currently making their way towards the gate. Good. What about the gate itself? Has it been closed yet? This, Commander, that's one of the reasons why I'm here. From the report I just received from the guards, none of the watches have returned. So do we still love them out? Yes. If there is any danger out there, they, as Deifer warriors, should be able to take it. If they do die, then they would have died honorably. I know that you're worried about our lack of watchmen after this, but at this point, that's the best plan of action now. But Commander, those watchmen were specifically trained for their duties. So if we lose all 600, then won't we lose 8 to 10 to each of our scouts and watchmen? How are we going to continue coping until we are requested for battle? You see, my problem with you is that you only keep thinking about the future and forgetting about the present. For all we know, we could be facing something severe. So what's losing a few watchmen if it would let us see another day? Don't forget, we have over 17,000 people here. So what's losing a measly 600 if it would keep the rest alive? We are here, in wait for King Julius's death and assist our master in ascending the throne. So if we all fall now, then wouldn't we have failed our mission? In times like this, sacrifices must be made. Do you understand what to do now? Yes, Commander. With that, they ran out to find the source of these strange noises. What could it be? Meanwhile, as Holt and his gang were making their way towards the gate, the armed vehicles were already closing in on the place. The good thing was that the entire camp was fenced, so they wouldn't have to worry about a fire spreading and burning the entire forest. That would be disastrous. It's because of this that they couldn't begin firing until they were directly before the walls. This is BEF-12, Beta Air Force, to ground team. The geese are concentrating around the gate. I repeat, the geese are concentrating around the gate. Copy that. Over. Lieutenant Jenkins within the leading tank smiled when he saw the barred gate that was hastily being lowered. Heh. They want to stop them from going in? Not a chance. Boom. A terrible blinding light tore the enemy's eyes, followed by an ear-splitting sound that completely shook their core. The sound of the explosion echoed painfully, as if it were the anguished cry of the gods. Hot, hot, hot. The air was as hot, making the enemies within the gate tunnel struggle to breathe. They were completely engulfed by orange-blackish flames that seemed to devour their very being. WWW, what was going on? Slish. Ah. Pieces of the barred metal gate flew right into their bodies at an incredible speed that slashed several body parts off. The explosion created a mysterious force that yanked and threw them far away uncontrollably. 
Their bodies trembled as blood continuously forced its way out of their mouths. Plu. In not more than ten seconds, those within lethal range of the attack were dead, while those at mid-range came out with a few internal and external injuries here and there. Holt, who had just arrived at a safe distance, stared at the risking smoke from the gate tunnel in a daze. He had never heard that kind of thunderous sound before unless lightning struck, and the destruction level, coupled with the spine-chilling sounds, made him inward grow pale. But the night sky was so clear and bright, so he had to rule out the possibility that this was caused by lightning. But if not, then was it possible that it was an enemy? Damn it. No matter who they were or what ghosts had come to terrorize him, he was ready to fight them till the very end. Quickly, get to the wagons at the end of the camp and bring overall barrels of black powder. But commander, we were planning to use that when we evade the capital city. Shut up. Are you the commander or am I the commander? Do what I say now. Holt was spitting fire at the men as he yelled and rained several commands at them. Archers, take position here and fire at anything that dares to set in. Another set should station themselves over there. You morons, what the hell are you still standing here for? If you've already been told what to do, then hop to it. Yes, commander. Warriors, ready your swords and stay in formation. Everyone, the enemy might burst through the tunnel any moment from now. So be on guard. And right on cue, the war tanks appeared. The moment they saw the tank's long nose, they instantly took action. They didn't know what it was since its body was still within the thick smoke from the previous explosion. But seeing the long nose suspending in the air gave them chills. Shoot. Short. Shoot that thing now. Thup thup. Arrows upon arrows flew towards the table like crazy. The air was tense and the enemy was anxious. Fear crawled like a spider, threading its web of terror in their hearts. They shot and shot with everything that they had, hiking that whatever was shredded by the thick fog would die already. But how could things be that simple? Boom boom. Lieutenant Jenkins in the leading tank threw several ground-shattering shots at them in all directions. And after that, he quickly stepped to the side, giving room for the other tanks to make their way towards their destinations as planned. Boom. The first line of archers were sent flying into the air like ants, and their so-called formation was broken in a matter of seconds. Amidst their destruction, the thing that made them anxious was because till now, they hadn't seen the cause of their suffering yet. Can you stop attacking us, and at least let us see you? Those that were on the verge of death felt very hurt by this fact. Who would like dying without knowing the culprit that led to their demise? These proud Deifer men were very much unwilling. But what did that have to do with the soldiers? Jenkins went straight ahead, alongside four other tanks in formation. He cleared the land, raised the ground and shattered everything within his path. The enemy had roughly 15,000 if not 17,000 men, while they were not even up to a thousand, but had heavy artillery with them. Now, it was time to go crazy within these walls. Boom, 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 boom. Anguish screams came from within the mist. Ah. Eh? Those within only yelled out in pain and never dared to voice out their injuries. If it were another empire, the people might scream, my leg, or something like that. But these Deifer men believed that doing so would make them weak. Their ego wouldn't let them. So all they could do was scream in the manliest way ever before dying. Holt was in despair when he saw the results after the smoke had cleared up in some places. What made him even more alarmed was that, just now, he had been smacked on the face with a finger. Pa. The scene he saw was one that he would never forget in his entire life. The battlefield had become a graveyard of the unburied and the injured. The sight before him really took his breath away. The ground had been uprooted, forming several deep holes. One could also see a lot of severed body parts, too. The men were the most pitiful. The ground was dyed red as the foul stench of blood filled the place. How is this possible? Holt trembled and slowly took several steps back before filling making a run for it. No matter what, he had to escape. His Highness Winston must be informed. And where were the bastards that he sent to get the barrels of black powder? Boom 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 boom. Everyone was in hell. The people were flying left, right and center, in all directions. And those who went to retrieve the barrels weren't in a better position as well. From the place where they left, it would take 10 minutes on horseback to get to where the black powder was located. 
and another 15-20 minutes back since the horses would be pulling the wagons of black powder. But the thing was that the second they left, the tanks came in. So as they advanced, they were still in danger of getting shot by the tanks. Boom. As they advanced, just behind them, countless explosions occurred, which drained the life off their faces. Just who had they offended? Under the reign of terror, Hybin gritted his teeth and led his horse forward in a zigzag pattern. Hurry up. Follow my lead. We have to get those barrels fast before it's too late. This is our only chance of beating whatever is attacking us. Everyone nodded and quickly chased Hybin while moving haphazardly. They galloped towards the tents that stored the barrels as fast as they could. Soon, everyone's eyes lit up the moment the tent's figure could be seen. Their eyes glowed as if they had just seen their salvation. Maybe they could turn the tides? They hastened up towards the tent. But suddenly, just when they were in very close proximity to it, the enemy fiercely made its move. Boom. Watch out. A more thunderous sound broke their ears, and everyone, including their horses, were sent flying. Of course, the soldiers dared not blow up the tent because from the words of those who came in earlier, there were over 60 barrels of black powder there. If they should accidentally block it up, the results would be astronomical. One could imagine how deadly such a thing would be. Bam! The heat, combined with the deadly waves from the attack, made Hybin and his men feel like crying. Some people fell on the horses, softening their impact. But at the same time, they became shields for these creatures. And in other cases, some of the heavy horses fell on the men instead, blocking some of the injuries that they could have had. Of course, some were fully separated Madeir from their horses and landed further away. The horses that survived quickly got up, and stamped over the men without a care in the world. What a joke. At this point, it was every man for himself, and every horse for itself. He, the slightly injured horses got up and dashed away from the scene in hopes of finally an exit out of this death hole. And the men who saw this felt even weaker. How far could they run on foot when they were already in this condition? Boom. The entire camp screamed in agony as they felt the terror of the gods touch their very cores. Why? Why didn't they see that the CL youths to glowy stars from before were an ominous sign? The heavens had already warmed them, and yet, they didn't think it through. Why them? Why? Everyone was going crazy with their current predicaments. Wasn't the sign of those glowy stars a good thing? Why them? What do they do now? At this point in the battle, many managed to see their enemy properly. The results gave them great shock and resentment. Only one place can create metal carriages. So how could they not know their enemy now? They felt like these bastards were very sneaky. The entire continent thinks that they rely on Corona. But who would have known that they had this kind of power up their sleeves? Wasn't this akin to bullying? More importantly, what did they ever do to them that made these Baymardians leave their empire? Sail all the way here and hunt them down? What deep hatred did they have with them? The whole thing left a bitter taste in everyone's mouth. They were very resentful. Enemy Commander Holt was going crazy from the scene before him. He gripped his hair anxiously before angrily dropping one of his aides. Nicodemus, where the hell are they? Why aren't they here yet with the black powder? Just look at it. I thought you said that those men that you trained were outstanding. So why haven't they returned? Aw, oh, all of you are useless. Pa, a solid slap brushed against Holt's face leaving him in disbelief. You dare slap your superior? Commander, with all due respect, you seem to have forgotten that I used to be your superior. So don't you think that I deserve respect too? We are in the midst of war, and here you are, screaming like a shrew? Don't you know that as dia for men, we must always keep calm? Has the pressure really gotten to you? Look at yourself. The men below you aren't even screaming or complaining. But here you are talking like an idiot. I've said once, and I'll say it again. You should have never been commander. You don't know how to lead, and you're incompetent. Holt glared at the person before him and raised his hand to strike him down. But Nicodemus blocked it and tripped him instead. You, when we get out of here, I'll make sure that His Highness punishes you for disrespecting your superior. Heh, the premise is that we get out of here. But looking around, do you think that it's possible? Holy got up from the ground, stared at Nicodemus coldly and sneered. Just because you can't doesn't mean I can't. 
This is the difference between you and I. This is why I was able to make you step down and take your position as commander, Holt arrogantly said, before turning his attention to the few men beside him. Everyone, follow me. I'll lead us out. Soon, we will see His Highness Winston. With that, Holt took the rest and left. Nicodemus shook his head in disappointment while looking at the stubborn Holt. What a fool. Nicodemus just shook his head wryly and knelt silently. Had he given up? No. But, his approach on the matter was different. At times, they, dayfers, would infiltrate a place by allowing themselves to get taken as prisoners. And on the way to the dungeon, they would find a way to escape. For Nicodemus, this was the best option at the moment. Why? Because if the enemy could come in like this, that meant that they had already surrounded the entire outside territory to a certain extent. Additionally, they didn't know how many the enemy had brought in, so the odds were against them. That's why Nicodemus preferred to play along and find a way to escape and report his findings to His Highness Winston before it was too late. He didn't care about his life and death, but only wanted to ensure that the message went access. As for Holt reporting him to Winston, he didn't bother about his threats too. Firstly, he was almost certain that Holt's approach wouldn't yield any fruits. Holt liked force and took everything head on. The guy's ego was so big that it could probably cover the entire Pino continent. One should know that even though there were strict rules for them to follow, everyone had different personalities. Of course, the leaders tried to pit them against one another to toughen them up. But deep down, many still had their original personalities. Some were scheming, while others were easygoing, too arrogant and selfish. And Holt, who felt like he was heaven's son, couldn't stand being under him. So he devised a scheme that left him injured for three years. And by the time he came back, Holt had been promoted, and his entire team was now under him. Ever since then, Holt had always made things hard for him. That in a nutshell, was how their relationship was. As for Holt and few others, they were currently running over numerous dead bodies, lifeless horses, large pits and so on. So far, they have been doing good. Ha 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 ha. I knew that following the commander was right. After all, he has led us through countless battles. That's right. This is nothing for our commander. Just look at how easy it is for him to lead us out. The commander is mighty. Our commander? Boom. What? Before they could even finish their reign of praises, they were directly hit by one of the attacks. Ah! Holt flew in the air, somersaulted, and landed horribly on his back. Pain, pain, pain. His body was in pain. Blood trickled down his ear, and a sword directly stabbed his thigh. But most importantly, he felt like he had a lot of internal injuries. He had been running away when he found himself suddenly carried into the air by a mysterious force. Everything happened to him in slow motion as time seemed to move twenty times slower. The raging flames engulfed him, and his body seemed to be breaking apart into tiny bits. What's happening? The moment he landed on the ground, he realized that his left hand and a chunk of his belly were no more. Plu. He spat out blood and felt his body slowly giving up. Why did it end like this? Shrouded within the thick fog, he had so many unanswered questions. Why? Why did the Baymardians attack them? He was very much unwilling to go down without at least dragging one of them with him. But no matter how reluctant he was, the Grim Reaper was already at his doorstep. He felt his body's vitality drain more and more as he struggled to take in a whiff of air. His body trembled in an attempt to push through his predicament. Sadly, its efforts were all in vain because a few seconds later, he was gone. Enemy Commander Holt was dead. Henry, who was watching alongside Landon within one of the air balloons above, had cold sweat on his forehead. The loud booming sounds, coupled with the dreadful screams, made one think the place was hunted. If he hadn't seen it for himself, he would have never believed that such a thing would be possible. The amount of damage those vehicles brought was awfully terrifying. He felt like no one in the entire Pino continent would be able to stand against Landon. As for the other continues, he couldn't speak out yet because he didn't know if Baymard was more powerful than any of the empires in Morgany and vice versa. Phew. Luckily, he was on Landon's side. Or else wouldn't his fate be the same as those below? Rather than a battle, it looked like a one-side slaughter instead. 
None of the soldiers had even shown their faces in the battleground, and the enemy people had already fallen to this state. Henry looked at Landon pleadingly. Brother, can you please not use these weapons within the palace? Henry could already see how the entire place would be left to ruins at the end of it all. By then, wouldn't the whole place have to be rebuilt? Landon smiled wryly because this was the same thing Michael requested when attacking Nopline in the palace. He was so scared that he almost knelt with tears in his eyes and begged. Sure, they wanted his help, but not to the extent where everything would become ruins. People say beggars can't be choosy, but they beg to differ. What a joke. If they left Landon to go haywire, then they won't even have a home at the end of it all. The slaughter went on for a while until the enemy's group of thousands had reduced to about 103, with most just injured. Of course, among the prisoners was Nicodemus, who managed to survive till now. He willingly allowed himself to get caught in his of finding a way to escape later. Again some had managed to go around the tanks and escape through the gate, but were instantly taken down by those outside the walls. At 3 a.m., the battle had officially come to an end, with all units and teams successfully returning to the base. With that, Operation Midnight was finally done and over with. With the battle over, all 103 prisoners were taken away, and the tents were also searched too. The black powder was hauled away and given to Henry. As for the dead bodies, they were gathered, searched, and burnt. Again, the women were given money found within the tents and enemy knights. These women were asked to come to the capital five days from now to get sorted out. Yes, they would give them jobs that might take them out of their depression and provide them with self-worth. What happened was not their fault, and quite frankly, they could start anew and become one of the pillars in Deiferous New Age. With that, they sent another team to take these ladies to the nearest municipality other than the capital, which was a village. The soldiers met the village chief late at night and had paid him to let them stay in the village for the time being until they left for the capital. Everything was adequately settled, and everyone went back to the base. The enemies within the city have no idea that a majority of their forces had been destroyed. Soon, it'll be 6 a.m., and the capital city's gates will open. Today's mission was the most important one of all. Future King Henry most ascend the throne. 4 a.m. Those coming back for their missions quickly reported all that went down, while those who had to head towards the city's gates got up from their map, took cold showers to fully wake up, ate and began lining up for a brief meeting. Landon and Henry chose to take quick naps and get up at 7 p.m. instead. Henry, being the man of the hour, had to be present and refreshed when Julius Tudor dies at 10 a.m. The people who were going in now were only going in to position themselves around the city and prepare for their arrival. Henry yawned and quickly fell asleep. Today was his big day. Landon closed his room and warped straight into his space and slept for hours and hours. He too was exhausted. Of course, he also gave Henry a pill that would make him feel very energized when he woke up later on. This time he didn't buy it because he had leftovers from the last time he bought them two years back. He bought a pill bottle from the system that had a total of 30 pills. He gave one to Henry and told him that it would relieve his tiredness. Henry just thought that it was one of those famous godly Baymardian pills that he heard about. Other places use potions for treatment, but Baymard created something called a pill that he heard was very miraculous. There were also things like cough syrups and whatnot. He even heard that some pills dissolve in one's mouth like magic. With that, the moment he took the pill, his eyes felt heavy, and all he wanted to do was sleep. Right now, he was having the best sleep of his life. Just what did they put in these pills? Time flew by before they knew it. Soon, it was 9 a.m. Within the palace walls, many had already gotten up and were once again listening to the reports of their shadow guards, who were asked to snoop around the palace vigilantly. Eldora, who stayed in her former courtyard within the palace, was very much displeased with her mother, who seemed to want her to support her brother. Mother, have you been listening to anything that I've said so far? Just like Queen Penelope, I will rule Deiferous and not Ulrich. Queen Lillian was growing crazy with rage at this unfilial daughter of hers. Other blood siblings support themselves, but she wanted to go against her brother, who was the crown prince. She had dreamt of the glory of having her son ascend the throne for decades now, and in truth, she can't picture her daughter taking over this empire. 
She angrily pointed at her stubborn daughter with trembling fingers. You, you, you. Are you insane? What do you know about ruling an empire? You don't know anything about war. Escape growing crazy and killing people here and there in the capital. Do you think that killing an enemy in battle is the same as killing the ordinary folks here in the city? What do you know about war strategy? Can you wield a sword? Can you be better than your brother? Women were made to birth strong warriors and nothing more. You keep mentioning Queen Penelope, but I assure you, she's the only exception. Why? Because she was raised like a man. So what are you comparing yourself with her? Are you a fool? Mother, I don't need to know all these things now. I can learn them after I take the throne. I'm not here to seek your permission, but to tell you that I'll be ascending the throne and not my brother. Clap, clap. The loud of palms hitting one another echoed throughout the room. Oh, my dear sister, I didn't know that you have such aspirations. Everyone turned to look at the dashing figure coming in. It was Ulrich Tudor. Ulrich smiled at his sister calmly. Of course, he knew what she had been up to over the past few weeks since he got here. From the reports, she also kept trying to make father write a verdict choosing her as the heir to the throne. But so far, she kept failing and failing to do so. Heh. Like brother. Like sister. Both of them had the same aspirations. Too bad. The throne can only be taken by one. And that was himself. Sister. Don't you think that you're a little too delusional? Delusional? Eldora looked at her elder brother and smiled coldly. With the forces she had outside, coupled with those in her estate within the capital, she couldn't wait to crush this brother of hers who kept looking down on her. Brother, whether I'm delusional or not, only time will tell. Oh, it looks like my little sister has something up her sleeves. Call it whatever you like. Only I will rule this empire. So I advise you to back off peacefully. Mother Lillian couldn't take it anymore and looked at her daughter in disappointment. Eldora, stop it. That's your brother. Stop these delusional fantasies of yours. Your brother will be king, and that's that. Lillian was about to educate her daughter more when suddenly, someone hurriedly entered the room without announcing themselves. Instantly, she channeled all her rage to him. You there. How dare you barge on like that? Whatever you say better be good, or I'll have your head. Well, what is it? Spit it out. QQQ Queen, Prince, Princess. The king has requested the presence of all royals within the palace. It appears that he would soon take his last breath. Silence. The king has requested the presence of all royals within the palace. Silence. Has the time finally come? Ulrich quickly passed a message to his guard to rally his men within the city. Of course, someone else will also send word to those outside. If the messenger left, then it would take about seven more hours on horseback before his men outside arrived in the city. But was he worried? Nope. Why? Because he had three to ten to each of his men inside the city already. So they can hold back any troublemakers until the rest arrive. All this time, he knew that Winston had men outside as well. But if both sides engaged earlier, then they might just end up losing way more men, allowing people like his uncles, other brothers, and sister to take advantage of the situation. Nonetheless, he ensured that he double the number of men Winston had. He had 33,000 men hidden outside, while an additional 11,000 were here. He also knew how many men his sister had, as well as his uncles, third brother Bonnevere, and the rest who wanted to take his crown. But since he got here, no news of Henry entering into the capital had been reported to him. Could it be that the worthless fool had decided to give up? He felt that this should be the case but his heart was growing uneasy instead. He was scared of people who were called trash because they were the most sneaky of them all. Landon of Baymard, Sirius of Yodin, and many more had popped out of their shells and reigned supreme, showing that they were just pretending to be pigs when they were wolves. He felt like if he didn't have Henry's head on a plate, he would never be able to rest his mind on this matter. Just look at how that brother of his managed to escape his clutches last time and loot him of all his hold in that fortress? He even gave the people illuminating powder, and now they think that one person took the entire team down back then. That brother of his was the most dangerous of all. In no more than four minutes, Mother Lillian's maids became secret beauty agents. They tied her hair, changed her outfit, gave her a large black royal clock, allowed several tiny bees in a tube to sting her lips, plumping it up, 
before grazing it with a clear Baymardian lip balm. Nothing she wore was bright because she had to show that she was in depression since her husband was critically ill. She quickly pinched her thighs and began crying, making the area around her eyes sore, red and swollen. Looking at her, one would never have thought that she was the same person from earlier on. Now, her voice was soft as a dormouse, and her face pale due to the power added. She looked depressed as if she hadn't eaten for days. Hey! Anything to ensure that her son continues to be the crown prince. She just hoped that there weren't any surprises when the verdict got read. Ulrich looked at his mother and smiled. He knew her true face. But so what? She was his mother, and he loved her dearly. As for his sister, he couldn't be bothered whether she lived or died. The only reason she was still alive was that he knew his mother would be depressed. However, if she crossed the line this time, then he would have no choice but to eradicate her. The trio left the courtyard, entered Mother Lillian's carriage, and drove towards the largest and tallest building within the palace. This was Julius' place. Of course, as they advanced, their guards also followed them too. And along the way, they spotted third Prince Bonavir and his mother's carriage, fourth Prince Joffrey alongside other royals like his uncles, Duke Bulkington and Duke Osseus, who have been staying in the palace ever since refusing to go. Today, they would all be gathered as a family for the first time in over 13 years. Instantly, the air was tense. Everyone looked at each other dangerously while secretly plotting as well. They rode straight for the building and came out one by one. All queens wore either black or darkish gray to show their sadness. They climbed the numerous steps and finally passed through the gigantic pillars before entering the building. There, they entered a very grand hall. And because they were coming, the servants had placed several couches for them to sit. Each family had their own couch. With that, Lillian hurriedly sat by the one closest to the empty throne chair brought in. Ulrich smiled and sat beside her on the couch. Ho's sister Eldora did the same, and their youngest sibling, 15-year-old ninth princess Tatiana, also sat with them. On the other couches, like in the case with fourth prince Joffrey, the couch could only take three people comfortably and they were six in number. Himself, his mother, and his four sisters, which were sets of twins. So unless they squished in, they couldn't all fit. So the sisters stood behind the chairs while he sat. Soon, the doors above opened and several guards hurriedly rushed down. Din din din. They instantly filled the room, taking positions at all angles. And following that, several men came down the stairs lifting a chair that had Julius on it. Husband. Father. Everyone went down on bended knees before the thin, frail figure that appeared. Julius was so pale that he looked like a skeleton. Those who knew that Winston poisoned him couldn't help but feel amazed by the results. He looked like the dead already. Almost all his hair had fallen out. And coupled with his thin, pale head, the crown looked exaggerated big on his head. His garments that once fitted his body, giving him a majestic vibe, now looked oversized for him. The man looked like he was in a lot of pain, and all this was caused by his son. But even to this day, he still didn't know who poisoned him. Of course, he greatly suspected his brothers instead since his sons were always far away in their own territories. And his brothers always made suspicious moves. Many a times, he had caught assassins who were paid by his brothers. So all fingers always pointed to them. It's just that this time, unbeknownst to him, it was Ho's son that poisoned him. You may sit, Julius said in a frail voice. With that, everyone did as they were told and looked at him sadly. But hidden within their gaze were happiness and anxiousness. It was time for the empire to have a new monarch. 9.40 a.m. Within the room, all the women were crying, while the men looked heartbroken. My wives, my children, brothers, please, don't weep for me. It pains my heart to see you all so sad. But you must be brave and strong because I know that my time is up. Julius said lovingly while cooling at his children warmly. All his children were here except for one, Henry. Thinking about this son of his, he couldn't help but feel disappointed even till now. Back then, he intentionally added to the boy's problems by making him a punching bag for Ulrich. He wanted to lower Henry's confidence so that he would end up working alongside Ulrich as his lackey in future. Ulrich has always been his most beloved son. 
so he wanted a very obedient person by his beloved son's side. The problem was that when Henry was 15, he gave him advice to go work for Ulrich. But the fool chose the second option, and that was to have his territory. That day, Julius was so mad that he slapped Henry hard and sent him off without any formal coming-of-age party. All his hard work with the boy had gone down the drain. Thinking about it now, he was glad that the fool didn't come to see him because it would only make him die faster. How could someone be so hateful? There was a time that Julius felt like Henry wasn't his because out of all his sons, Henry was the weirdest and weakest. Even the sons behind him could do better. He seriously suspected that the boy's dead mother cheated on him with another. In fact, the boy's entire maternal family pissed him off since they weren't easy to control. And the moment his grandfather, the war legend, was accused of sending assassins to kill his wife, heh, he wasted no time and killed the fool without a fair trial. Everything about Henry made his blood boil. Julius felt delighted that he didn't show up today. All right, some things have changed. So before I pass, I'll read my verdict for the Empire's future. Guards, allow some of the nobles and court officials to come in now. Yes, your majesty. The guards quickly did as they were told, and those outside were rushed in speedily. And while that was going on, the royals were silently in turmoil. Did father just say that there were changes? Did this mean that Ulrich wouldn't be the heir? They now felt like they had a chance, while Ulrich's face was dark. What does father mean by this? Hopefully, it wasn't what he was thinking. Mother Lillian gripped her dress tightly while trying to hold her rage. She too, hoped that it wasn't the case. Or had any of the other queens said something ill about her son to make Julius change his mind? Eldora just leaned towards Mother Lillian with a calm smile. Mother, I told you. I will be ruler and not Ulrich. What do you think I've been doing every time I visited father? Lillian looked up to the sky and really felt like beating this shameless daughter of hers. Ulrich looked at her for a bit before silently turning his attention back to Julius. The court officials and high-ranked nobles who were here since 8 a.m. greeted Julius and stood in the hall patiently. Everyone stared at him intensely, not daring to make any sounds. 9.55 a.m. Everyone, I've gathered you all here to read my verdict before I pass on personally. I, Julius Tudor, the current monarch of the glorious empire of Deiphorus, choose my son, Prince Joffrey. Eh, Ulrich's face turned cold. Yes, Geoffrey almost jumped in the air with joy. His heart felt as light as a butterfly. Ha ha ha, in your face. He was the heir. Ha 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 ha, he always knew father had a soft spot for him. He always. Eh. I, Julius Tudor, choose my son, Joffrey Tudor, to aid my son Winston Tudor in managing the empire. Silence. Crack. Something broke within Joffrey and his mother. Joffrey in particular, felt like someone had poured cold water on him. Aid Winston in managing the empire? Didn't this mean that Winston was now king? His eyes burned with rage while Winston tried his best to hide his smile while stroking his chin. But unbeknownst to him, he too would have his heart chattered by his father. Prince Joffrey will be assigned the chief constable in charge of criminal law in the empire and will directly report to Prince Winston, who will be the chancellor of the law. As for my third son, Prince Bonavir, he will be the official dapifer, who will represent the future king outside the moir when needed. My daughters, of course, should be married decently with all their dowries intact. They are to receive monthly allowances until they are married off. And for the rest of my sons that I haven't mentioned, all of you are already of age. So you can continue overlooking your territories or come back and work for the future king. My wives should also move out and live in their estates. All except one. Everyone, I hereby announce that I, Julius Tudor, have appointed Crown Prince Ulrich as the heir of the throne upon my death. And his mother, Queen Lillian, is to stay back and become the Queen Mother of the Empire. This is my verdict. Ulrich and Lillian secretly smiled triumphantly. For a moment, they thought their positions had changed. But fortunately, the old geezer maintained his words back then when he made Ulrich crown prince. Everyone else felt their blood boiling in rage. Why raise their hopes only to crush it? Joffrey, Bonavir, Winston, Eldora, Duke Bulkington, and Duke Osseus secretly looked at the duo viciously. Who wanted to help Ulrich run the empire? Nonsense. 
They wanted to rule the damn place and not be someone's dog. They scoffed and thought it didn't matter because they already knew that they would fight and battle it to the death. No matter what, they had to take the crown. 9.59 a.m. Cough, cough, cough. Julius started coughing like crazy. Pla. My king. Father. Husband. Everyone held when they saw the black blood that their king spat out. The physician quickly stepped forward to aid the shaking Julius. Cough, cough, cough. The coughing was so loud and scary. Blah. Julius opened his mouth and continuously let out a ridiculous amount of black blood as if he were in a horror movie. His heat felt stuffy as he struggled to breathe. He raised his trembling hands towards the physician, but soon, the grim reaper had appeared. Bam. His hands dropped on the armrest of his chair, and the physician's eyes grew wide in horror as he hurriedly checked his pulse. He froze, turned around and looked at everyone sadly. 10 a.m. on the dot. King Julius Tudor was dead. Father. Husband. Ming Julius. The entire police turn rowdy when the physician confirms Julius' death. All queens hire their sons while wailing pitifully. Oh. Husband. Why did you have to die so soon? No. The heavens aren't fair. They should have taken me instead. That's right. Husband. You know that if there was something that I could have done to save you, then I would. But why did you have to get some strange illness now? Who was responsible? Who made you sick? Winston's mother cried sorrowfully, knowing fully that her son was the culprit. Husband, without you, how am I supposed to spend my days in future? You were my one true love, so why would you leave me now? All the wives gave magnificent performances, as the room was filled with court officials and nobles. They cried, rolled on the ground, decided to kiss their husband's hands one last time, and did their best to win many people's sympathies. Plus, they wanted to do their best just in case Julius wasn't entirely dead yet. What if he woke up a few minutes later? Of course, he would favor the person who mourned more. If after a while he didn't wake up, then they would relax. Right now, they had been crying and peeking at him curiously. They, more than anyone else, knew that their husband was a sneaky one. So what if he and the physician made a deal and all of this was a ploy? Everyone decided to mourn for him while also taking turns to see and hold him, especially Ulrich. He kissed his father's hands and secretly checked his pulse. Likewise, everyone did the same. Their father, husband and king was too tricky. The princes discreetly smiled after confirming his death. If Julius saw this scene from above, he would undoubtedly beg the heavens to raise him from the dead so that he could curse them. What a good bunch of white-eyed wolves. But sadly, he was already dead and gone, leaving the wolves to do as they pleased. Ulrich stepped forward sternly and faced the crowd. Everyone, we have lost a great monarch who meant the world to us. But even so, we must stay strong and ensure that he gets buried according to the Deifer way. I, future King Ulrich, will ensure it. Thank you, your highness, everyone said in unison. The day had finally come for the devil prince to oversee the empire. This strikingly handsome man was a person that brought fear to many because of his methods. Even those who opposed him dare not do so openly for fear of what will become of them. Ulrich's body trembled with glee, but those who saw him thought he was shaking from depression instead since he had a very stern face. Take the body to the 15 building A and invite the royal brogan to prepare the body for the deifer ritual and burial. Also, get three sin eaters for the ceremony as well. My father's sins will be transferred to the food and wine through the ritual, and they will eat it, hence gaining my father's sins. This way, my father will not wait too long on the line of souls that lead to the heavens. Additionally, prepare a dead horse to be buried alongside him, so that he may also move faster along the line. Release the news of my father's passing. And as tradition demands, the entire empire is to mourn for three whole days only since mourning for long might delay my father's journey to the heavens. After the news is released, no stores or businesses are to run. Anyone caught will be killed on the spot. The only exceptions are the healers and council members that will welcome stronger warriors for the empire. As for the rest of you, head back home and see me three days from now, first thing in the morning. Now go. Yes, your highness. With that, the court officials and nobles rushed out of the place like crazy. And why did they rush out? 
It was because they knew that soon enough, a bloodbath would occur in the palace, and they didn't want to get caught in between the mess. They, as high-ranking nobles, had their factions with people supporting some princes behind Ulrich's back. They more or less knew the friction that existed between these totals, so it was understandable that many wouldn't give out without a fight. After all, these past few weeks, they had been visiting His Majesty almost every day to finalize some things on the Empire. More still, they too had spies within the palace. So it was during this time that some saw and heard how the princes, Julius brothers, and even Princess Eldora tried to make Julius appoint them as heir to the throne. They would be foolish to think that this group of people would go down without any form of resistance. That's why they secretly thanked the heavens that they had this three-day mourning period. Even if some didn't support Ulrich, that doesn't mean that they wanted to join in the fight and have everything they worked hard for go down the drain. They would only join if they were 100% sure that the person they chose would be victorious. But with so many players in the game, it's hard to say whether some won't team up against others to eliminate the strongest or the weakest first. With that, they said farewell and left in a hurry. Three days from now, there will be a victor. Some place their best on Ulrich, while others lean more on Winston, Bonnevere, Winston, and the Dukes. No one even took Eldora seriously. The number of potential champions were many, with several having a ton of achievements under their belts. In this matter, it was tough to know the direction of the wind. At the end, who will reign supreme above all? This question, only time could adequately answer them. So for now, they had to take cover by hiding themselves within the walls of their estates and manors without stepping one foot outside. And within three days, they will get their answer. Ten whole minutes had gone by since the nobles, and those who took Julius' body had left the building. Additionally, the princes all sent their mothers away alongside their sisters, well, except Eldora, who refused to go anywhere. Many might think that the ladies were sent back to their courtyards in the palace, but that wasn't the case. Their sons had secretly made plans for them to leave the palace until they got positive results. The princes and Eldora sat in absolute silence for an additional 22 more minutes. And finally, when Winston estimated that his mother was at least one-third way out of the palace, he smiled cruelly at Ulrich. It was time to take the crown. One should know that before coming to see Julius, they had quickly informed their men to get those in the city here first before those outside come in later. And they used over 20 minutes on carriage to get to their father, and it took another 20-something minutes for the guy to die. Even at that, they spent over one hour and 10 minutes crying, giving enough mourning time just in case all of those were a hoax, before discreetly checking his pulse. As tradition, all the officials had to kiss the king's hand. So it took a while. Not to talk of the additional few minutes used by Ulrich to display his disgusting show of power by commanding people here and there. So by the end of it all, they had used about two hours for the entire thing. And now, they had been staring at each other for an additional 32 minutes. It was now 11.42 a.m. His men should already be close to this building. Of course, he always moved around with 400 guards that could hold off while they wait for the other thousands, making their way to this building. And in several more hours, those outside the city should also be here as well. Today was going to be bloody, but Winston wasn't the only one secretly calculating things as well. Everyone smiled cruelly. Ulrich leaned back in the chair that Julius previously sat on and grinned broadly. Oh, why is everyone so quiet? You all said you had something to say to me. So why have you been quiet for so long? Bam. Duke Bulkington slammed his thighs in anger. Nephew, enough crap. You know that you are too young to sit on the throne. You have no experience or understanding of what it takes to run an empire. So it's only reasonable that you hand it over to me, your eldest uncle, to hold the position for a while until you've fully grasped everything that needs to be done. Duke Osseus face borrowed in rage. Nephew, I agree with what my brother says. But you should pass it to me instead because, unlike my brother, I have more achievements in the Empire. So I'll be able to properly hold the position while waiting for you to grow up. Winston was seething in rage while listening to these old geezers. They were just two and five years apart from Julius, so technically, weren't they old as well? To him, anyone above the age of 32 was old. After all, the coming of age was at 14, when a boy became a man. So 32 to him was pretty old 
and wasn't eligible to take over the crown. So what were these two old fogies talking about? Uncles, can you both shut it? Even if my brother wants to give any of you the crown, I, Winston, won't allow it. Why should it be given to men who are half a step to their graves? What it, nephew? Are you cursing us to die? We are your uncles. Show some respect. Heh. Call it whatever you want. All I know is that you're too old to be here with us. That's right, uncles. We don't need you here. I second that. I agree as well. Geoffrey, Bonavir, and Eldora couldn't stand their shamelessness anymore. This was a right between them and not between these old geezers, all right? You unfilial ingrate. Both Bulkington and Osseus were insanely angry now. Ulrich got a signal from his men, sneered and stood up from his seat majestically. Uncle, brothers, sister, I know you want my crown, but why should I give it to you? Previously, I decided to send you all to a deserted island to live the rest of your lives there peacefully, hoping that maybe one day, you would grow some sense in those heads of yours. But now that you're all full of evil intentions, then don't blame me for taking action against you. Bam. Instantly, the door to the left of Ulrich's back burst open, and in came several knights that entered through the door commonly used by maids, butlers, and kitchen workers. Din din din. Their heavy footsteps could make one feel intimidated, not to talk of their sheer number as well. They stood behind Ulrich confidently while gazing at those opposing him sternly. But where Winston and the rest intimidated? Not a chance. Their men were also here. So why worry? Brother, it's funny you say this because I was thinking the same thing as well. But rather than a deserted island, my thoughts were more on the line of sending you to another continent as a slave. Oh my. My thoughts were on giving you to the pirates as a male harlot. Ha ha ha. Our family sure is loving, but enough small talk. The throne is mine. Bam. All doors opened, and several other men wearing different war garments came in through the gigantic, double-sided front door for the size of two gates. Everyone came in and stood behind their masters. Ulrich calmly looked at the scene unfazed. Of course, he had predicted their every move. So it stands to show that only he would come out on top. And no one, not even the heavens, could change the outcome of today's preparations. This building will be the burial site for his so-called family members. Eldora's men formed a shield around her while giving her a bow and arrow. She had been practicing for this day for a long time now. Meanwhile, Winston, Joffrey, Bonavir, and the dukes unsheathed their swords coldly. It was a fight to the death. Without wasting any more time, everyone quickly launched attacks on one another. Bonavir, who was closest to Duke Osseus, attacked the old geezer fiercely while Duke Bulkington took on Joffrey. Likewise, Ulrich and Winston were on each other's throats while Eldora hid behind her shields and hastily took out an arrow to hit anyone she could. Of course, their men just fought anyone who wasn't on their team. The whole place became too cramped up and was as busy as a marketplace. So it was even more challenging for Eldora to ensure that she successfully shot Ulrich or anyone else. Nonetheless, she refused to give up. Since she wasn't able to wield a sword during this short period, she chose archery instead. And even though she wasn't a pro, she felt that she could still hit her target, provided she was somewhat close enough. The battle was on. Killing intent flashed within Ulrich's eyes as he twisted his body abruptly, avoiding the blade that aimed at his neck. Slash. The blade pierced the enemy behind him instead, which made Winston grow mad when he realized that he had killed his own person. Damn it. This was a loss of battle power. With rage-filled eyes Winston's attacks grew even fiercer than before. Ting ting. The sounds of their stores clashing at an incredible speed echoed through their ears. None wanted to give each other resting time or breathing space. But the drawback of this was that because they were wasting too much energy, they had to kill each other fast before their arms became sore. But did Winston care? Nope. Right now, he felt a burst of energy within him that came from his rage. At times, the human body might not realize that it was in pain because it faced a difficult situation. When running from a bear attack, some people might not even realize that they were scarred by trees and twigs until they successfully escaped. Likewise, the intense situation didn't make Winston feel any muscle fatigue or pain. Right now, he was most concerned with obliterating this broker of his and seizing the crown. 
Ting ting ting. Ha ha ha. Brother, judging from your fighting style, it looks like you've been overpowered by me. Yes, that's right. I, the one you looked down on, was able to give you so much pressure. Ulrich looked at the fool and didn't even bother speaking. Why speak and waste more energy? This is why he was always better than this hit-headed brother of his. He felt like under Winston's rule, the empire might disappear within the next five years. Not that he cared about the people, but he wouldn't allow anyone to destroy his military power. To Ulrich, everyone and everything within the empire belonged to him. So he didn't like the idea of people misusing his properties. And while these brothers fought, Duke Bulkington and Joffrey were immersed in their own world too. Ting. Both leaned close to each other while struggling to push the other back with their swords. Nephew. It's best you give up now because there's no way that you can beat me. Old man. Has anyone ever told you that you have bad breath? Can you please close our mouth? Why you? Before Duke Bulkington finished speaking, Joffrey knocked his head hard against his. Bam. Plop. Bulkington bit his tongue hard in the process, making his entire mouth bloody. F asterisk CK. He was fuming mad. Did no one respect him anymore? Since when did these little frogs look down on him? Joffrey smirked playfully at the jumping buffoon. Ah! Bulkington angrily came at Joffrey again, attempting to slice the bastard into half. But just before he could land his attack, Joffrey took out a tiny dagger. He used his sword to block the attack with one hand and quickly sent the dagger straight into Bulkington's throat. Shoo! Bulkington subconsciously grabbed his neck in confusion, despair, and unwillingness. Why? Why did it turn out like this? How could he lose? SBRSHHHH. Blood gushed out of his neck like a fountain, dyeing Joffrey's fair complexion. Joffrey licked the blood off his lips in satisfaction while staring at his unwilling uncle, who still struggled to kill him. He calmly dodged the old geezer's weak attack and bent down to pick his sword. That's right. Earlier on when he blocked the geezer's attack, he used one hand to do so, which wasn't enough to hold against the geezer's fierce attack. So it knocked his sword out of his hand. Lucky, he moved quickly and sent his danger straight into the geezer's throat. Bam! Bulkington fell on his knees while struggling to gasp for air. After getting stabbed, he struggled to take down this nephew of his at least so that they would die together. Sadly, he failed. And now, the majority of strength had disappeared. No, he didn't want to die. More still, he was sure that these bastards wouldn't even properly bury him. With no Sin Eater, no horse, and no rituals, didn't this mean that he would spend at least 100,000 years slowly walking on the like of souls? Wasn't this akin to dying like a common slave? No, he was unwilling. More still, what about everything that he has worked hard for? Will it just be swallowed by these brats? Duke Bulkington's breathing grew heavier as he struggled to distance himself from Joffrey. But what could a dying man do? Joffrey spared no time as he hastily got his sword and prepared to slice the geezer's head off. Uncle, when you die, say hello to father for me. Slash. Pap, 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 pap. The head bounced on the ground for a bit before stopping to reveal an alarmed Duke Bulkington. He died with his eyes wide open. Duke. Bulkington's men watched everything in horror. They weren't able to do anything because they were also fighting more and more enemies as well. They fought some of Winston's men, Ulrich's and so on. So their hands were just too full. But seeing the situation, they knew that they had to find a way to escape from here and quickly flee the capital with their families. Their pillar of support was dead. So what else could they do? Now, they struggled to leave the building as fast as they could. But how could it be that easy when they were so swamped? Ulrich and the rest secretly smiled when they heard the screams across the room. Good. One down, six more to go. With his opponent dead, Joffrey quickly glanced around the scene and fought his way towards his next target. And who could that person be? Well, it was no other than Eldora. Yes, Eldora, the pest. At least, that's how he thought of her. During his battle with Duke Bulkington, he almost died several times by her arrows. She and her small group of minions had been shooting at him several times. If not for the fact that the battleground was so chaotic, he would have died by now. Once, he ducked from avoiding his opponent's attack, and an arrow whistled through the air and shot the person behind him. Another time, someone was thrown in the air by another, 
and that person took the arrow for him. In this crowded place, it wasn't a good idea for them to use archers. Yes, the archers could go up the stairs and shoot, but this was a battlefield, so the place was filled with thousands and thousands of people. There was no safe spot for archers to shoot without risking an enemy attack from their surroundings. That's why only a handful of Eldora's people were archers, while a few others created shields to fight around them up the stairs. For now, Eldora was safe in that little bubble of hers, but Joffrey was about to break it. Who asked her to be so annoying? Eldora gazed at her incoming stepbrother in panic. Seeing his murderous eyes made her shower with fear and anger. Why didn't he just like he should have? Joffrey smiled cruelly and placed his dagger away before fiercely clearing the path towards her with his sword. Eldora held her now with trembling hands and quickly took an arrow, preparing to make her move. Thup. She missed. F asterisk CK. The faster Joffrey advanced, the more nervous she became. So much so that she started attempting to shoot as fast as she could. Someone from Earth who saw what she was doing would like that she was the failed version of Orlando Bloom in Lord of the Rings. Because of her shaky hands, fear and anxiety, she practically missed all her shots. And the tension in the room didn't make things better one bit. One has to know that even though she was used to killing people, she did so in the comfort of her private estate. She had never been to battle and felt very intimidated at it all. Here, no one cared about her identity as the enemies sneakily tried to cut her clean. If not for those guarding her, she would have already died a hundred times over. She didn't know anything about techniques or even how to block attacks and protect herself. She honestly thought it would be easy since she has personally killed people before. But who would have known that the truth would be so different than what she imagined? Her men also took shots at Joffrey, but it yielded no crowds because Joffrey used those around him to block the shots. Give me more arrows. Princess, we are almost out. What did you say? Eldora grew pale from fright. Her lips quivered, and her body shook heavily. She turned to see her cruel half-brother waving at her and almost fainted. Damn it. It was a mistake to get involved now. She should have just moved assassins to fight for her. She thought she was formidable because of the number of people she has killed over the years. But now, she knew it was nothing compared to what her brothers had done. Princess? The men struggled to hold her limping body in confusion. Why would the princess go real because of such news? They still had men and swords with them, so what's there to be worried about? As Dia for men, they were always battle ready. He the thing was, they forgot that she was a Dia for woman and not a man. She had an entirely different education that didn't prepare her for today. Eldora quickly got up and held the person beside her tightly. Fall back. Tell everyone to fall back. Princess, I said fall back. Now get me out of here. Eldora was ready to fly out of the building if need be. She now envied her sister Tatiana, who fooled her mother out of the palace earlier on. F asterisk CK. She should have sent assassins while chilling in her estate rather than staying. Of course, she wasn't giving up on the crown. She just wanted to live today to fight for it another time. But how could it be that easy? Just fighting their way down the stairs again and out of the building was another hassle on its own. Not to talk about leaving the palace. And with her murderous brother behind her, it was tough to tell whether she would be able to escape or not. Eldora and her men tried to move away as fast as possible, but those around them continued attacking them brutally. And before they knew it, Joffrey had caught up to them. Some of Eldora's shields were busy with other opponents, while two decided to engage with Joffrey instead. Yes, kill him. Kill him kill him. Eldora started screaming madly while standing against the wall. The men were at her front, battling to protect her, and she began to cheer from for them fearfully. It's two against one, so her brother should lose, right? She felt very confident after analyzing things, but soon, her smile cracked when she saw her brother send a father into one's heart while stabbing the other with his sword. Useless. A bunch of useless fools. He pitched her only remaining arrow in her hand and hid it behind her back in fear. My dear darling sister, earlier on, didn't I tell you that the battleground is no place for a woman? Well, since you're so bent on seeking death, then why don't I assist you by granting your wish? Joffrey quickly made his move. And even though Eldora tried to block it, 
she fell fatally underneath the attack. But, before going out, she left a little gift for this brother of hers. Joffrey looked at his chest and started laughing angrily. Ha ha ha, who would have known that a woman would take him down? In his chest was an arrow that Eldora used to stab his heart. He slumped by the side of the wall and watched Eldora's struggling body try to survive. In fact, he also found himself in the same predicament as well. He felt very cold and frail. Eldora was the first to go, and within the next seconds, he too was dead. Again, in another part of the room, Duke Osseus had killed Bonavir too. Now, there were just three players in the game, Ulrich, Winston, and Duke Osseus. Who will win? Who will be on top? All three stared at each other in determination. There was only room for one person in this empire. The rest had to die. Ting ting. The tension in the air was fierce and stronger than ever. Everyone was engaged in battle. Even those who lost their leaders didn't find it easy to escape the battleground. Even if they went outside, the situation might still be the same because those around the area were also knee-deep in battle. Within the building, many fell and died, instantly dwindling their numbers down significantly. Everyone's eyes were alert and keen as they observed their surroundings. As for the stars of the show, they dared not relax their guard because right now, they felt that they were even closer to victory than before. All they had to do was kill the two enemies before them, and the battle would be over. More still, they had more men outside the city coming to help them out. So all they had to do was ensure their survival. All three men attacked each other all at once, finding an opportunity to deal with their opponents sneakily. And all this time, Ulrich had never overly exerted his strength as he just continued defending against his opponents. You could say that he was waiting for them to lose their stamina. Right from the very beginning, even when fighting with Winston, he didn't even use his full strength because he knew that both he and Winston had roughly the strength. So if they went all out together, he would tire himself too fast because Winston wasn't an easy target to kill. And even if he finally killed him, he would still have to fight the rest. In this case, Duke Osseus. So thinking like that, he conserved his energy, didn't talk or even make any attacks. Ulrich played it out as if he was barely struggling to survive their assaults which gave the idiots more motivation and pride. Winston, in particular, was so happy at the thought that he was better than Ulrich, so much so that he started laughing cynically, sending attacks haphazardly, wasting his strength. Of course, Winston attacked Duke Osseus in the same manner. But when he found that the Duke wasn't as obedient as Ulrich, he grew angrier and felt that the Duke was looking down on him. Just remembering their earlier conversation made his blood boil. Why were these old geezers fighting them for the throne? If this bastard weren't here, then he would have been the victor right after killing Ulrich. He borrowed his brows in anger and glared his fangs at the duke. Of course, the duke also had some scores to settle with Winston, who cursed him to die earlier. Both looked at one another and subconsciously focused on themselves, giving little attention to Ulrich. In truth, both Winston and Duke Osseus had very similar attitudes. They hated, disobedient people who didn't suffer any blows from their attacks. It was as if these people were saying that they were nothing. So thinking like that, both were afraid that while dealing with Ulrich, the other might sneak attack them. That's why their eyes always fell on each other from time to time. One might think that they were foolish and judged them. But when in battle, one's mind would operate as it liked. Some decisions might be wrong, while others end up right. But if everyone were right, then there would be no loser. Even back on Earth, several ancient rulers lost battles, and even their memories due to some dumb decisions. Those in the future could question what the hell these people were thinking of, but that was because they were fortunate to be born in a time that bettered their understanding of things. More still, they were just bystanders and weren't actually within the battlefield. Because if they were, they would know that it was a different feeling altogether. No matter what sessions these people made, it was their instincts personalities, and willingness to win that led them there. With that, Winston and Osseus, feeling not much threat from Ulrich, turned most of their attention to themselves instead. Ting ting, their swords clashed against one another fiercely. Greenish veins filled Winston's hands as he started growing tired from it all. From a logical point of view, it was best that he utilized this time that he was still in a good strength range to deal with Osseus. Because even if he wanted energy and took out Ulrich who was a small fry, 
then how would he later deal with this troublesome uncle of his that seemed full of vigor? It was best to take out Osseus now and use the rest of his energy to focus on Ulrich. Thinking like this, Winston squinted his eyes while waiting for an opportunity to strike. And as if the heavens heard his thoughts, the small fry Ulrich attempted to strike Osseus for the first time. Winston smiled cruelly and stroked Osseus the moment he blocked the attack. Shoo! Osseus glared at the loathsome Winston in rage. He only noticed the attack when it was also too late. And at that point, there was nothing he could do because he was also fending off Ulrich's attack as well. Did they plan it? F asterisk CK. They had planted him. The attack pierced his heart, leaving a spine-tingling amount of pain that caused him to grit his teeth, trying to bear it all. Who would have known that a few hours after he was mourning Julius' death, he would follow later on. At least his brother, Julius, was fortunate that he would be adequately buried and would go way ahead of them in the line of souls. He felt like he would soon join Bulkington in the 100,000-year march on the line. He was so close to the finish line. So why did he have to lose now? Instantly, a deep sense of hatred filled his heart when he glanced at the duo before him. No, he wanted them to follow him. Thinking like that, he used the last ounce of strength in his body and went berserk. Ah, I want you both to die. Especially you, nephew. Osseus swung his sword mightily towards Winston, who was the main culprit that caused his death. He didn't mind if Ulrich survived, but Winston had to join him. Ting. Osseus sent a day attack towards Winston as if he were about to hit a tennis ball. Ting. Winston blocked the attack and instantly pushed back. Osseus attacked again twice until his body suddenly stopped functioning and collapsed. He trembled on the ground like a fish out of water with unwillingness as he looked at Winston. And in a few seconds, he was gone. But did Winston have time to celebrate? No. His focus was all on Ulrich. One down, one more to go. Winston smiled cruelly at Ulrich and launched a brutal attack on him. Ha! Huh. He could almost taste victory. Ting. Brother, you didn't think that I would be able to make it far, did you? We were born just a day apart. So why are you father's favorite? What makes you better qualified than I? TCH. If father saw this scene now, he would finally know how mistaken he was to think that you could be better than me in any more. You were just born ahead of me by a day, and that is and will always remain your only advantage. Ulrich, who was acting weak, now straightened his shoulders and smiled before blocking Winston's attack. Ting. Well, in fact, I too think that in terms of raw strength, you're slightly tougher than I am. But when it comes to using your head, not so much. You. Ting. Both parties repelled each other, and Winston glared so much that if it were possible, steam would have busted out of his ears and nostrils from pure rage. Ulrich chuckled and smiled playfully. Do you really think that I'm surprised that you made it this far? In fact, if you didn't, then I would have been disappointed in you. Unlike the rest, I expected you to be my last competitor. And just as predicted, here you are. Winston's pupils widened in shock. You knew? Ting. Ulrich blocked Winston's attack again. Yes, brother, I knew. I mean, throughout these years, it was apparent to see that you always wanted the crown. So it was easy to conclude that you'd try pulling something today. Ting. Himph. As you said, that's easy to predict. So don't always assume that you know everything. That's one of the most annoying things about you. Ting. Once more, they repelled each other, pushing themselves a bit further apart. Winston felt like it was impossible for Ulick to know everything. Did he know that he was the culprit that poisoned father? Did he know that most of the officials were on his side? Did Ulrich know that he had an army on the way here? No, he did not. Because if he did, he wouldn't have been calm all this while. He was only making small talk to belittle him. This was one of the many reasons why he and Winston were like fire and ice. One had an extremely fiery temper, and the other was chilled. And what he hated the most was that growing up, Ulrich would always seem well-behaved to father and make him look like a complete fool. Ulrich had been calling him idiot since they were little, and he had always wanted to prove that he was better than the bastard who thought he was more intelligent than him. The guy was just too hateful. There was no way he knew everything. Yes, he only said so to intimidate him. Thinking like this, Winston scoffed. Do you think that getting into my head will make me lower my guard? Heh. 
No matter what you say, the outcome would be the same. Ting. Yes, you're absolutely right. The outcome will be the same with me killing you. Screw you. Idiot. Don't you dare call me that. Ting. Why? Aren't you one? Or don't you want to recognize your faction anymore? I've always said that you're the king of idiots. So why don't you hold on to that crown so that after you lose, you'll have something that makes you feel better in the end. F asterisk CK off. Ting. Language brother, language? Is this how you were raised? TSK. You've really disappointed me. Oh well, I expected nothing more from an idiot. Eh. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Idiot. 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 Ting ting. The duo clashed their swords severally, with one person remaining calm while the other wanting nothing more than to chew the person before them into tiny bits. Ulrich observed Winston's reaction time and realized that the book was slowing down without even realizing that he was. Good. Soon, he'll be able to end this once and for all. His eyes flickered with a murderous light as he dashed forward and slashed towards Winston's head. Swish. Cold seat formed on Winston's forehead after barely dodging the attack. Why was Ulrich so strong all of a sudden? He gritted his teeth and stepped back a little. But how could Ulrich let him relax? Like an unshakable force, he began pounding Winston nonstop. Winston's hands trembled whenever he blocked the attack. And for the first time since they began the battle, he didn't feel very confident in winning again. Nonetheless, he refused to give up when he was this close to winning. After Ulrich went down, won't he be the victor? Winston struggled and gave it his all. But it was just that Ulrich had been prepared for this moment for too long. The force from Ulrich's attack was too great for Winston's already trembling hands to bear. Shuring. Winston's sword fell to the ground and Ulrich smiled victoriously. Brother, when you die, say hello to father for me. With that, Ulrich lifted his sword in an attempt to finish him off. But just as he was about to do so, something happened that knocked him and a few others back. Ah! A terrible, mysterious force sent those closest to the door flying backward, pushing the rest in a strong dominoes effect. Some ended up accidentally dying taking up attacks that weren't meant for them, while others thanked whatever saved them during these final moments. In fact, from where Ulrich was, he didn't feel the force and all this time. His attention had been on Winston. All he knew was that some morons flew into him, ruining his chance to kill Winston. Son of A.B. asterisk th. This was not in his calculations. Who were those responsible? There were bodies on him. One accidentally died from his sword, while the others were still alive. They happened to just land on the first guy who died. What's the meaning of his? The feeling of having his comment rubbed from him made him so pissed that he became overly emotional that invisible tears almost streamed down his cheeks. He wanted nothing more than to kill those responsible. Who? Who was it? Who took away his moment? Come out now. Ulrich always went crazy when he revered how close he was to slitting Winston's throat. Winston, on the other hand, felt like the heavens really wanted him to survive. Could this be a sign that he was truly meant to be king? Thinking like that, the pain he felt in his body earlier on seemed to have faded away into thin air. The duo both pushed the bodies over them and stood upright to see what miracle, or demon in Ulrich's case, had interrupted their fight. And lo and behold, what they saw made them freeze. As it right on cue, Henry and the masked Landon, strolled in amidst the chaos as if they weren't the culprits. Of course, several soldiers were already around them, as they stood a little hard of them while pointing their weapons to the enemy before them. Bastard! What are you doing here? Henry wouldn't have even noticed that his brothers were here amidst the countless men, but Winston just had to explain loudly at the top of his voice. For Winston, this was a heavy blow. Not to talk of Ulrich. Seeing how casual Henry was, how could they not be pissed? The guy even came in while chewing on an apple. What did he think this was? Here they were busting their asses off and killing each other, thinking that there were no more competitors in the capital, and fighting for their lives with just one more person left for them to defeat. Henry shows up in full vigor without so much as a scratch on him. They, on the other hand, had been fighting for hours and wasting their stamina here and there. Who wouldn't get angry? It was like they were running to the finish line with all their strength while he just slept on the ground and miraculously happened to cross the finish line. 
Swindler. Ulrich almost puked blood when he saw Henry's face. He knew it. Something deep within him warned him that this bastard might try something. But for several weeks now, none of his spies both in and out had reported any news of Henry being remotely close to the capital. He knew when Joffrey came. He knew when Winston came. In short, he knew everything about everyone. Even when he was away from the capital, he still knew what was going on here. That's how powerful his intel is. So if Henry was around these last few days, why didn't he know of it? Or did Henry just arrive at the capital now by coincidence? No, 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 no. What sort of dumbass luck was that? No one was that lucky in life. So it meant that Henry might have been around but had bribed his spies to hide things from him. He knew it. Ever since the bastard used hallucinating powder to fool his men that one fairy godmother destroyed hundreds alone, he knew that Henry was dangerous. F asterisk CK. Just like the others supposedly good-for-nothings around the continent, Henry was just like them. Like Landon, Sirius, and all the rest, he was just a big pretender who had his greedy eyes on his throne. Oomph. He would never have anything over to anyone. Not even if his father came back to live and demanded the crown back. How could he give up his birthright? All he had to do was hold them off until his men outside penetrate the palace. And in about thirty more minutes or so, they should be here. Of course, he didn't care if Henry had penetrated the palace with more men than he currently had outside. For them to make it this far means that some of them also actively joined the battle to fight their way in. He said some because the way he looked at Henry, the bastard probably didn't fight at all. Anyway, Henry should have lost some men before coming here. Additionally, he knew that Winston had men coming as well. So if he could somehow trick Winston into making his men put their attention on Henry's men, then this problem would be more than solved. All he had to do was survive until they got here. Thinking like this, Ulrich's smile turned broader while looking at Henry. So what if this bastard came now, sooner or later? He would kill him anyway. Winston, on the other hand, was turning red in rage. You. You have no right to be here. Father would have never wanted you here. Get out. Go away. Henry chuckled and chewed on his apple a bit more, completely ignoring Winston. Are you deaf? Didn't you hear what I said? Henry scrunched his brow and looked around before turning to Landon again. Did you hear something? Nah. It's probably just the wind. You. Poor Winston almost had a heart attack from it all. Ulrich's eyes turned dark when he saw Henry's attitude. Was this still the cowardly bit who they used to whip best mercilessly? For a moment, he almost didn't recognize Henry. Well, the bit sure had grown. The last time he saw Henry was 14. At that time, he came of age and was sent to another city. Since then, no one bothered about this useless good-for-nothing. At least until recently, when Ulrich started feeling uneasy about him. Henry scoffed at his brothers, while secretly firming his heart. They didn't know, but his heart almost leaped out of his chest just now. Winston and Ulrich had felt a very deep shadow in him for a long time now, and over the years, he truly tried to get over that shadow. But for some reason, with Landon here, he felt mighty, as if he didn't need to be afraid of them anymore. He wasn't ashamed to say it. Amongst the royals within Deiphorus and probably within the entire continent, he was undoubtedly the weakest in courage. Of course, he has been trying to change. And hopefully, step by step, he would leave his older self and become a man worthy of his people. But things like this just didn't happen overnight. Nonetheless, he clenched his fists and showed his most arrogant side towards these so-called brothers of his. Now, he'll show them just how tough he could be. The entire room was tense, as those who were pushed back and survived all put aside their differences to face these intruders. What else could they do? These people miraculously managed to push them back. So who wouldn't think rationally and team up with their enemies to fight the intruders? Of course, those at the back still didn't know much of the situation. By those at the very front of it all were very aware and dared not step forward yet. So they held their swords formally and vigilantly watched the strange men before them who were pointing several black rods, guns, at them. There was a great distance between both sides, but neither Ulrich's men or Winston's men at the front thought of making the first move. One of Henry's men brought forth a metal megaphone and placed it close to his mouth. Honestly, everyone still felt that Henry was very hateful. 
Forget the fact that he was still eating an apple. Why did he have to take his sweet time and even get someone following him around with a megaphone? Henry couldn't be bothered with what they thought. Of course, he would fight if need be. But that depended on how his so-called half-brothers. All right, for the sake of brotherhood, I'll make this quick, plain and simple. Today, I'm already the victor, and I don't want to waste any more time on this. So it's best you all surrender now. You wish. Winston exclaimed. What a joke. How could he give up when he was already so close? Humph. Do you think that you've really got us surrounded? Any moment from now, thousands and thousands of my men will break into the palace. So you better lay out and go back just like a weak dog should. Henry chuckled playfully. Bring the box. Yes, your highness. Henry smiled broadly at his half-brothers while waiting for the box. Bothers, I hate to break it to you, but your backup isn't coming. What do you mean? Well, simply put, we destroyed them last night. In fact, we destroyed everyone's backup. And yes, that includes your men as well, first brother. Pap. Ulrich felt like he had just but hit by lighting. His pupils widened in disbelief as he stared silently at Henry. How was that possible? He had roughly 30,000 men out there, and Winston had about 1317, 000, 000, 000. Not to talk of Duke Osseus, Joffrey, and the rest. If they did this last night, that meant that they had at least 150,000 men with them, or more, since they seemed to have suffered no setback. When did Henry gather so many men? Since when had he been planning to seize his crown? Ulrich's mind kept spinning and spinning in rage. And if eyes could kill, Henry would have already died, resurrected, and died a million times over and over by now. F asterisk CK. The moment he saw the head of the commander in charge of leading his backup army, he was now fully convinced that his army was indeed no more. In fact, if Joffrey and those who died saw this scene, they would have also seen their commander's heads there too, since Henry brought the heads of all commanders here. If they had known, they wouldn't have even bothered attacking their enemies today. Now they died for nothing. Winston, on the other hand, was on the verge of a breakdown. Since the start of the battle, he had been planning and waiting for his men to infiltrate the palace and face, slap his enemies to kneel and now before him like a true champion. But who could tell him why that did was shattered into pieces by this fateful fellow called Henry? More importantly, since when was he this powerful? Henry wanted them to surrender. But even at this moment, they still would E.T. do so. Both Winston and Henry thought of one thing, and that was to escape. Just because they lost this battle didn't mean that it was the end. They decided to go into hiding, rally more forces and supporters before retaking the throne. Particularly, Ulrich decided to seek out the Temple of Dragmas. As luck would have it, ten days before Julius died, he told him all about the mysterious temple that even he didn't know existed. He was told the history of the temple and how they helped the royals to keep Deiferous safe from the pirates centuries ago. He also told him of other contributions that they also made in recent times. Not even Duke Osseus or Bulkington knew of it. The information was passed from heir to heir directly. And after one becomes monarch, the temple would personally visit in secret. Julius told him that some officials and even some merchants were temple members, and that he could only know them once he got the crown. Julius warned him that the temple had eyes everywhere and knew everything, so he should never try to cheat or deceive them. Previously, when Julius was reading the verdict, for a moment, he thought that Julius had changed his mind about him being the heir and told someone else. But soon, his mind was put to rest, knowing that he was still the heir. More importantly, Julius had told him that if he was facing any issues, all he had to do was seek out the temple, and they would help him since he was of total blood. And in return, the temple would increase the percentage paid to them by the royals. It was like they were paying tax to the mysterious temple because each year, the royals, particularly Julius, personally sent a percentage of income from the empire's taxes to the temple. And every time the temple aided them, that percentage went up. Julius had also given him a list of secret meetup points that he could go to anywhere within the empire and use some secret word to let him meet these people. Since taking the note from Julius, he had always assumed it everywhere he went. So now, all he thought about was escaping and going to these places to seek the temple's help. Ulrich had a grand plan in mind, but it was just too bad that the temple was already on the verge of extinction. 
Winston and Ulrich looked at each other for a split second before storming towards the back in an attempt to escape. Their action brought in a wave of movement from their men, and now, everyone had the same thought as well, and that was to escape or fight their way through if need be. But how could it be that easy? As planned, all units split up. Yes, sir. Instantly, the soldiers, as well as Henry's men, speeded out according to the layout of the building. Some moved towards the stairs, while others focused on going through all hallways and pads on the ground floor. Landon smiled while staring intensely at Ulrich, who was hurriedly making his way up the many stairs. The building had five high ceiling floors, and from the looks of it, it seemed like Ulrich was trying to go straight to the top. But this didn't make any sense. Even though the building was five stories tall, each floor had the same height as a two-story building. So in essence, it was as tall as a ten-story building. An average person would try finding an escape route on ground level, since it was impossible to jump out the window on higher floors without sustaining any injuries. Well, they could still do the old sheets out the window thing, but that would take some time to plan. Even assassins planned their escape properly if they genuinely had to leave through a window that high. So if Ulrich wasn't looking for an escape route on the ground floor and wasn't trying to escape through the window, then there were only two things involved. Firstly, he planned to disguise himself, play dead, and find opportunities to sneak out. There were no servants in the building, so he couldn't pretend to be one and get out. So pretending to be dead was a risky but very possible option. Again, he could take out Henry's men and wear their outfits as well. In short, it's either he planned to do any of these to escape, or there was a secret escape route on the last floor that would lead him out of this building, making him end up somewhere a little further away. But Landon was betting more on the secret passage thing, and he was right. Unlike the rest, Ulrich was the only one who has ever seen Julia's private office. Again, it was one of those, only the air thing. Julius technically saw people on either the third, second, or ground floor. So some days ago, he showed Ulrich the secret escape route that had three possible exits, all within the palace. Once ended up inside the most guarded floor of the treasure hall. Another ended up in Julius's office within the palace barracks. And the last one ended up in a random building which was just a few minutes away from the palace gates. This last one was the closest route to use when trying to flee the palace. Of course, it wasn't wise for the escape route to actually lead outside the palace because if enemies discover this route, they won't even need to infiltrate the palace through the gates and walls anymore. They'll just pass through the tunnel, and one day the royals would find themselves mysteriously dead. That's why the routes all ended up at different faraway places within the massive palace. At least it would take maybe even hours for the enemy to realize what was going on, and by that time, they would have been long gone. Landon smiled at Ulrich's silhouette after assessing things thoroughly before following him alongside Henry. Let's go. Whatever you say, bro, Henry said while unsheathing his swords and following behind the masked Landon. Pew, pew, pew. Slash, slash, slash. Landon's not his silencers, and Henry raised havoc with his sword. The duo coordinated well as they both fought their way alongside the units and teams tasked with taking any enemies on the last floor. Landon ran forth and shot several people with the accuracy that could make many gunmen on earth kneel. Under the storm of enemies, he jumped several times, avoiding their attacks, before finally jumping onto someone's sword. What was this? The owner of the sword watched Landon land light on his blade and pointed his black iron stick, silencers, at several people. And in a flash, those people seemed to be placed under a spell as they fell for no apparent reason. Was the black iron-like stick sorcery? Landon lightly landing on the sword and shooting, all happened in no more than three seconds. Flowing that, Landon did a backflip while on the enemy's sword and shot more people while flipping in the air. The sword owner woke up from his shock, gritted his teeth, and decided to kill Landon since he was so close by. But what he didn't know was that Landon only let him leave because he and his sword acted as a ladder. Die. Swish, swish, swish. Pew. What? The guy's eyes widened as if he just saw a ghost. He retreated a few steps back and used his trembling hands to touch the hole on his chest. How could this be? Now he knew why those people were falling earlier on. Even as Deifer men, they had never seen such a horrifying weapon before. This, this? What was this? He began staggering as his eyelids felt like they were carrying an entire mountain on them. 
Bam. He was dead. But so were many others. Bam, bam, bam. Their bodies dropped to the ground like flies as they died with absolute shock within their eyes. Once again, Henry had cold sweat on his back while watching the horror of these weapons. Inwardly, he swore that even if he were crazy, he would never go against Landon. Wasn't that just suicide? Slash, 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 slash. Pew, 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 pew. Landon, Henry, and the rest forced their way through the stairs and steadily rushed to catch up with Ulrich. Meanwhile, the star, or one could say the stars of the show, were running upwards as fast as they could. That's right. Winston tagged along. He was a complete idiot. He hated to admit it. But just like when they were younger, in times like this, he knew that Ulrich always had a plan. So why not follow him? He refused to get caught while Ulrich escaped. No way. How could he let that happen? It's either they got caught together or died together. Idiot. Why are you following me? F asterisk CK. You. Who's following you? Does this part belong to you? Do you see your name on the floor? I just happen to like this path, that's all. Din Din. Both Ulrich and Winston, alongside a few others that chose to follow them, moved swiftly in absolute silence. They were no more than determined to flee the scene. But who could tell them why the building was so large and complicated? From the ground floor to the second floor was nothing. But when trying to go to the third floor, they had to pass through all hallways on the second floor until they reached the very end. From there, they would ascend to the third floor inwards. The same concept was used. But the issue was that there was just one set of stairways on each floor. Now, the floors were made like riddles. You chose the path you think was right. And the other paths would either lead you to hallways that slowly descend without you knowing it, unless one is very vigilant. These paths will take you right back to the floor below, at an angle that is very far away from the stairs. So if one is being chased or ambushed by the enemy, and they take this path and end back on the floor below, there was a very high chance that the enemy would already be on that floor and get them. The building itself was very wide. So just moving from extreme ends of the floor to the stairs again took a lot of time. The enemy would probably be there by then. Again, some of the stairways led to dark hallways that were never lit. And there, because of the pressure and weight of the unfortunate people passing by, they would undoubtedly step on very thinly cut wooden tiles that looked like floor decorations. Yup, these were traps. And once they fell in, they would go straight down to ground level and end up in the cages of several hangles. The entire hallway was kept dark, and even within the hallways before that, no one lit torches there. And in situations where one was running for their life, of course, they would try to take a torch from around. But seeing that there were no sources around after ascending the stairs, they would undoubtedly choose to risk it and go into the long, dark hallways rather than waiting there for the enemy to catch them. So with that, they would undoubtedly meet their doom. Unless the god of luck was on their side, and they never once stepped on the thin plank sheets. Again, even if they had torches, that still didn't mean anything if they didn't know of the thin planks. Additionally, even if they did manage to make it through, they would still end up one floor below and pop out of a revolving wall that can only be turned from the hallway that had the traps. So once they pass through and end up on the floor below, they won't be able to go back in again. The place was really troublesome, but that wasn't all. On each floor, the stairways were all in one location, with each leading to a tiny balcony that led to several hallways or the correct path to choose. And the higher one went from floor to floor. The more complex, lengthy, and tall the stairways were, with some crisscrossing others. In short, Winston had only been to the second floor of the building his entire life and had never known that there were so many stairways. The stairways from the ground level to the second floor weren't that complete and didn't lead to any real doors. So no one. He didn't know anything. And even now, because he was following Ulrich, he still didn't know of the dangers around the place. The only people who had ever stepped higher than the second floor were Julius' secret guards, and a few days ago, Ulrich. Not even Julius' brothers had honed higher. Even when the doctor came, he would attend to Julius on the second floor. The whole place was always shrouded in mystery, and throughout the years, many had tried to find out what was hidden within the place. But no one had ever come back alive once they tried to infiltrate the higher floors. That was why many people call it the building of absolute death. Of course, some of the credit went to Julius guards, 
who were former top assassins. It just so happened that last night, because Julius was sensing his death, he freed them and gave them what he promised. Anyway, the magnificent building was a confusing death trap meant to dwindle the number of enemies that dared to infiltrate the place. And around the fourth and fifth floors, there were even more types of surprising hallways for intruders. It all depends on one's luck for them to make it back safely. One might think that the stairways were the only confusing thing, but that was a lie. The floors were made like a maze. So one could find themselves in a loop if they didn't know the way since everything looked exactly the same. And coupled with the fact that these people had never been on these floors, many hadn't even successfully arrived at the stairways located at the end of the maze-like floors. Winston looked at Ulrich curiously. How do you know the way? Are you sure that the path we're taking is right? Heh. What does it matter to you? Didn't you say that you weren't following me? So if you don't like it, then go your own way. You. Why do you always have to be so bossy? I'm just asking a simple question. None of us have ever gone this high. So isn't it fitting that I ask? And who the hell said that I was following you? Ulrich quickly glimpsed at Winston, and soon, his eyes lit up. This was the opportunity he was waiting for. Instantly, he began his performance by acting anxiously. And as they advanced, he kept leaving the massive group to several dead ends, all the while still making sure he chose dead ends that were relatively closer to the stairways. The group was too large and would only be disastrous for him going on. So why not cut the numbers down? Ulrich hastily led the gang through the wrong path in the maze that came to a dead end before intentionally smiling bitterly and raising his voice for all to hear. You're right. None of us have ever made it this far. So if all of us are charging together, we might not even have a chance to escape. Have you all forgotten what this place is called? And how dangerous it's said to be? For all we know, we might be walking straight into a trap. This time, it was a dead end. But what about the next time? The gang, as if struck by lightning, seemed to have been enlightened by his words. The gang was made up of his men, Winston's, Joffrey's, Osseus, Bulkington, Eldora's, and Bonavir's men who had survived till now. And at this moment, no one cared about anyone's identity as their current enemy seemed too mighty. Their only thoughts were to escape. And listening to Ulrich's words and seeing how they constantly came to dead ends, they felt that he was right. If they kept slowing down like this, the enemy would undoubtedly catch up to them. So they had to take their own path. Instantly, they started whispering and sneaking out of the group to find their one way. That's right. No one has ever gone this far. And don't forget that even my master, Prince Joffrey, and the rest had never made it this far. So following Prince Ulrich, as equivalent to following a blind person. Just look at how many dead ends we've come to. I agree. And I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like we've passed along this path not too long ago. I was thinking the same thing. Hey, I think we've already passed the right path because the more we advance, the more stuck we are. I think we should have taken a right turn six hallways back. My heart tells me that that was the right path. Come, let's go now. Hey, am I the only one who thinks that we should have used the sixth staircase to ascend rather than the fourth? Now just look at it. We're stuck here with all hallways meeting at a dead end. F asterisk CK. I'm going back before it's too late. Maybe the enemy hasn't arrived at the staircases yet. So maybe I can quickly change my fate. Yeah, I'm with you. Let's do that. But, just one question though. Do you remember how to get there? Of course I do. I'll just do the opposite of what we did come in. After leaving the stairs, didn't we go straight? Turn left, left, right, left, left, right? Eh, I thought we went straight. Left, left, right, left left, right? Wait, why are your directions ring from mine? And why do you have twelve directions while I have nine? In a flash, the massive gathering quickly reduced in number, just like Ulrich had wanted. If hundreds of people kept following him, the enemy might discover the escape route quicker than expected. Why? Because the massive group kept attracting other lost people, and the group would just keep growing and growing. And by the time the enemy came by, some might still be trying to escape through the route. But why was this a problem since he was long gone? The reason was simple. Because the enemy didn't know the escape route's final destinations, the enemy might first tighten security around the palace perimeters to ensure that no one got in or out. 
and if the route led very far out of the palace, then there was nothing they could do. Nonetheless, they would first strengthen their vigilance on the gates and around the palace so that the path did lead to any place within the palace. Then, they would catch him. This was where the enemy had an advantage. From Julius' words, the distance between this building and the furthest building that the route led to could be covered on horseback within 50 minutes. And if it were on a carriage, it would be an hour and a few minutes since carriages slowed down a bit. So imagine him doing this distance on foot underground, which might even take over two hours for him to do. Mind you, this was to get to the building close to the gate and not actually the gates. So he would still need more time to strategize and escape the gates, which was just 15 minutes away from the escape route exit. Anyway, if the enemy didn't know about the escape routes and thinks that he's still hiding within the building, it could buy him a lot of time. Right now, the enemy was still fighting and taking care of Winston, Joffrey, and everyone's men. So by the time they finished up and decided to search for him properly, he might be a long way gone. Just the time spent searching for him would be a lot. And when they realized he was in the building, they might send word to the gates. But that would still take over an hour on horseback for the message to get across. So he might have already escaped successfully and left the palace. Now, if the enemy discovered the escape route fast, then by the time he pops out of the end of the escape route, they might already be looking for him around the palace's gates and perimeters. With many finally leaving, Ulrich secretly smiled calmly. Winston looked at him deep in thought before scoffing and staying put. What a joke. At this moment, his I.Q. was online. The others didn't know Ulrich well, but he did, at least to some extent. And the one thing he knew was that Ulrich would never make decisions that would put himself in danger. He might sacrifice others, but never himself. No matter what Ulrich said to deter him, he knew that this brother of his had a plan. And sure enough, after a while, the bastard started acting seriously. But this time, there were only ten people in their group. Everyone else had gone off to find their one way. With that, they kept advancing until they successfully climbed the final stairway leading to the sixth floor. Seeing the confident Ulrich, Winston felt that they might just be able to pull it off. But just after climbing, they heard the echoed sounds of people wailing terribly. F asterisk CK. The enemy was close. Ulrich, Winston, and the rest ran as fast as possible while trying not to call attention to the other people fleeing the scene towards the many stairways in confusion. Of course, some people below the stairway were still within the massive. Even though they could see the glorious stairways, they were still a little far away from it. So with the enemy closer to them than the stairways, they had no choice but to fight back. Ulrich thought of them as chess pieces to stall the enemy. And while Ulrich and Winston were in their own dilemma, around the third stairway, another dramatic scene was slowly unfolding. So far, Landon, Henry, and a few others were the only soldiers that crossed the third floor. Why? Because Landon was leading them while following Ulrich through the system's monitor screen. His team wasn't overly concerned with taking down all the enemies, as they sometimes avoided it in an attempt to catch up to Ulrich. In short, one could say that they would shoot a few, scare the others off, and continue on. They left the other enemies to the other teams and soldiers who would take their time to explore the place properly. To put it simply, none of the soldiers or Henry's men knew of the dangers within the building yet. But, they were about to find out. Din 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 din. While running across the ridiculously massive hall, Lieutenant Vlad looked at the stairways thoughtfully. Squad leader Angie, take your squad and head towards the first stairway. Nick, Crema, Torto, Peter, Quino, you take your teams towards the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth stairway. And I'll take the seventh. Now go. Yes, sir. With that, they broke from their formation with everyone following their squad leaders and making their way towards their designated stairway. Pew! Vlad shot the person ahead of him on the stairs and swiftly his body to the side, making him fall off the stairs. Another in front of him turned around to punch him, but he ducked and punched the guy's belly, making him hit those in front like dominoes. Way ahead, some who were caught by surprise were accidentally thrown off the very tall stairway. To put it into perspective, one could imagine an ancient massive cathedral church created in medieval times, and imagine several stairways shooting from the bottom of the cathedral to a distance that was very close to the ceiling. 
and the stairways were so narrow that any slip-up could make one fall straight down, giving them a fatal injury. And depending on how they fell, some might die. Ah! Crack! The man fell face down and cracked his forehead on the hard floor. But did anyone care? Nope. They were busy trying to escape. And besides, the man wasn't the first person to fall. Just like that, Vlad and his team fought their way up as if they were struggling to battle their way towards the heavens. They ducked, punched, shot, and attacked those ahead mercilessly while throwing their bodies over the narrow stairway. And when they were two-third through, an enemy discovered a bucket filled with a mixture of grease and water kept at the side of the balcony. All this time, everyone had been running for their dear lives and didn't have time to think of what could be inside the bucket. But now, an enemy discovered it and decided to send those on the stairway, along with the soldiers packing. Ha ha ha, look, look, it's greasy water. They probably got it from the kitchen pots after a good meal. There are even bits of food in it. Brother, do you think that we can use this to slow down these intruders? Ah, why didn't I think of that? This way, we'll be able to buy more time for ourselves. But what about the others on the stairs? TSK, what does that have to do with us? Our masters are dead, so it's everyone for themselves. You're right. With that, the mischievous duo, who were previously whispering, suddenly ran to the stairs anxiously as if they wanted to tell the person stepping onto the balcony some sort of secret, but who would have known that they would kick the person back and later throw the greasy water on the stairs. You bastards! The person who was kicked quickly used his reflex to hold onto both sides of the stairs with his hands. Phew! He was saved. Or so he thought, because in the next seconds, the duo threw half of the greasy water on the stairs and another half towards the man's face making some of the greasy water fall and coat the sides of the stairs, making it slippery. F asterisk CK. His hands began to slip as he quickly lost control of his grip. He tried to hold on for his dear life while glaring at the duo who ran away into the dark path ahead. But no matter how hard he tried, he still ended up falling backwards. And those behind him who had thought that he was okay earlier on almost cried when he knocked them hard. B-O-M B-O-M. Instantly, the entire stairway became chaotic. It was like an avalanche, with some people rolling down the stairs, bowling pin style, while others got thrown over. Vlad, who noticed the problem, quickly took action. Safety bungee cords. Now, like lightning, Vlad took out his emergency bungee cord and secured it along the sides of the stairs. And the person behind him secured his own on one of the ends of Vlad's cord. Just like so, Everyone did the same and even tied one of the cords around Henry's men to secure them too. From there, everyone quickly fought off all falling men by deflecting them off the stairs. And when no more enemies were raining on them, they carefully advanced until they reached a spot that was too greasy. Vlad looked at it thoughtfully. So this was the cause of the accident earlier on? Well, this was not a problem to them, as they carefully advanced as if they were rock climbing while using the cords. And soon, they were all safely on the balcony. Now, it was time to enter the seemingly dark tunnel. Everyone, stay vigilant. They all turned on their flashlights from the latest military wearable arm guard gear that acts as an arm shield, can release pepper spray, has an inbuilt taser, and so on. With their torches on, some began pointing like Buzz Lightyear in Toy Story. They pointed up, down, and sideways quietly. And so far, they hadn't heard anyone's voice or seen anything out of the ordinary. But soon, all that would change. One of the men close to Vlad stepped on one of the lightweight planks, snapping it and sending him straight down. Snap. Schwoop. Mandel. Everyone got anxious now. The air grew tense, and their hearts beat so loud that it was about to pop out of their chests. They could feel the air in their chests swelling up into a ball of anxiousness, for tear of what would happen to their comrade down below. What's going to happen to him? Everyone, we have no time to waste. Charlie, I'll leave the team for you to lead. Inform all other teams about the dangers in these hallways. There might be more trapdoors ahead. And looking at the broken pieces here, these beautifully painted wooden boards aren't here for decoration. That's probably why the place is kept dark. While I'm gone, watch out for other traps. This place isn't as easy as it seems. Jennifer, Sarah, Luke, Asher, Geo. 
You four follow me. We're going to save Warrant Officer Mandel, right? With that, the team dropped right into the wild without delay. They had to hurry. Who knew what dangers were lurking below? Shoot. Bam. The gang slid along the spiral hole and landed on a pile of hay that cushioned their fall. One could say that the enemy was being kind. But that could only be true if one didn't factor the 50 hangles within the place. It seemed these hangles weren't the only animals or creatures here because they could hear the sounds of other ferocious beasts close by. It looked like not all traps lead here. And the reason why hay was placed there was probably to ensure that those that fell didn't die from the fall. Why? Because Julius and his predecessors wanted all intruders to face a far gruesome death of having their bodies getting torn limb from limb right before their very eyes. The pain would no doubt be unbearable. Where exactly was this? Was this in a basement level below the ground floor? Bam. Instantly, Vlad and the rest got up from the hay and pointed their guns and the many hangles that stared at them hungrily with saliva dripping from their mouths. It just so happened that since last night, they haven't eaten a single thing since Julius retired his private assassins. After all, it was the job of the future heir, aka Ulrich, to get his most trusted men to take over the responsibility. Bottom line, these hangles weren't fed yet until free food started descending from above. Sure, they had already started eating a few unfortunate people who fell, but with 50 of them here, it was barely enough. Of course, some enemies struggled and managed to team up and kill or heavily injure six hangles, but they still ended up at a disadvantage. Instantly, Vlad and the gang spotted Mandel, who was backed up on a corner, shooting the hangles and hiding behind him were two injured enemy knights who had almost been torn to shreds by these beasts. Jennifer, Sarah, you two focus on my left. Luke, Asher, you'll take care of the right. Geo, focus on our backs, and I'll focus on the front. Move. With that, the team dashed towards Mandel while taking care of all the hangles that they could. But these beasts were indeed troublesome below. Like lions, some sneakily crouched down in an attempt to pounce by surprise. And after Geo ran out of bullets, right on cue, one jumped onto him in an attempt to chew his head off. Geo quickly placed his arm armor gear over his head, and the bastard chewed on it ferociously while staring at him coldly. Seeing that it couldn't bite through the gear, the creature raised its paws and unsheathed its sharp claws. It was about to slice the shit out of its prey, but all of a sudden, its despicable prey threw something into its mouth. Plop. What was that? The hangle's eyes turned red, and his entire mouth and body felt hot. A cloud of white smoke started coming out of its nostrils, and his belly felt like it was undergoing a battle for survival. F asterisk CK. What did this human feed it? It opened its mouth and panted like a dog as it tried to calm the burning sensation from within. And what exactly did Geo give it? Well, it was tear gas. That's right. Geo dropped a can of tear gas through its massive throat and neck, who asked it to keep biting his arm. The poor hangle felt like it was in hell, as it desperately wanted water. It began sweating heavily all within these few seconds, and Geo wasted no time in reloading his bullets and shouting the damn thing with his silencer. Pew. He could have tossed it using the built in taser in his arm guard, but he just wanted to see the effects of swallowing tear gas. And so just like that, Vlad and his team focused on dealing with these ferocious creatures, all the while alerting those above of their situation below. Meanwhile, Landon, Henry, and his crew had finally got caught with Ulrich and Winston. Damn it. How did these bastards know the way? Yurik carefully ran while grumbling angrily. Father said that only he knew the way. So why was it that Henry was able to catch up to him with no prior knowledge? Although the distance between them was somewhat far, Henry and his men were catching up to them at a very alarming speed. Firstly, they had been battling for a very long time before Henry showed up. So they were tired, and their bodies were sore. In short, this wasn't their peak conditions. At least in Ulrich's mind, he contributed it to that. Landon squinted his eyes and looked at those around. Everyone, climb on. I'll be much faster. Eh. Henry and his right-hand men felt like they heard things wrong. Did you just ask us to climb on you? Do you know what you're talking about? Brother, I admit that you're powerful, but what you're asking for is impossible, all right? 
While Henry and his right-hand man looked at Landon in disbelief, the other six soldiers didn't show any emotions. They, on the other hand, just did as they were told, as if this was just a walk in the park for them. And right before Henry's shocked eyes, Landon held one's hands and threw him over his shoulder. One, two, three, four, five, six. Like a magic trick, all six were on Landon, who by the way had no expression of pain on his face. It looked like he was carrying a hat or something light. All six were in a manner that wouldn't let them fall. The whole thing made Henry doubt his life. What did he just see? Landon didn't give Henry any time to think as he grabbed his hand and threw him onto the pile alongside Henry's right-hand man. What a joke. He didn't want this damn thing to carry on for long. So he wanted to stop Ulrich before he reached the secret escape route. It was time to finally end this battle once and for all. He had a wedding to catch, damn it. Everyone, while on tight. With that, Landon boosted his speed to 50% and quickly caught up to his targets. The wind force blowing against Henry's face left him in a daze. Was his brother running as fast as a horse, if not faster? Bro, forget it. From today, I'm your biggest fan. Din 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 din. Ulrich and Winston turned their heads and almost puked blood from what they were seeing. You can still run at that speed while carrying so many people? What are you, a monster? A thought popped into Ulrich's mind, making his head swell. Brother, you wouldn't be the fairy godmother, right? Brother, you wouldn't be the fairy godmother, right? Ulrich anxiously looked at the masked man who was gaining on them as if he was some ferocious beast, all the while carrying so many sturdy men on him. F asterisk CK, wasn't this too magical? What sort of training regime did the masked man undergo to get to this level? For a moment, he thought that the man was going so fast that he could see a trail of dust left by the masked man still floating in the air. Winston was also amazed as well. Both gritted their teeth and tried their best to outrun the crazy man. But how could it be that easy? Din, 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 din. Like a vicious rhino, Landon ran while locking onto his targets without mercy. And when he was close enough at a distance he wanted, he slowed down considerably. Powen, Gregor, Alice, Susie, get off. Yes. With that, all four jumped off carefully while making sure that Henry and those who they supported earlier on were secured. From there, Landon picked up the pace again and this time. He overtook Ulrich and Winston before stopping facing them head-on in the hallway. Great. Now, they had blocked the front and the back of the vast hallway. So if they wanted to escape, they had to go through them. Without tasting any time, Henry and the rest understood what to do and jumped off Landon. This was the final battle. There were nine of them, while Ulrich's group consisted of ten. But that wouldn't be an issue. I'll handle Ulrich while you take on Winston. Leave the others to our men. We have to end this fast. Right. Henry replied while nodding before unsheathing his sword. Winston frowned in disdain after listening to their conversation. Did the masked man think that he was weak? Is that why he sent a nobody to take him on? And what did they mean by we have to end this fast? As if he, Winston Tudor was weak. Even though Winston felt like he should be happy that it was the shrimp that would be fighting him, his ego still got hurt because of how much self-worth the masked man gave him. Ulrich, on the other hand, turned serious. He was a fool. He couldn't see that this masked person was probably a highly skilled assassin. But how did Henry manage to buy him over? Ulrich knew that if he wanted to defeat the guy, he had to use his head and concentrate without any distractions. Little tricks won't work with him like he did with Winston and the rest. The man was the real deal. Landon calmly stepped forward and didn't even bother taking out a weapon. Ulrich drew his sword and took several steps back while coming up with his plan. He didn't know why, but he felt like his back was chilly just from looking deep into Landon's eyes. Nima, what exactly is this man? When Landon walked ahead, he would take several steps back. But soon, Landon jumped playfully, and Ulrich jumped backwards one step as well. Landon jumped again and started humming while making Ulrich anxious every growing minute. For this, Ulrich was very helpless as well. Are you attacking or not? Why must you tease my nerves, almost giving me a heart attack? Ulrich clenched his sword with his sweaty palms tightly while looking intently at Landon's every move. Suddenly, out of nowhere, 
Landon charged at him like lightning. Bam. F asterisk CK. Too fast. Ulrich, who thought he would be able to catch all of Landon's move, found himself thrown to the wall by the masked man's deadly punch. Ah, his belly. Damn it. It hurts so bad. What were his hands made of? Iron? Cough, 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 cough. He struggled to get up while coughing loudly. Where was he? He quickly looked around and found that the masked man was still standing in the same spot as if he wasn't worried that he would escape. Ulrich realized that he would have a better chance if he attacked first than waiting for death. So he gritted his teeth and rushed forward with his sword firmly in his hand. Landon saw this and smiled. Swoosh. The sword whistled in the air as Ulrich continuously tried to cut his opponent down. But the bastard kept dodging with a call expression on his face as if he could predict his every move. Soon, Landon dipped to the floor and tripped him. Bam! Feeling the impending crisis, he hastily stood up again. But by the time he raised his head, his eyes opened wide in shock. All he could see were a pair of legs coming at him at full speed. He tried to dodge the attack, but there it was too late. Bam! Ugh! He hit the wall again, causing him to spit out a mouthful of blood that wanted to erupt out of him. Plah. Damn it. Why is it like this? Unlike last time, Landon didn't give him any time to rest. He grabbed Ulrich, carried him high up in the air, and quickly went down on one knee, just like King in Tekken. Ah. Ulrich was known directly on that knee, almost snapping his back like a twig. In short, if Landon had used for force, he would have snapped. Ah. It hurt. He felt utterly numb as he found that his body didn't seem to be obeying him. No matter how hard he struggled, he couldn't get up. Of course, Landon hadn't broken his spine but had inflicted a sharp amount of pain in the area that would require him to stay still for at least two weeks before he could get up again. Ulrich lay on the ground convincing and spitting blood from his internal injuries while holding his chest tightly. Again, was the masked man's knee made of iron? For a moment, he almost saw his life flashing before his very eyes. Those who saw him looked at him pitifully. Henry also thought that his situation was pitiful. Brother Landon, why do I think that Ulrich is so miserable? His pale face, coupled with his expressions, made it seem like Landon was bullying him. If Landon knew his thoughts, he would undoubtedly be speechless. How did he end up being the bad guy now? The fight didn't take long as the soldiers and Henry's right-hand man dealt with the rest in a flash. And after they were done, they stood by and allowed Henry to take down Winston himself, while Landon focused on Ulrich. Hey, when the bosses decided to lay, what else could they do but watch? And so, just like that, the battle for the throne had come to an end with Henry emerging victoriously. But Winston and Ulrich were very much unwilling, especially Ulrich. Why? He was the rightful her to the throne. So why was everyone fighting to take what belonged to him? And why should Henry have such an able person by his side? You. Who are you? Why would you help him? Landon smiled while calmly looking at Winston and Ulrich. Who am I? Well, you could say that I'm his fairy godmother. As for why I decided to help him, you too can assume the positions of his wicked stepsisters. Now, does that answer your question? No, it doesn't. After giving Ulrich internal injuries that leave him bedridden for two weeks, Landon did the same to Winston, who had already been defeated by Henry. This way, even if they wanted to flee, they would have no way of doing so, except they could crawl faster than a person could run. Without a doubt, they would be heavily guarded at all times. But it was better knowing that they wouldn't be able to go anywhere. Landon had asked if Henry wanted them dead, but Henry refused. Killing them created more problems for him than keeping them alive. Why? Because their mothers and maternal clans were still very much alive and kicking. Killing them would give too much pressure for him to handle. In the end, Landon would leave him to rule Deiferous, and the amount of cleanup that he had to do was a lot. Like it or not, his men weren't that skilled to handle such high-end enemies like those in the Empire, especially those that belonged to the Council. That's why he was glad when Landon decided to take Ulrich and Winston as prisoners. This way, these forces would focus their attention on Baymard in hopes of rescuing the duo. Their mothers would first use all the power at their disposal to rescue them, which in a way, kept Henry safe for the time being. Novelstoday.com 
For sure, Henry was worried a bit that he was putting Baymard in danger. But after seeing Landon's reassuring smile and remembering the scene from earlier on outside the city, he fully believed that Baymard was a haven. That said, Landon wouldn't leave him dry and hanging. Tomorrow, another team should be arriving in the capital. And that team will stay with Henry for a month before switching with another team again. The soldiers here will keep Henry's enemies in check and assist him in taking down or tracking whatever was needed to be done. At the same time, so as not to draw attention to themselves, Henry's men will take over guard duties around the city gates at night so that when the Bay Mardian vehicles drive in around 2 or 3 a.m., it won't cause any issues. And the vehicles, once marked in the innermost private training courtyard meant for only the king, would be kept away from prying eyes. No maids or workers will be tasked to go in and clean up the place. The soldiers would stay there, clean the ace themselves and also do whatever it is they had to do there. In short, their operations would very well remain hidden unless some people were sneaking around 2 or 3 a.m. and happen to see them when they drive in or leave the city. Again, once the next group of people come over tomorrow, those within Henry's men who got chosen for training in Baymard would follow him out of the city alongside the soldiers. Another thing to note was that before the battle, Landon had told Henry all about the Temple of Dragmas. With their defeat, the team will bring some of the treasures and findings from the temple hideout to the palace at night. Additionally, amongst those coming in, the team were a few military secretaries that worked in the barracks. They'll come over and teach Henry and a few of his men how to correctly record and look over things. Unlike other empires, Henry's would be the hardest and most challenging one to change because of the rules followed by those in power. The majority of commoners were ready for change, but the main problem lay with the wealthy. So Henry would no doubt face oppression, especially from the council members. Deiphorus would now undergo a massive change, making this period the most dangerous of all. That's why Landon couldn't start ship transportation and other things yet. He decided that only when the danger period lowered to a certain degree would he do so. In short, there were a lot of things that Landon had to iron out with Henry before leaving tomorrow night. But for now, they had to clean up the ace and adequately understand the building's strange dynamic. Landon had already scanned through it with the system, but he decided to let everyone explore and discover things for themselves. Even Henry was shocked by the discoveries. No wonder his father never allowed anyone further. The place was a real hellhole. Any slight misstep, and it was game over. The soldiers also found the place where the hangles and other deadly creatures were kept and Landon decided to buy them and take the animals to Baymard, which made Henry even happier to get rid of them. Feeding people to animals was a vicious act to him, and who knows, one day, his men or himself might be the one to fall through the holes since they haven't mastered the building's layout yet. It would be foolish to die from one's own trap. In short, Henry felt like the building should be closed and shouldn't be used until he renovated and changed some things. What if in future, his son or daughter falls through those narrow stairways and dies. He could continue forbidding them here, and they're just like his father did. But at times, that didn't work. He heard that when Julius was young, one of his siblings went in there and never come back ever since. So who knew if the person died in the end? Children were sneaky. And at times, they were very clever and could bypass even ADULTS. Maybe his paternal grandfather, Julius' father, didn't have tight security in the place during the day, allowing the child to sneak in, but since then, no one found that child. So who knows if such a thing would happen to him? What if a traitor who was by his side decided to push him down the stairs instead? For safety, something's had to go or get changed. The place was called the Building of Absolute Death, which brought about the ends of both royals and intruders. There was even a ruler several decades ago who died mysteriously in the place. So who knew if he fell on his own trap? That's why Henry decided to change a few things about the building. The escape route remains, but the traps were a little too much. And so the place would be closed until further notice. With that, they had successfully dealt with all major issues for today. And all that was left was for Henry to get crowned. Finally, he could leave. It was time to attend Santa's wedding. Ding. Congratulations on completing the second side mission saving King Sirius and uprooting the Temple of Dragmas from both Yodin and Deiphorus. Landon was taken aback by the sudden alert. The last base somewhere, either in Yodin or Deiphorus, 
was probably being taken care of right at this very minute. Good. Ha ha ha. He felt a little lighter all of a sudden, as if a heavy burden had been taken off his shoulder. He wasn't a fool. He knew that some of the members of these temples were probably spies in the capital and other major cities, leaving their lives like ordinary people, without even knowing that the temple had been uprooted from the face of both empires. So now, all he had to do was find the list of members and track them down. And that list would probably be within the location where their leader was. Well, since the mission was successful, it meant that even their leader's base was taken care of. So now, they had to look for the list of spies around and surprise them. As he said, these people probably didn't know what was going on because, like it or not, traveling would take weeks or months for word to go back and forth from the spies to their masters. So the soldiers could use this against them and pinpoint them before they got an idea of what was truly going on. These spies might come together and start the whole temple thing again. Or worse, they might create a new cult. No one had time to clean up another major incident. So it was best to nip this in the bud. More still, while at sea before coming here, one of the Navy ships that went out on the mission to Yoden relayed a message to his ship saying that when they attacked the main base, the temple's leader wasn't there. They only found his office and even several secret compartments with documents and whatnot. But he wasn't there. Landon's bet was that he was probably someone within one of the neighboring cities, towns, or even villages close to the base. Most likely, he lived a regular life outside the base. As the leader, he probably wore a mask at all times while in the base because he didn't want his identity revealed. So outside the base, no one knew what he truly looked like. This was also for his security as well. Only himself and the central elders wore masks while in the base. Everyone else typically showed their faces, or at least that's the information the soldiers gathered. More still, in a secret room within his office, they found a list of all members and several portraits of them too. Each painting had at most 20 people painted on it, and a document behind the painting explaining who was who from left to right. In short, even finding these portraits was an intricate feat because within the secret room, there was a tough-to-find hole that the men had to crawl through like rabbits, which led them to another room. But there was more. In that room, there was also a trap door, which led to a secret tunnel that took through a 15-minute walk to an underground chamber filled with all these things. All this just to hide the documents of all members. Anyway, from what he got, the leader was still wasn't found, which was severe since he could rally up the whole thing again. That's why Landon felt the need for them to find the spies who were around the empires. They already knew what the spies looked like and also knew what jobs they took on, so they might as well catch them. Landon nodded while listening to the system's notification before scrunching up his face again. System, why haven't you notified me on completing this particular side mission yet? Host, but you haven't completed the mission yet. The mission was to put Henry Tudor on the throne. But from the system's status inquiry, Henry Tudor is still a prince. So you're saying that I won't be able to complete this mission until Henry gets officially crowned? Yes, host. Why is your memory so bad? Isn't the situation the same with the now King William Barn, whom the host placed on the throne months back? Landon knew it, but he was just trying his luck, okay? Who knows, maybe the system will be kind to him once and consider the mission completed. After all, he wished that he could get the alert before he left for Santa's wedding but he knew that it would be near impossible. Henry had some cleaning up to do before he could sit in the crown. Several powerful nobles would oppose him and might even want the crown to change hands to them. In their eyes, Henry was a weak prey that they could deal with. So without other stronger contestants like Duke Osseus, Ulrich, and so on, now, every Tom and Harry would think that they could snatch up the crown. Thinking about the future enemies, Landon couldn't help but shed some tears for them. Why go against the heavens? The only result is death. With that, Landon closed his eyes and fell asleep. The night passed by in a flash, and before he knew it, it was a brand new day. Today was his last day in the capital. Now, it was time to draw attention to himself. Yesterday, they purposefully let the word out to the maids and butlers about what happened to Osseus and those that they met dead, because that was the truth. There was no need to make people believe that Henry killed Joffrey and the rest when he didn't. Doing so will only incur the wrath of Osseus' family and the rest. And to make the news more believable, yesterday during battle, they did allow two or three escape at the start of the fight. 
and they even yelled out the words, Fire the black powder, making them believe that the force they felt earlier on came from black powder. Of course, the few that escaped were those that had their masters killed. None of Ulrich and Winston's men were allowed to flee. Well, it was easy to spot who was who because of their battle uniforms. Anyway, those that escaped would undoubtedly tell their master's family of how their master fell, which has nothing to do with Henry. As for Ulrich and Winston's families, well, today, he and Henry took out the time to invite them over. In an estate outside the palace. Crash. A porcelain cup shattered on the walls, frightening the guard who delivered the letter. He received the note at the gate and passed it along, thinking that it was news from the sun. But now, he started to doubt it. Mother Lillian's body was boiling in rage when she read the note. Last night, an injured man had already reported to her that her daughter, Eldora, had died in the hands of Joffrey. But the thing that made her somewhat happy was that her daughter was able to kill him too. At least she avenged herself. Nonetheless, the person also said that Henry had shown up on the scene, taking advantage of the battle like a coward. But Lillian wasn't worried because she knew that 30,000 or more of her son's men should be arriving soon. Her son was, and has always been a smart one who has lost his sense of rationality. And even though she was worried, she still had absolute confidence that someone like Henry couldn't take down her son. Also, when she heard the rough estimate of how many people came with Henry, she almost laughed at his stupidity. But who could be thought that he would be the victor? What did the bastard mean by inviting her to the palace? Even though she felt that it was a trap, she knew deep down that she had to go. If she didn't, who knew what they would do to her child? Right now, if she wanted to gather up forces and meet Ulrich's supporters, and even her father, it would take time. One should know that this was still the morning base of the late King Julius, and some people would refuse to do anything because they didn't want the results to affect their political image. Who knows if their enemy could use this against them and say they were treacherous? This was a sacred period that any believe to be very spiritual and holy for the crossing of one's soul. More still, even if everyone did agree to help her, they would undoubtedly have to spend a day or so thinking, or coming up with a plan before just marching over there like moving targets. There was no way out of it. The timing was terrible. But she had no choice but to go. After all, the letter said that she should be here before noon. So who knows what will happen to her son if she's late? How can they bully a widow this much? Lillian's face turned black with rage. What are you standing there for? Hurry, gather all the guards now. We are going to the palace. Just like that, the seemingly calm morning turned chaotic with everyone running around the place like crazy. And such a scene was also very similar to what was happening in another estate. The elegant Willow Estate. Can you all move it? My son is in peril, and you're busy strolling around? Get the men ready now. We are going to the palace to see second Prince Winston. Things were already in motion, and all Landon and Henry did was wait for his guests. This should be fun. Today, the streets were empty, and the entire lace looked deserted as many locked themselves indoors to mourn for the loss of their king. The once quiet and deserted roads, now had several horses and carriages, were charging on it at full speed without a care in the world. They went so fast that even the carriages seemed to be flying, as they constantly jumped and against the uneven roads. Without a doubt, the speed of the horses would damage the carriage wheels at this rate. Those in the carriages were in the worst state ever, as their carriages kept throwing them left, right and center in the confined space. Their hair and outfits that their maids had neatly prepared now looked disheveled as if they got out of bed. But did those within them care? No. Faster. The women in their individual carriages yelled all through the way to the palace, as their anxiety and fear had gotten the best of them. What did they do to their sons? They prayed to the heavens that not a single body part should be missing from them, or God so help them. They would show the enemy what happened when one goes against a mother. Hiya, 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 hiya. Faster, faster. Can't you make the horses go any faster? The coachman had black lines on his forehead when he heard the screaming voice from behind him. Ever since they left, the first queen had been screaming at the top of her voice. It was truly a miracle that her voice hadn't turned hoarse at all, because he wouldn't mind if it did. Was that bad? Hiya, hiya, hiya. Halfway through the ride, Lillian spotted second queen Kyla's entourage 
and instantly knew that they were both in the same pot of soup. It seemed like the reasonable thing to do was to put aside their differences and work together. Maybe not. Because right now, these ladies had turned the whole thing into a race, with Lillian winning. And finally, they were at the palace. My queen, please, let me arrange your hair. You shut up. Who has time for that? Get out of my way. The maids who followed along were very helpless in this matter and could only watch their masters force their way through the place like angry peak. Ah, chaos. The women seemed to forget their pedigree because even now, they moved alongside each other, pushing one another with their bums while moving forth. Your royal highnesses, can you both pay attention to your status? When you get judged, won't I be the one blamed for my incompetence in allowing you divulge in such acts? Sigh. It was truly a hard, hard, hard job to be an attending maid. Landon and Henry watched the ladies from the window and chuckled. Your stepmothers are certainly something else. You have no idea, but can you blame them? We have their sons, after all. It's time to give them a warm welcome. Both women hurriedly made their way into the building and were quickly sent to the largest grand hall in the palace that they were more than familiar with. This was the hall where all palace ball parties and social gatherings were conducted. And at times, some meetings would also be held here since there was a fixed massive thrown up there. Looking at Henry, who was seated on the throne comfortably, their hearts sank deeper. It should have been their sons who sat there, not some puny, worthless kid that they used to belittle years back. Even if they were displeased, they dared not show it. After all, their sons were in his hands. Still, they didn't bow before him because he was still a prince, the fifth prince, for that matter. The palace hierarchy rules were simple. The first queen and her children were above the rest and couldn't bow to those below them. The second queen and her family had to only the king and the first queen's family. Just like that, the hierarchy continued. So even if they had another child now, that child would still be superior to the other wives beneath them, meaning that child wouldn't have to greet those below him first. Instead, the other wives would have to bow and greet him, her, every time they saw them. That said, Henry was so far behind and should be greeting them since he was still a prince and not the king. Henry chuckled and didn't care for their disdainful nature. Mothers, I only called you here to inform for one thing, and that's to let you see your sons for the very last time in sling. Without waiting for him to finish talking, the ladies unsheathed the swords of the men closest to them in a flash. The F asterisk CK? They honestly moved so fast that one would have thought that they were assassins. Don't mess with a woman's child. Their anger had already erupted like a volcano. You shut up. What do you mean by seeing my Ulrich for the last time? Do you want to die? You dare touch my Winston? Ha ha. Boy, you are too young to play power games with me. If you try it again, I'll show you that you are still a little boy who cannot ejaculate with his eyes open. Henry felt very insulted at this moment. As for the last comment, well, as Dia for warriors, it was believed that when pleasuring oneself, real men react and reach ecstasy with their eyes wide open. Only real men could keep it open, while weak men closed their eyes. Landon on the side felt very embarrassed and awkward too. Ladies, we are talking about your sons, so why are you shifting your insults somewhere else? They just wanted to make Henry feel like he wasn't a real man, or rather, they wanted him to know that he was a very weak deifer. But was this really the best time? Lillian and Kyla's hearts sank when they recalled what Henry said. Their bodies started trembling, their hearts speeded up, and their eyes burned with a murderous glint. Damn it! They really wanted to kill this good-for-nothing son of A B asterisk asterisk C. As for Henry, he aloofly waited for them to lash out as if he had all the time in the world. Aunties, I wasn't finished, so I will advise you to hear everything out before disrupting me again. Henry said coldly. As a future king, he had to act the part, and Landon released some of his aura to help him out, which made the woman shut their mouths unwillingly. Now that we have some peace, I hope that we can maintain this atmosphere till we finish our little meeting. After all, as royal members, it is most unbecoming of you both to yell loudly like shrews. It is most unbecoming. Your head. Who are you lecturing? You're the shrew. Your stupid dead mother is a shrew. 
Both women cursed inwardly while maintaining a cold expression too. Henry looked at them and smiled. As I said, before I was rudely interrupted, today will be the last time you see your sons in the capital city. Silence. Eh. So their sons wouldn't get executed or put to death. A flicker of hope emerged in their hearts, lessening their anger and anxiety a bit. At least the brat had a conscience. In the way, no matter where their sons were, they would gather up their forces and save them. Now, they only needed to know what the bastard planned to do with them and where their babies would be sent to. But would the bastard give up the location that easily? For all they knew, he could be sending their sons to some faraway place as slaves. No, no matter what, they had to pry the information from the brat's mouth. How could they let their babies suffer? First and second mother, I know what you guys want to know. And in truth, I'll tell you where I intend to send your sons. You see, I have no intention to hide it because your sons won't be in my hands anymore. Someone else has stepped forward to take them. In fact, my sitting here comfortably was thanks to my men, as well as that person and his people. So as of tomorrow, your sons will no longer be in my hands. That's why I called you here as my last action of kindness to you, to see your sons while you still can. What? A heavy load hung in the hearts of the women. Who was it? Who helped Henry take down their sons? Was it Minister Roderick? Or was it Duke Campbell? Thousands and thousands of thoughts raced through their brains as they went through the list of powerful people in the empire. F asterisk CK. Who was it? They looked at Henry Anchioismi while registering the urge to shake the words out of his mouth faster. Boy, can't you speak any faster? At the same time, they perked their ears for fear of missing a single word from his mouth. Mothers, you don't have to think so much. I naturally have every intention to tell you. All right, then speak up. Who is it? The masked Landon stepped forward playfully. It's me. You, who? The ladies felt like their patience was running out with these people that loved to play the guessing game with them. You, who? The masked guy just said it was him. So? Were they supposed to know him magically, or something? There were thousands and thousands of wealthy within the continent, out of the millions of people. So who exactly was the masked man? Ladies, I can only tell you that I intend to stay here for a week to assist Henry deal with a few things. And after a week, I will be taking your sons with me to a very far away place out of Deiferous. As for seeing them again, of course, I will permit you to visit them whenever you feel like it. So, you ladies are welcome to visit them in Baymard anytime. Baymard? The ladies were taken aback. Yes, they did admit that the things from Baymard are eye-catching and even inspirational. But Baymard was more of a small market slash trading empire where everyone could do business freely. It was a weak empire sheltered by Corona and had to pay tithes and taxes to Corona to ensure protection. They even heard that yearly, Baymard carried half of its income and gave Corona to continue securing their safety. Such a place was no doubt weak compared to Deiferous. So why would Boehner dip their fingers into such dangerous waters? Could it be that they and Henry made some beneficial deal that would profit Baymard greatly? They probably got the Carinian Knights to assist in this battle too. Because how else would 30,000 of Ulrich's men and about 17,000 of Winston's backup forces be wiped out? It was a well-known fact that Baymard didn't have that many knights. In fact, Baymard had no knighthood academy. So they got aid from Corona to take care of those backup forces. And Henry probably marched into the capital with the not-so-big gang that their sons had in the palace. Not to talk of the fact that the bastard took advantage of everything and waited for everyone to start killing each other before swooping in and dealing with those that survived. Yes, everything made sense now. Henry alone couldn't take down their boys. He had help. Earlier on, they thought that their sons might be leaving the capital soon. But since the masked man would stay here for a week before leaving, this was their chance to gather up a few more people and strike before the seventh day. As for believing the masked man, of course, they did because it was a fact that Henry would face a lot of pressure if he ever wanted to take the throne. Not that they sympathized with him, but they desperately wanted to have hope that the masked man would stay out. Even they could see that Henry was still too weak to do it all alone like their sons. So the masked man's reasoning was convincing. Nonetheless, they would place spies around the palace when they went home to ensure their sons stayed here for a week. And in the meantime, 
they would do their best to save their sons within this period. Today was day one. Hickory, bring them out. Yes, your highness. With that, the women who were immersed in their thoughts instantly snapped out in a panic. They wouldn't have done anything to them, right? Sure enough, they did. The moment they saw their sons carried in with stretchers, their hearts broke and bled rivers of blood deep within their bodies. Seeing their once proud sons carried in on bamboo stretchers, their hearts shattered into fragments that were more numerous than the stars in the night sky. They stretched their hands in fear of their speculations. Did these bastards cripple their sons? Pang! Out of my way! Get out! They threw the swords in their hands and dashed forward, pushing their men who tried to protect them. They ran straight for their broken sons, who were now placed on the floor on top of their stretchers. Both Ulrich and Winston looked frighteningly pale, and the bandages around their injured body parts only made their conditions look worse. In truth, the soldiers had been treating them like patients, but both Winston and Ulrich hardly ate anything because they were still skeptical and thought there was poison in the dishes. If not for the fact that the soldiers had to pry open their mouths and force them to eat, they would probably starve to death. Ulrich and Winston dared to do this because they knew that their mothers would come to the rescue. After all, their maternal families were great clans, and their grandfathers alone would be able to save them. So they tried to hold on before that. And sure enough, their mothers were here. My baby, my baby, come. Tell mother who did this to you. Just point to the person, and that's all you have to do. My darling baby, don't worry, mother will avenge you. The women didn't care if Henry heard them because seeing their sons that looked half dead and wrapped like that made it hard for them to contain their emotions. The scene firmed their desire to rescue their sons even more. No matter what it took, they had to get them out of here. And so the women left the palace in a hast to make preparations. They sent spies to keep a lookout around the palace and also made their way to visit their fathers, the head of the clans and other influential supporters of their sons. Both mothers were in good fighting spirit. And by 11 p.m., one of the spies returned and told Kyla that there was no movement in the palace. Likewise, at midnight, Lillian's spies also informed her of the same thing. Anyway, the city gates closed at 10 p.m. So they knew that if the masked man had to leave, it would be before 10 p.m. Nonetheless, they still had the spies send their reports hours later, just to be sure. Of course, another batch of spies would watch everything throughout the night. But getting the reports of no movement at this time of the night made them sleep with a bit of peace of mind for now. It looks like the masked man did intend to leave after a week. Or so they thought because when they woke up the next day, another letter from the palace came their way. Apparently, it was from the masked man. Ladies, I'm sorry, but you see, something came up. So we had to leave last night. But I do look forward to your visit to Baymart. Bye-bye. Quick, gather the men and leave the city now. Chase after that bastard and bring my son back. That damn bastard. How dare he bully widows this much. Bastard. Swindler. Fraudster. SCU. Bag. Bastard. Both women cursed loudly in rage until they finally passed out. Bam! My queen! My queen! As they slowly lost consciousness, they couldn't help but want to slice the masked man into pieces. F asterisk CK. They had been had. Meanwhile, the culprit of it all was long gone, on his way to the wedding. Finally, he was done with this deiferous drama. On to the next. Landon watched everything from his bed and chuckled. Since they left last night with vehicles, how could it be easy for anyone to chase after them? Their only chance of seeing their sons was if they paid a visit to Baymart. Landon closed his eyes and rested for a bit. Now, he was on his way to Corona. Meanwhile, back in Baymart, several people were both nervous and excited with the massive turn of events today. Momo sat in his classroom patiently while waiting for the time to go by. At noon today, there would be a parent teacher assembly slash conference. PDA. Right now, he was supposed to be having a lesson. But his history, Mr. Apollo, canceled classes today to prepare for the conference at noon. So everyone was either joking with their friends, lying around, or doing homework. Momo fell in the first category. He was currently engaged in a deep conversation with his friend Maxwell and another new student, Natsu, about the latest Mighty Morphin Power Rangers that aired yesterday. Of course, 
They were also accompanied by several others too that surrounded their desks. How could you miss yesterday's episode? Evil sorceress Rita Repulsa was at it again. This time, she managed to kidnap the Blue Ranger. I tell you, it was disastrous. I know, right? My heart almost couldn't take it anymore. She used her staff and weakened his morphing powers. And then, and then what happened? Wait, why are you all so silent? What happened to the Blue Ranger? That's my favorite ranger. I even have his action figure and everything. So you better speak now. Damn it. If I knew, I wouldn't have gone grocery shopping at that time. Now I really want to know how epic the episode was. Bro, it's not that we don't want to speak, but the episode ended in a cliffhanger. We don't know if the Blue Ranger is still alive or not. For all we know, he could be dead. No, you take that back. How can Rita Repulsa kill him alone? Why target the Blue Ranger and not the others? This is bullying. Momo patted Maxwell's shoulders pitifully. Take heart, bro. It's not too often to choose a new ranger as your favorite. Maxwell, I don't want to. I like the Blue Ranger. Ah, yes. In an era where the concept of movies and TVs were still relatively new and exciting, even something like Power Rangers was enjoyed by the elderly, not to talk of the children. The fact that characters could appear after a puff of smoke or levitate and float still amazed people as they wondered how they did it. Of course, the show had been modified a bit to have good martial arts and choreography, with villains also wearing costumes and whatnot. Even the set was built and customized for the show in the studio, and the storyline had also been tweaked a bit to give it more flavor and purpose, making people want more. Everything was new and exciting to the eyes or many. And for most men, they loved watching action scenes, so Landon's new and improved version kept their hearts guessing every second. For sure, Momo and his friends were also in this category as well. As for little Linda, she also loved Power Rangers. Her favorite was the Yellow Ranger. So when she stepped into the classroom with her group of friends, they were immediately interested in the conversation. But they were so shy and dared not step forth. Why? Because Natsu, the new student who entered their class from S class, was too good looking. Each school grade had five subclasses that all students fitted in, S class being the highest, A class following that, B class, C class, and D class. For example, one could be in grade 10, but because of their results, they would be placed in any of the categories. But here's the cool thing about the school. For one semester only, each person would enter their designating subclasses according to their scores. But in the next semester, everyone got shuffled, with all classes having a mix of both strong, weak, and so on. This way, the students can help each other and bond. This method turned very effective, because those who weren't doing well did learn from those who were great. Even when they went back to their own classrooms in the next semester, they were still on friendly terms with the top students, sometimes studying in the library together. And now, this was the shuffling semester again, which brought Natsu, the hunk of the entire grade, from S class to A class. Natsu was ranked third most handsome by the girls and even had his fan club. But the guy was still fairly dense and didn't even know that many girls liked him. The girls giggled and blushed while peeking at him from time to time. And soon, little Linda encouraged her friend to give the homemade lunch that she struggled to prepare for him. Erm, he excuse me, Natsu. I made this for you to thank you for teaching and helping me with my homework. Natsu, who was a strong foodie, quickly took the box excitedly. Sweet. My favorite. Thank you. Amini. You're welcome. If you're like, I can make you some more later on. Eh, wouldn't that be much for you? No, no, no. It's no problem at all. I, Pap. Before she even finished her sentence, the boys around Natsu all stood up with fire in their eyes. And in a flash, the boys all wore their lab coats, gloves, and had dark plastic bags over their heads, all the while wearing lab goggles. And Maxwell, who seemed like the leader, had a long ruler in his hand. Meanwhile, the boys quickly arranged their lockers in a rectangular formation. Like lightning, Natsu found his hands tied up as if he was a prisoner. Guys, what's going on? You heathen, don't you dare talk to us. Do you please guilty or not? Natsu was even more confused. Guys, what the hell are you talking about? Bam. Shut up, you traitor. For a moment, we were almost blinded and fooled by you. A man as blessed as you is no friend of ours. 
Yeah. How dare he blatantly enjoy food from the class queen? Does he not know the pain of being single? Brothers, what are we waiting for? I say we burn this traitor. Yeah, burn him. Momo looked on bitterly. Even he was almost swallowed up when Lin said that they were dating. It was a miracle that the boys stopped looking at him with disdainful eyes after a while. Good luck, bro. The class queen who listened, grew anxious and tried explaining things properly. And the boys paused to listen to her. Maybe they misunderstood the situation? Erm, it's not like that. So you don't like him? I, I, I. She held her head and flushed harder. Silence. Bam. The judgment has been passed. Guilty. Burn the heathen. To think that I even shared a pencil with him. People as popular as him shouldn't be near me. What a jerk. Roast this bastard. With that, they carried the tied-up Natsu outside the window and vanished. Meanwhile, the dean who had received reports that everything was prepared for the parent-teacher meeting was in a very good mood. He got up from his seat with his coffee in his hand and calmly walked towards the window with a smile on his face. Ah, what a great day. Burn the heathen. Burn the traitor. He saw a tied-up Natsu carried in the air like a sacrifice and slowly backed away towards his desk. He picked up his I'm one and held it silently. Hello, is this the police? I want to report a crime. And so that was how Momo spent his days in school. It was another perfect Baymardian day. Meanwhile, very far away, someone else was having a not-so-great day. What went wrong? Do you like this video? Let me know by giving it a thumbs up and leaving a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated on my future uploads.